One, two, mic check. Oh, it's so much better. <sighs> Dude, yesterday was an eye bleeder in my ears. Ear bleeder, I guess would be what I'd say. It was brutal. Yesterday, my ears, it was so bad. And of course, my brain is now focused on having a monitor in my ears, having headphones on a monitor. The, the reason I need the monitor or the headphones on is because... Uh, I can then monitor what guests are listening to in real time. And the moment that I lose that, I don't know what I don't know if I'm like blasting music and then blowing up their speakers or headphones. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what they can hear, what they can't hear. So uh, of course now my ears have been trained to that. And the moment that stuff breaks, I'm like, I feel like I'm lost. things. Kitty, what are you doing in here? You didn't want me to cuddle in with you at all this morning. Now I can close the door and you're in here. What are you doing, Kitty? Walk by me and grab me. Where are you, Kitty, Kitty? All right, I gotta get to work, Kitty. Now you want to cuddle. Hey, what's going on out there? Good morning. How are you all doing? Woohoo! Uh-oh, I gotta go over to, uh... We got a lot to go over this morning. <laughs> I have this, um... Uh, I have this, like, faux... So with my with my children and my cats and the dogs and all that, I, I, I like, have this, like, faux mean daddy uh, where I pretend I'm mean, but I'm actually not mean. Uh, pretty like nice guy, like really nice, especially my girls and stuff, my my animals. But I like pretend. Um, I don't know. It's like this game that we play. And uh, so with the cats, I have this like ongoing thing with with the cats. If you just heard that by chance, um, I'm like, you didn't love me this morning, you didn't love me last night, and now you do. Now I'm doing a live stream and you want cuddles. <laughs> you don't love me. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Uh, anyways, good morning out there. Hope you all doing well. I got a throat lozenge in this morning. My, I lost my voice yesterday and didn't and did no yelling. Uh, that's not good for a Monday, is it? I uh, hope you're all doing well out there. Um, we're gonna go over a couple major things today. We're gonna go over uh, the market brief from from yesterday. If you were here in stream yesterday morning, there she goes. If you're in stream yesterday morning, you noticed that we finally confirmed a sell the rip environment. It was around like 9.30 or 10, and then 12 o'clock, the door was closed. And so we traded it uh, down off of that hourly trigger, per almost near perfectly, uh, into the close. Now, until those conditions change, uh, I just want to make sure and, and uh, that we're clear on what that means. Uh, we should also look at... Uh, the history of this kind of stuff, uh, when, why you do it like this, there's reasoning behind it. I did notice something yesterday and this morning on Fintwit uh, where people were saying, see, I called it. And uh, they, those same people oftentimes call it, not sometimes, like last time about 15 times. And uh, they called it too early. So we're going to talk about why you don't call, a, why you don't confirm a correction until it actually happens. How um, the reasons why seventy to eighty percent of people blow up their accounts uh, is due to either calling a correction before it happens, or once we do confirm a correction, uh, they continually, uh, or they, they might be on the opposite side of that and try to trade uh, like buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. And they give all their money back. So that's very frequent. 
Uh, that's a large reason why people blow up their accounts or uh, they're just a, a, a journeyman uh, as a market participant, right? Make a thousand bucks, make five thousand bucks, make ten grand, then I blow up a little bit of it, giving some of it back, then you know, you're kind of like grinding, right? Uh, you have 10, 20 percent returns every year, and you don't have any like um, you're not making enough to actually make a difference uh, r rather than leaving your regular job. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that. Um, can I explain why CTF uh, stuff, why it matters? Of course, we're going to go over that today too. So we're going to go over um, uh, buy the dip, sell the rip, confirming a correction, why you confirm it. Um, and I saw a lot of parading yesterday on Twitter and this morning, and I was kind of scratching my head. I was like, all these people have tried, have, have tried to call a correction in the past, every single one of them. And I've noticed that uh, they've been wrong more than they are right when you go back and look at their history. Um, so just be careful out there with what you see and read. It's good to let people like parade around and be like, I called it, but they've been calling it, um, two, even, even in the low end two or three times this, this year in particular, um, you've seen people call for corrections multiple times this year. Um, so we'll talk about that at some point this morning. So we're going to get into the market brief from last night. We're also going to get into, um, CTAs. And the reason I want to bring CTAs up is because. I think that that those that ter or that uh, acronym is thrown around a lot, and I, I bet if you ask somebody out there, what is a CTA? Why do they matter? Um, there's not a lot of correlation between commodities and equities. Um, this though, the, the top line about CTAs is there is not, believe it or not, a lot of correlation between equities and commodities. There are those out there that that will equate that stuff. What's more important about CTAs is that uh, they have to be so. Uh, they have to be seasoned uh, professionals. It takes a lot of years to be a commodities trader. And um, people say, trust the bond market. They'll say, hey, you should trust the bond market. Those are the smartest guys in the, in the room. The reason why you trust CTAs, in my view, is because they have to be uh, conservative, reserved, and uh, have a lot of forethought in the future uh, to remain uh, CTAs. That's because what they trade, right? So they can usually see things coming down the road, um, and their opinion is valuable, right? These guys will tell, talk amongst each other and say, hey, man, the market's going to fucking roll hard and heavy. Watch out. There's some real danger down the road, right? Um, they'll say things like, hey, this is the market bottom in a bear market, and they will, they will counsel um, uh, uh, money that wants to come into the market and say, hey, look, start buying now. And they do a very good job at it. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, CTAs, what they actually are. The reason I want to say that to you is because I think oftentimes people throw that shit around, and if you were to like pin them in the corner, you'd be like, hey, what is a CTA? Why do they matter? You wouldn't get an answer. They'd be like, oh, fuck, I either don't know what a CTA is or I've forgotten, or I, I actually um, I don't know, man. I just know that when they say they're selling, uh, you sell the market. When they say they're buying, you buy the market, and that's all I care about. And I think that's fine, too. Um, but you do want to have some kind of um, understanding of what they are. Okay, so uh, we'll do that this morning as well. Uh, first things first, this morning we're going to go into the market brief. Trump media shares uh, falling 7% this morning after saying Truth Social to launch TV streaming platform. I haven't been following this stuff too much. I see brief. Uh, notes about it where like they had bad reports and they're crashing and all that other kind of stuff so I don't know much about that uh, or why that's material or matters but I know it's been it's like a meme stock I guess at this point uh, higher for longer rates uh, may mean lower for longer stock multiples and stock prices uh, this is not true this is a uh, false uh, so this is absolutely false right here uh, I can prove. I, I think I have proven this to you plenty. Uh, this is absolutely false. Uh, in our current environment, the longer rates stay up or paused, the safer markets, or at least equity markets, are. Uh, the moment that you get a rate cut, uh, the market will roll over. And the more rate cuts that happen, the more the market will continue to roll. Uh, there are some other uh, events where we can tighten too much and we begin to break things uh, and then the market will roll in that circumstance as well and then you'll have the Fed chasing with rate cuts at the bottom 
of the market. So rate cuts really are not that good, um, especially in this market. Uh, rate cuts are not that good. But there is a fly in the ointment here. There are uh, proponents of rate cuts pushing right now that a window is closing uh, in July, saying if the Fed doesn't cut rates in July, doom and gloom. Uh, so I think that's fascinating to, to read as well. So if, if we get a chance, the third thing we will look at today is why bulls, even if it's just briefly, why bulls never want a rate cut. And there's some other mechanics involved in that. If you get velocity and in inflation, that could be uh, bouncing down and then up off of 2%, and you get velocity and unemployment to the upside. As a matter of fact, I think the New York Times did an article this weekend about the very thesis that I've been uh, talking to you about since the rate cycle began. If I can find that one, I'll bring it up for you today. Um, it was, I read it this weekend. I, sh I was going to bring it up, and then I forgot all about it. But I think it was the New York Times or WAPO uh, did a story that said the things you actually need to know about uh, rate cuts or, uh, the, or, the, or the metrics that you need to understand. And they just talked about the three that we talk about, unemployment, inflation, and rates, and how much they actually matter. Uh, because the inverted yield curve does not matter. Uh, if, you, if you try to correlate the inverted yield curve to our equity markets, only when they align with inflation, unemployment, and rates do they actually uh, matter. And oftentimes people are like, no, no, it's the inverted yield rate, rate, rate it's the inverted uh, yield curve. It's like, no, 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 no. That is a bullshit um, metric for you to just sell doom to sell subscriptions. Let's let's just face the facts. That's what it is. Uh, it's accurate about six, or, or I think it's like, I think it's accurate, accurate like 60% of the time, which is not accurate enough for an edge. Uh, inflation, unemployment, and rates combined are accurate about 90% of the time. 90. That's a lot. Uh, that is uh, an edge, a true edge. So anyways, um, uh, what else we got here? If you're worried about a correction and overinvest in NVIDIA, check out these steady growth stocks. We're not worried about a correction. We are in a corrective environment. And until, uh, this is this one right here, we are in a corrective environment, no matter what anyone tells you, just like we were not in a corrective environment until yesterday. Uh, we are actually in a corrective environment right now. And until that improves, uh, we will we will uh, stay in a corrective environment, and you, there is risk in this market uh, right now. So uh, it's hilarious to see shit like this. <laughs> like it, it just never ends. It just never, ever, ever ends the garbage that's out there. Tension in the Middle East. Uh, hot inflation rattles stocks. Take the take these steps to shore up your portfolio. Um, I don't believe any of the horse shit being uh, spun right now about the Middle East. Although I could be wrong, I'm just speaking more from the perspective of the probability of what a lot of you are regurgitating out there. Like we're, you know, like we're in the cusp of World War III. Uh, we're getting the second coming of Christ and all other kind of crazy ass shit that's being said out there. Uh, highly, a high probability that that's not the case. Uh, what else we got here out there for you? <laughs> Tesla job cuts heightened Wall Street concerns that EV maker faces a demand problem. Uh, we've already discussed this ad nauseum about the existential threat of like BYD of Chinese uh, EV makers. I got to say, man, even U.S. automakers are looking good, right? I, I, I have a Cadillac Escalade. I've got a Tesla. I went looking at the Cybertruck recently, and guess what I went and looked at? Uh, I went and looked at some uh, Chevys, man, some uh, some Chevys. I'm like, I mean, Cadillac Chevys making some good looking stuff right now. So I, I can't say that they don't that they aren't. Uh, some of their some of their stuff's looking pretty good. 450 miles in a truck, an EV truck. There is in in in. I gotta say something. Elon said this. Elon to Elon's credit, he did say uh, that when he started Tesla, he hopes to drag everybody by the hair with him along with him, right? And he's done that. Uh, he has done that. He said that he wanted to develop from top-down manufacturing process like Ford did, and he has done that. 
shoddily enough, shoddily, but he's done that. Uh, and uh, at this point, he stated, I remember him stating in the beginning of Tesla, you know, we might not survive when that happens. If we drag all these automakers around the world along with us, uh, we might not survive, right? We have to actually sell the cheapest vehicle uh, to pro likely to survive and be able to ramp up production uh, to outpace a lot of these companies. And, you know, that prediction is coming true right now. Morgan Stanley tops expectations on wealth management, trading and investment uh, uh, banking results. Also this morning, I'm still watching um, State Street this morning because what I think they're doing in the background right now is they're loading up on, like they're like selling into these bank earnings and then they're loading up into these bank earnings for Q2 uh, and three this year. And a point in fact in this, no matter what garbage shit people tell you out there, oh, I got to do I got to do this wolf of, hold on, I got to bring this up. Because it's going to, this is going to uh, validate a lot of what I'm saying here this morning. Um, wolf of, it was a wolf of Wall Street did a drunken sailors post that was, mwah! and what's, what's fascinating about the, uh, there's a, there's an article done by Wolf Street, not Wolf of Wall Street, Wolf Street where he wrote, uh, Our Drunken Sailors Push Back Against Rate Cut Mania. And we're going to look at that article this morning as well, uh, because when you look at Q2 and Q3, you've got banks, like Jamie Dimon does not want rate cuts. Jamie Dimon's like, we make bank with rates high. They're, they just leave us alone. Let us make our money. We expect GDP to shit the bed in Q4. Not shit the bed. Actually be pretty good. Come down a little bit. But the, our, our country looks great GDP-wise this year. It really does. And you're not going to tell me that with GDP on the rise this year that we're going to crash the stock market. It is counterintuitive to everything that's happening in our economy. Our GDP is rising like a phoenix right now. And you've got uh, fucking people. you got, you got weirdos out there telling you, uh, oh, shit, the market's going to crash. And you're like, why? Like, there's no, we got growth. Like, we have growth, growth in our economy. We do not crash stock markets during growth cycles. Uh, now, we know the Fed's trying to fight that growth cycle, right? But we do not crash markets uh, during growth cycles. And to that point, and to this point right here, if you recall last week, if you, to this uh, Morgan Stanley shit over here, right? Banks don't want you to even, consider rate cuts right they don't want you uh hear, they don't want to tell you that the economy is doing well right and to this point too right there's another little fascinating point here two weeks ago or so this morning or this morning i read an article on the washington post who's this asshole hold on a second here uh hold on i want to do this one thing. stock market not bubble he wrote it. He did an article this morning. This is the counter shit that you read, like straight garbage. Uh, who said this? Right? There was some guy from the Washington Post this morning that wrote some kind of a story that said, "Oh, uh, the the correction that's going on right now proves that we're not in a stock bubble." I'm like, "You're out of your mind." If you go like this, this is basic 101 stock market shit. If you look at 1995. 2001 at home on the S&P 500 you're talking about 40% gains 25% pullbacks correct uh, these would be considered a crash right and then another 40% up 25% down 20% down another 40% up you're talking about the stock market going up 300% shit like that this still looks like a bubble to me. Uh, th this guy's out of his fucking skull. I'm like, I'm like, we could go down today 25%. We did a story. Or we, I showed you guys some charts a couple weeks ago. I was like, what if I told you that we could go down today uh, 20, or tomorrow 25%? And if I told you in a month and a half we'll be up 40%, you wouldn't believe me, right? You'd be like, fuck no, Cap. That's never happening. And that would lead to a stock market priced at six, nine, and twelve thousand, 
right? I'm serious. That is a bubble. Uh, and so the price action right now at this pullback into a into the start of a correction, this clown on Washington Post is like, well, we're not in a bubble. I'm like, you're out of your fucking skull. You have no idea what a bubble is or what it looks like. Um, <laughs> or and this, then this pullback here has nothing to do with a bubble. This correction has nothing to do with a bubble. Uh, or it does not disprove a bubble, I should say. So a lot of misinformation out there this morning across uh, the market again. Uh, United Health beats on revenue despite impact from cyber attack. Israel War Cabinet is locked between restraint and revenge. That's horse shit, too. Um, you should watch today, at tonight, you should watch um, Don't Mess With the Zohan. I shouldn't say that, but I should because uh, Adam Sandler is Jewish. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, uh, his sister was my um, dentist for a period of time when I was younger, in my younger years. Uh, but it speaks really well to the uh, the movie speaks really well to the saving face aspect uh, of the Middle East. And it really does for comedy. It's hilarious. Um, so if you have a chance, watch that because it's almost like um, you're seeing that in real time right now to some extent. Um, so Israeli's war captain is locked between restraint and revenge. Fascinatingly enough, too, uh, I'll see if I can post this somewhere for you, but on my black box media feed. There was a commentary yesterday in this black box feed that I did not say to you in stream, and it said, Israel's going to respond, but not with missiles. It's going to be something undercover, right? It's going to be like a cyber attack, you know, or something that they can do that's not going to be World War III. Of course, yesterday, though, the stock market and FinTwit and the news that's public ran with, Israel's going to respond. Uh, fucking nukes are dropping tomorrow. I mean, that's really what they fucking did yesterday, right? So I would not be listening to the news right now on anything in regards to this. This is uh, garbage as far as I'm concerned. Garbage. Garbage reporting uh, about Israel and Iran. Uh, what else do we got here? Well, oh, bullet prices fall for the second day in a row. Uh, that was crazy. The fire engulfs Denmark's historic stock exchange. Uh, that was really sad to see this morning. I'm sure some of you out there are, are calling for the like great tulip shit. Uh, but this is very sad to see. Uh, this reminds me of uh, the Cathedral de Notre Dame burning as well. I uh, don't like seeing that. Uh, financial security is about time, not money. Self made, self made millionaire. Eh, whatever. Fuck that story. That's a they recycle that garbage every week. Uh, what else we got here? I think that's it. Uh, Dow jumps 200 points. We're gonna then head over to um, uh, we're gonna head over to uh, financial juice this morning, and we're gonna bl uh, blast through some of this stuff uh, from this morning. We got a bunch of Fed speakers today. Um, we got Jefferson blowing it up this morning. We've got yelling out there. U.S. U.S. inflation is down significantly from peak, but there's more work to do. Wall Street uh, uh, Journal's Tim Russell and Feds Johnson. He doesn't refer to rate cuts as a base case as he did in February and on February 22nd. U.S. industrial production month over month is 0.4 percent. The forecast was 0.4 percent, so unchanged. Previous 0.1 percent uh, revised to 0.4 percent. Output uh, month over month 0.5 percent. Positive news. Uh, previous 0.8 percent. Now, what else do we got here? U.S. Defense Secretary Austin speaks with Chinese Defense Minister this morning. I wonder what that's about. IMF is concerned about medium-term uh, U.S. fiscal uh, trajectory. I wouldn't be. Uh, we have great projections for GDP this year. I'd be concerned for a peak, though, uh, heading into Q4 of 2024. And uh, you guys know my take on 25 and 26. Uh, that we are due for like a 10-year stagnation. ECB's President Lagarde, the main difference between the U.S. and Europe is the consumer. I don't know about that. Maybe. Uh, U.S. Uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen, we are focused on strengthening the IMF, pushing for strong loan programs with robust conditionality to help restore the stability. By the way, Canadian CPI year over year was 2.9%. The forecast was 2.9%. Uh, and uh, the previous re report was 2.8%. Also of note, our numbers get better uh, historically. The um, 
second or the middle of the year to the end of the year uh, for all of these reports. So the doom and gloom reports are almost done coming out uh, traditionally this year. <clears throat> U.S. Treasury Secretary Yellen, we are focused on strengthening uh, the IMF, pushing for strong loan programs with robust conditionality to house re help restore stability. U.S. Treasury uh, Secretary Yellen, I will meet with Chinese officials this week uh, to discuss anti-money laundering and balanced growth. Uh, you want to be monitoring this closely uh, with Yellen. Uh, you know that, uh, or as you know, Biden and Trump are on the same page on this. Uh, no China deal. There should be no China deal. This should be a non-partisan issue for you if you are an American. Uh, you do not want uh, cheap Chinese goods that route industry in the United States. They did this once before in the early 2000s. It was terrible. Uh, we don't want that done again. A second round with like EVs, of all things. Uh, you're going to reduce the production capacity of the United States so that they do not have the ability. Uh, they become just a full-on service-centered nation. Uh, we cannot have that for the security of our country. Uh, sorry about the uh, sort of the nationalism speech there if you're not from the U.S., but uh, we can't have it. Our steel industry was routed uh, in this country in the early 2000s. Uh, we cannot even produce steel if we wanted to. We do a little bit still, but not quite or anywhere near. Not, only, not to mention the quality of steel is utter garbage today. Now, that is a fact, not an opinion. Uh, senators offer bipartisan uh, framework to tackle extreme AI risks. Senator Romney, AI has the potential to dramatically transform our way of life, but it also comes with enormous risks. Our bipartisan uh, framework would safeguard future advanced AI models, from mis misuses, blah, blah, bloody blah. On uh, news, today is the 16th, right? So today we've already got the morning news that came out. Uh, 1.15, we've got Jerome Powell speaking today. Does he calm markets, or does he inflame uh, the? Does he inflame the uh, markets for more corrective measures and moves to the downside? I am sure uh, that this is going to have a. I'm not sure, but a material impact at some point today. So we will have on Jerome Powell at 1:15 for you, uh, so that we can follow along. Excuse me. Also today on the 16th. We've got a 42-day bill, uh, bill auction at 11.30 and the 52-week uh, bill auction at 11.30. So on your uh, clocks today or calendars for today, be aware of the 11.30 hour and then once again at 1.15 for Jerome Powell. On Wednesday, we also come into some early morning volatility. If you're a futures or Globex trader, be aware that at 6.10, we've got a three-month bill auction six-month bill auction. We've got a bunch of mortgage data coming out between that time and our 6.15 and 7 a.m. So some volatility lining up. We also have some crude gasoline data coming out all the way into the 10.30 hour. And then we follow that up with some uh, more bill and bond auctions. Uh, the Fed Beige Book, eh, it's more of like a backer for uh, things not as uh, pertinent. But we do have net long-term tick flows at 4 p.m. So a very busy day coming out tomorrow uh, in some parts in markets that you might not follow as a cash market trader. You might think there's not a ton going on, but there actually is from a very early uh, uh, point tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., and it doesn't end uh, until later in the day. All right. Whew. Let me give you a breather here. Opening bell and positioning. Oh, there's a lot to go over today. <laughs> I gotta get through this today because I haven't gotten through it yet this week. So we gotta get through this. Uh, if you had the market brief last night, you were looking for a squeeze up into the half an hour trigger, some weakness on the open to the downside, uh, and then a, expecting a bounce later today off of either 502 or 5,000 down here, 500, 502 uh, for a move higher to the hourly trigger. Uh, so we're going to be watching this and monitoring this as the morning uh, continues. If at any point we get above the one in five minute trigger and create a reversal, we will target the hourly trigger. So if you're a bull and you're like, hey, are we going up or down cap? 
if you hold on a second, hold on one second here. If you're like, hey, Cap, we're not going to go down there and tag 502. We're not going to go down there and uh, tag uh, 5,000. You are looking for a price to get above the half hour trigger, consolidate, have the one in five minute uh, move higher here, right? Then you'll be looking to trade above to this 508.40 at PT2. Here's where the bear doom is. I do want you to be aware. We're going to get into this morning where the sellers are. You've got the young Jim Bros that are on the half an hour trigger. You've got the uh, old Jim Bros on the hourly trigger. And I want to say one more thing to you. While we're in a correction here, well, we'll make that one white. While we're in a corrective environment here, while we sell the market down, you will see impulse waves or impulse moves to the downside, like one big move on a higher time frame, two big moves, and then three big moves, right? When we, if we have the hourly trigger during that, during that process, let's say this is the HT, and you're like, hey, Cap, you tell me to sell the hourly trigger and the half an hour trigger. I'm like, hell yeah, that's what you're selling, right? After big moves like that, let's say we trade all the way down to the weekly trigger. You will oftentimes see a retracement all the way back to, let's say, the daily trigger. So if you see something like that happen, right, you're like, hey, Cap, why are we breaching this hourly trigger? I always want you to know as a seller that you're, you're selling off of this hourly trigger and your stops are above the hourly trigger just like we tell bulls right so if you're going to buy the dip on the hourly trigger if we're in a bull environment uh you're putting risk on in the hourly and half hour trigger to downside moves if you get blown out let, let's say we go whoop like this we begin to make new highs you're going to have stops here so that you don't get run over as we head to the daily trigger that would be the only caveat i haven't talked too much about but i want you to be aware of it if you are a seller Okay, that one's out of the way. <laughs> okay, so positioning for this morning. Looking for more downside, at least here. We'll go to this one right here. We'll go underneath that one right there. Clean this up a little bit. Let me just draw this better out for you this morning. I hastily made that. Uh, right here. Reach a new low. So you get the visual of that. And then here's the visual for you on the upside. Let's keep that right there. We're going to head over to the main screen now. Okay. A VIX 9 day right now being sold at resistance. We've looked at this in prior sell points up here, right? We begin to reverse every time we come into this white line right here. We know that this is a typical place to look for a bottom. Uh, every once in a while, though, right? You slam it down, slam it down, slam it down, slam it down, slam it down. There's an expectation here. This is the VIX 9 day. Uh, there's an expectation at some point that we're at bottom, right? We get down to these lows down here in VIX 9 day, 9 or $10, and you're going to expect some kind of a, of a squeeze, right? So maybe we come up here today, they cool us down, but it becomes supportive on the monthly, the daily, the weekly, the one, the five minute, and then all of a sudden out of blue, you get wham straight up, right? Wham, straight up. So right now we're in a little bit of a cooling off period, but I want you to see this right here. If you've got the VIX nine day at home, even though we're cooling off right now in the stock market, all we're waiting for is the next shoe to drop, uh, like a rejection somewhere on the hourly trigger, and uh, we end up raining hell to the downside, right? VIX ramps up, some n unknown news to the market comes in place. And you see VIX just go, or nine-day VIX go screaming to re once again reset itself over time, right? Just like that. So if you're to ask me, is the correction over, just looking at VIX nine-day, I would tell you probably not. Let's take a look at it. <coughs> right? Not too hard to see here, right? 
fairly easy. You come down to these lows. This is a daily chart. Whenever you come down into these lows, we're down there right now, aren't we? All right. Every time we come down, here we got one example where we didn't. This was 2017 to 2018. This is the Volmageddon moment, right? This was Volmageddon. But every time, generally speaking, we're down here, you'll see a VIX spike. And we've had such a kick-ass run this year since October that we're kind of due for a moment, right? We're kind of due for a moment of, of, of a cooling off of the VIX, aren't we? You can see it right here, up here, there, nice little thingy. We just got up here, right? We're kind of getting to that point where... Woof, Right up top, right? You see like a nice explosive move to the upside. I don't know if that's today. It could be another three weeks or four weeks. Could be in two months. Could be the election volatility we expect in the fall. But we're getting there. We're getting closer and closer and closer as time moves on uh, on the nine-day VIX. And we're at one of those breakout points right now, aren't we? Breakout or rejection points. Let's take a look at the 30-minute. And you can see them trying to sell vol currently right now. Tesla. What the fuck happened to Tesla? Gee, jeepers creepers, Tesla. What are you doing? Tesla. <laughs> Trading 153.69. Okay, Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. The expectation here in Tesla is that uh, it is going to be bought at 140. I'll say it again for you. I think I've been saying this to you for a few weeks now. Uh, Tesla, expect a dip buy on 140. The expectation is that the correction for Tesla will be over. Listen to me closely. The correction for Tesla should be over at 140. Tesla should trade near 300. I know you don't want to hear that. I know you're you're like earmuffs on, Cappy. I don't want to hear that. Uh, I'm gonna keep saying it to you. I'm gonna say it to you over and over and over again. Uh, Tesla should trade 140. Correction should be over and complete on Tesla at 140. It should then trade like 280 to 300, somewhere in there. If 140 is lost. If you're buying, te I'm going to be buying Tesla down there, just heads up with you. If you don't know, I'm going to be uh, uh, buying an actual position in Tesla, maybe 100, uh, 100 shares. I'm, I don't want to sell them. Uh, and then I want to buy another 100 at 80 bucks. Now, or maybe 200. I think I'll buy 200, but and that's for life, I think, for my kids. Last time I said that, I sold and I shouldn't have. So I do want to say to you, if 140 is lost, uh, be very careful of Tesla. It could go into a tailspin to the downside. Uh, you're going to have a lot of people out there that are going to tell you it's going to bounce off 100 because it's a nice round number. I think that's the case too. Uh, but I do think if we go all the way down to the quarterly trigger, once you're down there, you might as well do a sweep uh, on 80 bucks. If we're down there at 100 bucks, might as well sweep uh, 80 and get it over with. So, and that's a big level for Tesla, by the way. It's their quarterly trigger, uh, and it's an accumulation point, a reaccumulation point from the perspective of a market maker. Uh, if you're going to start a new cycle on Tesla, it's a great place to start one. So Tesla, um, 140. If it is not bought, dude, if we go down to the quarterly trigger, um, forget the existential crisis with China. There's got to be something material that they're holding right now that nobody knows about. And it ain't, it ain't fucking deliveries. It ain't um, demand, we can demand. It's not a gas pedal. It's not fucking, uh, I don't give a, you can, whatever you can fucking come up there, Elon's a fraud. Uh, it's none of that shit. Uh, and it's not the reason it's going to correct either. I want to preface that as well. Uh, companies, companies have smart advisors, uh, very smart advisors. Outside of fraud, like real fraud, uh, you hold bad uh, information 
until you correct. You don't release your shittiest news on a high. Well, you can on a high, uh, especially if you want to uh, sell at a high as a, as a C-suite guy. But you hold, my point here is that you hold that bad news for a major high. You hold that bad news as you're heading down into a correction. As you're moving up, Tesla's not going to come out and tell you bad things, nor is any other company. We're like, everything's fucking great right now. Let's get that, let's get that stock price up. So if there is anything being withheld, that would be the time to do it, right? If the price corrects because market makers uh, are exiting Tesla for a rebuy, uh, that would be the time to do it, right? Be like a guy, you'd be an insider in Tesla going, there we go, this one last piece of badass news. If we break 140, we should probably dump that shit out there in the, in the wild uh, while we're heading towards 80 bucks, right? Uh, so anyways, there's a time to say that shit, right? Uh, how do I, how do I describe that? Um, if you're a child watching this show right now and you get caught hiding your green beans in your shoes at home because you don't want to eat them at dinner time, heck, and you get caught, you might as well tell your mom and dad uh, we're, the other places that you've hidden your green beans at the same time uh, for the past year. Like, hey, Dad, I know you caught me with my green beans in my shoe, but I've been dumping them in my closet for the past year. <laughs> They're all rotting in the closet right now. <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> You're getting a punish from your dad anyways. You might as well take it all on the chin at one time. I guess that's the simple way to describe it to you. <laughs> okay. Woo! Uh, what else we got here? Q's this morning trying to fight their way to the upside. We've got two more targets to the upside for Q's. We're going to get rid of that right there. Uh, first upside target for Q's on a 30-minute basis. Oh, oopsie, hold on. What did I do? Upside targets for the for Q's before the Bears attempt to take back over again. Uh, first one is... 432.25. Next one, 435.49 uh, for Q's. IWM uh, hovering around below its weekly trigger. Uh, am looking for a dip buy somewhere here at 194, 190 uh, for an upside move squeeze, believe it or not, uh, to 200, a little bit higher than their hourly trigger. So I'm a little bit more bullish on a squeeze trade on IWM this morning, believe it or not. Their correction looks almost complete. Dixie still hanging out right now. Dixie just does not want to give up uh, its gains right now, does it? Dixie trading 106.2 uh, right now, uh, though there is some selling action coming in currently. Some topping. Some topping. Uh, we still have... Might have if you looked at VIX earlier, right, how I was like, yeah, VIX has a chance to spike it again. I mean, you could see Dixie doing something like this, right? Come down and have uh, one more rip higher. So you get your triple top, I guess, in Dixie. Uh, the one good thing about Dixie here, if you are a bear, uh, if you're a bear or a bull, doesn't matter. It's a juicy fucking short. You want to see a juicy short? You want to see the market rip some face off? I mean, look at that fucking short. Well, that shit's just begging. Begging to get murdered. <laughs> Dixie wants to get murdered. Look at it. Oh, it just wants to, it wants to rain down. <laughs> and I'm sure there are bulls out there that are just looking at Dixie going, oh, I just can't wait to send this shit right into the dumpster. <laughs> So if you're a Dixie Bear, if you're a mar stock market bull, just keep your eyes out over here for this uh, for Dixie to get to get uh, to get taken out to the woodshed. And it's just begging right now to get taken to the woodshed. We did VIX nine day. We did H Y oh H Y G. Uh, yesterday we were looking at H Y G, and I said to you this morning on Twitter, uh, look for a capitulation rip down and then a reversal to the upside. Uh, and it's getting pretty close. We're almost there on HYG, so uh, looking for that last little move down and then a move higher on HYG. 
Uh, so be, so uh, stay, stay paying attention there to HYG right now. SPX, uh, what else is going on? SPX, we've got the abandoned ship uh, down below, right? We got the buyer bottom support, begin sell the rip. And we are right now sitting on uh, the, the last, last bit of support uh, for the stonk market here. We've likely had developments of more puts or put gamma to the downside as of yesterday from panic. Now, this abandoned ship velocity to the downside means that when we lose this level that we are at, not on a one-minute chart, but when we start losing this level here, we are triggering CTAs uh, to momentum uh, sell the market. Now, these guys trade commodities, but they're out there talking to each other on a DM system on a, on a Bloomberg black box, like, start selling. <laughs> then money managers are like, oh, shit, let's get out of here right now. Uh, the, the, the commodity boys are scared. And there's a reason for that. Do you know why uh, commodity traders know this stuff? Do you know why? Because commodity traders track uh, what you're eating, what you are consuming from the producer side. So if you're eating uh, rice and beans, right? If you're eating rice and beans, they know it. If you're eating steak, they know it. So they have their eye or their hand on the pulse of uh, the world and the United States more specifically uh, in what's coming down the road. So let's take a peek at the, um, hold on one second here. I wonder if we have any put gamma development down below this morning. Do you guys know that uh, gamma data is uh, messy until about 8.30, 9.30 in the morning? Uh, if you try to pull data, uh, put de or put get called uh, gamma data before 8.30 in the morning, it looks like shit. Uh, become, it's not clean. Your cleanest data is later in the morning just before you come into cash market open. And let's look at this really quick. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Local support has changed. Huh. Interesting. Do you know why that is? You may or may not know why that is. Do you know why that is? It's because dealers do not want to pay these fucking prints. That's our, these puts. <laughs> so there's a few things for us to look at now. There's some, there's some stability in the market right now. That doesn't mean we don't continue down, but it doesn't mean there's volatility to the downside at this point. So the gamma flip is still above here, right? Volatility is now from here, right about here-ish, right about there. Hold on here. Let's put that right there. Bulls need to regain 52.12 to be in a supportive market. Actually, they just need to regain 5,200. So volatility extends down to 5,100. This is begin sell, or begin sell the rip is actually right here. Begin sell the rip right there. Market begins to become supportive right up here. Uh, buyer bottom support is today right here now. Wow. Impressive. Abandoned ship now moves lower right down there. Uh, so what does this mean for you? If you're like, hey, cop, I'm scratching my head. I don't know what this means. It means that if we continue to move to the downside, it will be more orderly as of this morning. Why is that? That is because we've had put developments to the downside. So just like calls, when we are in positive gamma, you have a more supportive environment, right? We grind up slowly over time. 
and we are supportive with dip buying, right? To the upside, we have a little bit less volatility here. So like organized selling to the downside. If we break below this stuff down here, all hell breaks loose, right? All hell breaks loose to the downside. This is also your put wall down below. So your put wall right now is at 48, 4,900 right now is your put wall. Damn, buyers, you're so lucky. Uh, begin to sell the rip, buyer bottom support right where we are at 5050. Five, Believe it or not, that's true. Probably don't want to know that. Whoop. And the closer that we get to this, unless we get more development of put gamma to the downside, the more supportive it becomes, the closer we get to it. Good. Actually, not too bad. It's pretty good. I like this gamma picture this morning. This is pretty good. And of note, there was ex there was massive call buying yesterday. I don't know if you know that, but there was on Friday. A visual order bring to the front. Okay, volatility. There's your gamma picture. Whoop. We are in a what though right now? What does this tell you? This tells you that we are in negative gamma currently. We are still in sell the rip. The bears will attempt to sell the half hour trigger and the hourly trigger. If you look above here, this is like a bull right here, right? This chart was inverse. You've got classic signs of a bear market, right? One, two, bam, right? And now checking the one and five minute trigger, trying to get to a new low, bam, bam, bam. Whoop, to the downside. I wish I could, sometimes I flip this over. Sometimes I flip this, I should flip this over for you so you can see it. Uh, the inverse of a bull market and what a um, corrective market looks like. It's been a while uh, since we've had a correction. It's been a long time. Uh, and to that note, I'm going to read some news to you this morning, and then we're going to switch over to, we're going to switch over to the market brief from last night uh, because I know that people have some questions about it. We're going to uh, review that here in just a few moments. I got a fuck ton to get through. Uh, per Goldman Sachs, suddenly the market, this was from this morning at 9 a.m. Goldman Sachs, suddenly the market seemed trapped between a geopolitical doom loop and a breakout in rates. If geopolitical tensions eased, rates moved higher and vice versa. This is more of GS. Real rates have cleanly broken out of a 10-year point, touching close to 2.2%, much less so in the two-year point. I think it's reasonable to expect a much steeper real yield, yield curve as the Fed, Fed lets it run hot. Note that today, when Jerome Powell speaks, you'll be looking for any commentary on this. This is a level where, historically, we have begun to see derating in equity multiples. To some extent, that is beginning to play out with the higher duration bond proxies materially underperforming. Uh, so you want to pay close attention to Jerome Powell today. Industrial production, March, uh, month over month, 0.4% versus the 0.4% expected and 0.4% prior. Oof. I'm like, I, I, I'm like going to town this morning. Uh, high volatility over at the USD JPY. We were monitoring that the other day. I've spoken to you last week about it. Uh, we were saying to you last week to, to keep an eye on the US dollar Japan pairs trade. Because as we came into, uh, I believe it was 10, I forget, what, I forget what it was right now. We'll take a look at USD Japan, uh, JPY, but I think I've got it pegged to trade 106 and some intervention to be forced uh, from the MOF in Japan. And we'll take a look at that chart here in a minute because it's now front and center stage this morning. It's a hot topic out there. Uh, but we were monitoring it the last few sessions. Uh, last few four or five sessions, we were watching it closely because there's a FOMO trade in there where it just gets squeezed, 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 triggers a MOF reaction from Japan. 
Goldman Sachs on the health of the consumer. A lot of questions yesterday on why certain names were down so much. Uh, with JWN down minus 7%, BURL down minus 3%, and DG minus 2%. Some of the most frequent inbounds. Even this morning, we are still getting a lot of questions on whether we found any reason for the weakness. This is from Goldman Sachs. We did not. We think that it's as simple as the idea that these names are owned as feedback checks have been good. And the corporates have largely sounded good on the road. Despite this, the group continues to bake in a more challenging forward ever since the updates from Alta, LW, Mc McDonald's, etc., along with the greater focus on rates and gas prices. While government retail sales beat yesterday, the group still underperformed modestly with the ex with XRT uh, down 132 BPS, minus 70 BPS to the DGI and minus 12 BPS to the SPY. The group certainly didn't act like a big March government retail sales beat was announced, mainly because it was expected. Remember, Easter was in March this year, 331, and so the higher spend into the holiday was as, as well. Whereas last year it was April 9th. Possibly we get some give back next month. Lagarde today says the ECB will cut rates soon, barring any major surprises. Notes Bank is extremely attentive to oil. Why does that matter to you? Uh, do you know why that matters to you? Uh, the ECB does not cut rates before the U.S. cuts rates. Why does that materially matter to you as a, as a cash market trader? It's giving you a hint. It's, it's saying to you that the banks are attempting to front roll rate cuts in June and July. So right now, in this corrective environment, they're not going to tell you this publicly, that you're never going to hear this from a bank. No bank, no institution, uh, institution meaning a bank, like a prime bank, like a GS like a, um, a Bank of America, like uh, JPM, like MS. Even though you've got Jaime out there telling you that uh, he wants rates for higher for longer, there, you know, Jamie Dimon says uh, he had just put out an investor's note to, if you have a private bank with JPM, if any of your money is under their management, he recently sent out an investor note. And inside of that investor note, he talked about an ironclad uh, stance for where we are right now in the market. And he is implying rate cuts, even though he doesn't want them. He is implying rate cuts. And that JPM, uh, in that note as well, he discussed how banks were uh, panhandling on CNBC in the last crash that we had. Uh, this is all prior to 9, or not 9, 9, 9 11, uh, prior to the COVID crash. But how banks are out there uh, clinking their cups uh, as they uh, go bankrupt. And Jaime's like, uh, we weren't doing that. So there is, uh, this is an insight to you. It is not a positive insight for markets, for U.S. markets. Well, yeah, he wants higher for longer. That's how, how banks make money. But he's also telling his clients, the client side, uh, we are prepared for rate cuts. Um, that's what he's saying to you. We are prepared for rate cuts. Uh, watch out for 502 here. There's a small little bump Whoop, right in here. It's your first target, by the way. Uh, so you got the target here, and then you got another rip down there. So uh, be careful of the ECB. If the ECB is telling you that uh, they expect to cut rates soon, that is implying that the U.S. is going to cut before the ECB. Uh, so it's it's negative for U.S. cash markets. Uh, so when you're trying to like navigate, are we cutting, not cutting, cutting, not cutting? Uh, that's not a good sign to hear them say that. ECB President Christine Lagarde says, if no major shocks should be at a point of moderate moderating restrictive monetary possibly in a reasonably short order path 
Yeah, I don't need to argue that with any of you. I already know. Uh, you can you can just fucking you can fucking put two charts up with the ECB cutting rates and the U.S. cutting rates. You can compare the two on your own. I'm not gonna argue with you out there if I'm right or wrong on this. You can just do it on your own. It's fairly fairly easy to see. Uh, we are the reserve currency in this world, whether you like it or not, and we set uh, the rate path for the U. For the, well, I say that, but then you got Japan out there. Japan's uh, it's like the three headed uh, it's like the three headed dragon. <laughs> You got like the U.S. ECB, and then you got fucking Japan. Bank of Japan going, yeah, we do our own thing over here. <laughs> we are bearish if we cut, and I don't mean I don't mean pullbacks, I don't mean corrections, <laughs> I don't mean uh seventeen <laughs> percent. I mean we fucking cut <laughs> like it fucking market rolls to the downside. <laughs> You're getting twenty twenty five percent. <laughs> You're going to see a nice fat roll down. It'll be violent. <laughs> now, I would say just be paid, be aware of it. So if the ECB is saying this, so let me explain this. So if the ECB is saying, they're telegraphing to you, they're saying, hey, we're near rate cuts over here, right? Barring existential threats, geopolitics, we're near rate cuts. Uh, they're warning you. Uh, that the U.S. is likely going to cut before them. A high probability of that. Uh, no matter what you hear out there, no matter what the fucking dot plot says, no matter what the Fed tells you, uh, no matter what fucking what we're betting on in f future Fed funds rate, doesn't matter. Um, they're, they're getting close. And so what does that mean, though, right? That means if you were Jamie Dimon, you would say, oh, shit. I got to fucking hedge that shit. Right? If I was Jamie Dimon and I heard that, I'd be like, I'm, I don't give a fuck what's going on out there. Uh, we're going to hedge that shit, right? Uh, we're going to front run, price some of that in. Get ahead of it. Get ahead of it just in case. So just be aware of it. Uh, that that's out there. <coughs> uh, so she also goes on to say, if no major shocks should be at a point of moderating restricted po monetary policy in reasonably short order. Path to 2% uh, inflation will be bumpy. Uh, won't comment on market's expectation for three rate cuts this year. Says if asked several months ago, she might have thought there would be more than three cuts uh, this year. A little bit more neutral in the end of her statement. Whew. My God, I got so much shit to get through. I ain't doing this shit tomorrow. You guys get it one time today and that's it. You guys get it one time today and that's it. Oh, hold on. I couldn't find that stock market, not a bubble bullshit from uh, stock market, not a bubble bullshit from the uh, from Washington Post. We're going to review the market brief from last night. What in the hell is this? Hold on here. Let's go through some of this stuff because this, this is important. Uh, uh, so we have a website called Trade the Trigger. Uh, this website offers uh, tools, uh, Discord, market briefs, Elliott Wave counts, um, commodities updates. It offers crypto shit. It offers um, you name it. We do it. Um, Stock, uh, stock, uh, waves, all kinds of different shit. Uh, LA Wave counts for stock, you name it. Uh, this thing, we offer a bunch of crap. And uh, now we are a free service, always have been. Uh, but we have uh, members, community members that want to see us grow. Uh, so we're trying to do some development, uh, with, co with coders and, um, uh, with uh, front and back end developers, try to bring you guys more tools and cool shit. Uh, so we've decided to make the jump where if you want to pay, you can. And uh, if you want more from us, you can uh, get more from us in what we do. Uh, so we have a website called tradethetrigger.com. And this is where uh, we do multiple updates around the clock. Uh, if, you're, if you're a just a supporter level, you actually get access to the triggers and shit on the supporter level, manipulating twice a day on like 12 tickers. Um, but in the, but uh, anyways, uh, we're going to share with you what we shared with our membership or our supporters, our community uh, last night. Uh, so we've become sellers of the rip. 
And it was confirmed yesterday. Uh, here, we go through some of this. Do I have this entire thing up here? All right, cool. I think we're showing all of it. It's been 84 years. Uh, like the meme, it's been 84 years. The last confirmed correction was Tuesday, August 15th of 2023. That's a long fucking time. That's not normal. Uh, that's a long time ago. And if you think you may have missed anything, truth is, unless conditions improve drastically, we are just getting started to the downside in this one. For those wanting to know how long the last correction lasted, after the last confirmation of a correction, I missed an OF in here, uh, the chart below will show you uh, how long and what happened. Spoiler, it took two and a half months to complete. That does not mean that this one will take that long as price targets are more important than time. Remember this line right here. Price targets are more important than time. Uh, though the last correction is a great example of a time correction. The chart is below. I want you to, uh, the reason I pointed this out to you last night is because uh, oftentimes, uh, well, there's two reasons. The first reason is this. So this is basically yesterday right here. And we had this uh, rejection on the, let me clean some of this up here. Let's get the size down, dude. So big. So big. There's two things to note about this chart. This was actually yesterday. And we confirmed uh, off of the hourly trigger and daily trigger. We have this move here, right? One last leg down. We come back up, actually, to the daily trigger. All right? Come back down. We have one more big jump over here. And yet we're still selling to the downside, to the weekly trigger. Come back up one more time, right? And then we're selling off the daily trigger in big moves down to the monthly trigger. Okay. Uh, so think about this right here and why it matters. Let's start with just this action right here. Okay. Excuse me. So we have our corrective move, right? We come back up. They sell it back down again, right? We blast up above the daily trigger. We did not get a prior high on there, right? No prior high in this, in this prior high back here. And we came back down to retest the daily trigger. We didn't get a new high there either, did we? No new high, no new high, and no new high. This implies that the correction is not over. Believe it or not, we needed a new high right here. We did not get it. That is showing that we're still in a corrective posture. And what did we do? We blasted back down again, right? Woohoo! Weekly trigger. A little bit lower than the weekly trigger, right? Ugly, ugly, ugly. Come back up to the daily trigger. No new high. Look at that closely there. No new high. What are we doing again? Woohoo! All the way down to the monthly trigger. Now, how did we confirm that the correction was over and it wasn't going to expand into a market crash in October? While everyone was out on Twitter and Fintwit saying the market's going to crash down here, what did we do? We squeezed all the way back up again. Whoop, 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 whoop. And what happened? The daily trigger crossed back above the weekly trigger. And we got what? A new higher high. A new higher high. This action here implies that the correction is over. Two other cool points here. This is where the correction began. This is where the correction ended. Not too far off, right, in price. So let's say you're caught in a corrective environment. You're given multiple chances to exit in profit. And if you are not, if you do not cut loose and you're like, oh, shit, I got caught down here. You should not be selling because you're given even another chance to exit or take the market higher. Key points, right? Now, let's say that we have a correction down to the weekly trigger, a correction down to the monthly trigger, and we did not get the new highs over here. 
let's say we did not get these new highs or this new high or that new high. Let's say we actually failed to make a new high in October, right? This is this past October. Let's say we squoze up. Let me make this bigger. Let's say we squoze up. Whoop. And we failed to get the new high. You would still have the chance to exit relatively safely in price. And this would infer back in October that we were actually going to crash. Very important point. Whoa, 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 whoa. Very important, important point. Why? Why is it important? I'm going to show you the reason it's important. If you are caught in a corrective action along the market, the best course of action is to not panic sell, as when the action is completed, price has roughly returned to the previous price, as noted on the chart above. We already showed that. Corrections debt generally target the weekly and sometimes the monthly triggers. If a correction turns into a crash or bear market, here's the key point in what I, that big fat red line that I showed you. Market participants are generally given ample opportunity to exit the market in an orderly fashion after a corrective phase. The last example of this was the bear market of 2022. And we actually did this on a shortened time frame in the COVID crash and multiple other crashes in the past. So here's an example where a corrective action went down, right? Blasted down, all that other nonsense went down here. And what happened here? We had a failure to get a new high, didn't we? That was your chance to exit the market. One of the scariest parts about 2022 was people got really scared as we rolled over. As we were on a roll down here on these lows, there were people, your, fr your friendly bears on FinTwit telling you we're going way down there. Your friendly bears on FinTwit telling you doom and gloom. Friendly bears on FinTwit saying you're doomed, you're fucked. So a lot of people in 2022 were selling on these lows when in fact they were given an ample opportunity to orderly exit the market. Ample opportunity to exit orderly before we began to crash to the downside. So even if you're doom and glooming right now in the marketplace and you're long, you have time. Both of these examples above led, lend some other imp, uh, insights. It is important to confirm the difference between a pullback, a correction, and if the correction resolves itself or turns into a wider market crash or a bear market. Why is this statement so important? Do you know why that, that is very important? Because we have real money at risk in the market, a ton of money at risk in the market. And let me show you this. Let me show you the reasoning why you need to um, know the difference. Here's an easy example. Market's going to crash. How about fuck you, it's going to crash. Market's going to crash. How about fuck you, it's going to crash. That's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Market's going to crash. Fuck you, that's a pullback. Whoop. Up. We're in a correction. You need to be able to identify what a pullback is what a corrective action is, and when do we begin to sell into a bear market or a market crash. Each phase, phase one, phase two, and phase three, you need to confirm each one. There are a lot of people out there that'll tell you, uh, no, we don't. That is not true. You need to know where we are, and you need to have hyper awareness, market awareness, of where we actually are. There's a lot of noise in the market along the way. And to that point, 
when we are when we resolve a correction or resolve a bear market, you also need to know how to see a reversal, know how to see a reversal to the upside. Very complex uh, subject matter, right? Um, what is a what is a pullback? What is a correction? How do you confirm a correction? Um, how do you know when we're done with a correction or a bear market and all that stuff? Like confirming a correction, moving back into a buy-the-dip upside regime requires confirmation of continuation to the upside. From top to bottom, you always, as a bull, want to see price above the hourly trigger, above the daily trigger, above the weekly trigger, and above the monthly trigger. These are signs of a healthy bull market. Right here, healthy bull market. Do not panic sell the market prematurely or stay long the market if the correction widens. <clears throat> this afternoon, we confirmed a correction at 10 a.m. with a rejection of the daily trigger. And at 12 p.m., uh, and at 12 p.m., sellers closed the door with the rejection of the hourly trigger. Until correct conditions improve, we are now sellers of the rip. What now? Well, we look for downside targets. We sell the half-hour trigger and hourly triggers. I should have made a note that on three moves, three legs down, we will likely come back to the daily trigger as a reset. You saw that in the charts I showed you earlier. So I want you to be aware of that. We are near that point right now, by the way, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. We look for conditions to improve or fail to improve on any return to the daily trigger. We watch the daily trigger for crossing the weekly trigger. Predict a, 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 a larger bear market crash. I want this point here I want to show you. This point here where I say we watch the daily trigger for crossing the weekly trigger because it predicts a larger bear market or crash. I'm going to show you an example of this right now. I want to explain this to you right now here. So if we are in a corrective environment, you will see price follow along with me. You will oftentimes see price come down but you will not you will not see the daily trigger follow along you'll see the daily triggers kind of float around up here that is important and it is material because if you see the, da the daily trigger follow price down to the weekly trigger that's bad that is predicting bad news so good news, bull. I don't know how to do this. Good news for bulls, just a correction. Daily trigger staying high even though price is coming down. Daily trigger chasing price down, bad. Right? Simplify this shit for you. Really simple. Do we have examples of this? Yes, we do. So right now, has daily trigger chased? Not yet. Let's see some examples of this in the past. I'm going to give you some beautiful ones here. There's a perfect one right here. Notice how we're correcting. Notice how price is correcting, but the daily trigger is not following, right? Not following, 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 not following. But then all of a sudden, you see what? You see the daily trigger follow. If you see that daily trigger follow and cross the weekly trigger, you get your, you get your ability to get out, right? Here and here, you get your ability to exit the market in an orderly fashion. And the daily trigger is telling you prior to that, prior, oh, no, dude, we're going to crash. Oof. So I want you to pay close attention. I want you to pay, pay very close attention with your triggers and velocity to the daily trigger crossing the weekly trigger because it predicts a larger bear market or crash. Very important why you need triggers and velocity. Now here are the targets below if we continue with a corrective path. This is called here the golden ratio. On a um, 
Hold on. I'm not fibbing out. Sorry, I'm, my, I can't breathe here. My voice is killing me. On a Fibonacci retracement here, this is your golden ratio down below. Uh, so we've already come into the 0.382. I'm expecting a little bit more down and then a pull up. And I'm looking for the hourly trigger and daily trigger to send us lower into that golden ratio. Where is that golden ratio right now? Well, it's sitting down here at 4, I believe it's at a 490, 495. So somewhere between 5,000 and 5,000 and this 495 on SPY at least uh, for the correction to end in a bounce and a relief rally at minimum. At minimum to come up in case, just in case that daily trigger comes down and begins to sell us down to the next golden ratio. This golden ratio is based upon the pullback here, right? Down at 460, 470. If we are wrong in this pullback or this assumption of a correction, or if conditions improve, let's say we come up and we once again regain the daily trigger, the correction is over and we move higher. You'll see that that's stated right here on any recovery to the daily uh, trigger with a new high, of course. With a new high, of course, uh, the correction is complete, regardless of the golden ratio down below. Let's say we reverse here, come down, and we slam off that daily trigger, and we begin to head lower again, right? That lines up with the next chart. Uh there are behind the scenes defects that could lead to an even larger correction, like a move to the monthly trigger. It's not a concern yet, nor should it be traded yet. But let's take a look at them below. Until weekly velocity cools off, any test of it, uh, any test of, of not it, of the, it's actually any test of weekly trigger will likely break, break through the first chart below. Noted in stream yesterday and covered in past week's briefs, CTA support was broken today being yesterday this is material and ominous as there were they were accumulating uh, or or ctas were chasing the accumulation of um of market of stock market equities from the october 2023 20 lows what if ctas trigger major selling well it triggers a major correction or crash targets in the last chart below trade the weekly trigger if the daily trigger breaches the weekly trigger, we will trade the CTA momentum crash. Here is your first chart that shows that currently the weekly velocity is topping and going lower. Whenever we are testing a trigger at the top of Velo, positive Velo, it has a fair chance of breaking, believe it or not. When, when Momo or when velocity is on the downside, When velocity is down here below zero line, like negative 25, negative 50, right? Zero or negative, any attack of it is the opposite of what your brain would tell you. It should hold. We should actually go up on the zero line of velocity or negative velocity. Does that make sense to you? When we're at zero line or we are at negative velocity, this, the trigger should hold triggers tend not to hold when we're in maxed out positive velocity though daily velocity is very um supportive over time uh once we start to see uh lower highs on daily velocity daily velocity will break notice we have the divergence here and we finally have the break of daily velocity there daily velocity acts a little bit different than weekly velocity here is your chart for here is your chart for SPX CTA positioning. I want to, you to take note that they began to accumulate early October of 2023. They really ramped it, though, on November 6th. This is when the market was bottoming and turning up. Now, right now, what do we have right now? A, something material to be scared about. Currently, we are, we are in the sell range for CTAs, though if we recover above the daily trigger, everything will be all set and will be good to go again. CTAs won't panic sell. But if CTAs begin to chase momentum to the downside, 
you can just look at the epic run from October and December into April, and it was historic, right? Straight up. Market went straight up. Absolutely straight up. If we see panic selling or or velocity from uh, CTAs selling, this is what you can expect. This is CTA risk off selling. We showed you the golden ratio from here to here. Now we know that CTAs came into the market here to here. So if we get CTAs ramping up the selling and we take that same measurement from here, what do we see? We see that same golden ratio from before. Then we see the slam and break of the weekly trigger. <clears throat> and then we look for the next golden ratio below which is where down at 460 to 45326 close to a 14% decline i think it's 13.76 from top to bottom down below just above where CTAs began to ramp their accumulation CTAs next support level is right in here okay this is a lesson by the way uh, we got the SPY one-hour expectations for today, right? We're right here. I don't know where the market is right now. I'm not watching the one-minute trigger, but a little bit of a bounce down below. 502 and then 502 up here. I do expect this to, or I do expect some kind of a trade over here. I mean, this is a, this isn't meant to be, uh, rep this is like expanded so you can see it, I should say. But I would expect, let's say it was like this and like that, and we squeeze all the way up to the daily trigger. Okay, even though it shows just right here, that would be the minimum ex expectation. That's the hourly trigger on a four hour chart would be up here to the daily trigger on a four hour chart. <laughs> Q's, same thing. I'm looking for a test below at 428 and then a crazy dip down to 422.50 unless conditions improve. IWM, looking for some kind of a rejection above at 196 and a bloodbath down possibly to their monthly trigger at 190 and then a rip higher to their daily trigger as well iwm to me is scary if we do not cut rates i am going to expect them to have a major downside move coming up be very careful with iwm it is very rate sensitive and specifically to the trade of whether we are cutting or not cutting rates are we ramping into a rate cut before the market rolls? Uh, but the, this whole trade has been predicated upon just the discussion of whether we are going to or not going to cut rates. Right there, bam, to the downside. There's one last caveat here you may or may not have read. Like for bulls in a buy the dip environment, we are now in a sell the rip environment. If conditions improve, we will switch back to buy the dip. But until then, do not confuse the two as it can lead to major losses. I say this to bears all the time on the inverse, and some listen and some do not. And the ones that do not pay rent and not a mortgage. The same holds true for you. If you are a bull, you may be, so right here, if you are a bull, you may be wondering if there are, is any good news. Yes, two things. Eraser gang, that's Elliot Waver's. Uh, has us turning up here, meaning the correction is over and we are just stretching. Number two, there was large call buying Friday and Monday. Number three, there is no number three bulls. Like I tell the bears, trade what is in front of you. If conditions improve, we will buy the dip again. I'll see you again tomorrow on stream. <laughs> God damn, that sucked. <laughs> that was a lot of work. <laughs> oh, fuck me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hold on. Let me go back to uh, where we are right now. <laughs> Shit, that was a lot of work. <laughs> I need to get some water or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on here. <laughs> I need gummies, dudes. 
<laughs> uh, price coming back to check a five minute trigger. <laughs> God. <laughs> Now, some of you out there don't need this. You might be sitting at home and saying, ah, oh, Captain, I called the correction. You might be like, I called it another 10 times and got it wrong. It didn't matter, though. I don't tell anybody. I just delete those posts. <laughs> you might be like, Captain, I only call the corrections from the top every time perfectly. You might be telling yourself that. You might be telling yourself, ah, oh, Captain, I follow along with all this stuff, and I know exactly when uh, to do this and not do this. As a matter of fact, if you did call the correction correctly, you likely are lying that you had money in the market because you would have been uh, maintenance, I don't know, 15 times this past week. Let me show you that example really quick. So be careful out there what people tell you. You're not going to tell me. You're not going to tell me that your provider allowed you to just stay short this entire time. That just did not happen, okay? I know that it didn't happen. I know you got wrecked. The reason why you don't call corrections before is because when we get range expansion, you can make a shit ton of money as a swing trader in these environments. A bunch of money. Does that make sense to you? Uh, and you get self-doubt. A bear gets self-doubt. There can't be any way that a bear is sitting here on this shit saying, oh, fuck, we're going to correct. There can't be no way that a bear is happy here, right, or here, or even here. So uh, in real terms and real money making and losing, um, it is important for you to trade the price that's in front of you and know the environment uh, that you are in, hands down at all times. <laughs> and if we are in a correction, and if the correction is not going to resolve itself, uh, you are early to the party. You can turn bear, and you can be a bear for two and a half months. Think about that. Two and a half months of being a bear available to you. Now, this leg of the correction, this is important. This leg of the correction is almost complete. So listen to me when I say this to you. Listen to me closely, especially bears. Well, a two-part, especially bears. This leg of the correction is almost complete. You're likely going to see a trip to the daily trigger. If you are a bull, you're likely going to come on this show and you're going to ask me prematurely, Captain Price is back on the daily trigger. Is the correction over? You said that. And I'm going to say, no, I didn't. Did you see a new high? Uh, the return to the daily trigger is the hourly trigger above it. You'll be like, yeah, it is. I'll be like, okay, did you get a new high? No, 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 we didn't. But you said... And we're like, no, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> that's not what I said. <laughs> so please try to get, you know, is the correction over? <laughs> so please try to get access to what I just showed you. Uh, please try to, if you don't have access to our website, come back to the show later and just snip this shit out for yourself so that you have it. You're like, oh, I'm going to file this away to uh, whatever. You can post this shit on Twitter if you want. I don't care if you do. I don't care if you share it with your friends. I don't care if you post it on Twitter. I don't care if you put it on a list on Twitter somewhere because that po this thing I just went over with you is very important. It's, it's the mechanics of a, a, of a pullback, a correction, a crash. It's very critical for you to understand these mechanics uh, as a trader as you get older. Now, if you're that guy out there that's like, hey, Cap, I didn't need all this, and Cap, I already knew, and Cap, I cut the top, whatever it is, this video segment may not have been for you. But I can assure you that there are a lot of viewers in this stream, and what this stream is intended for is for um, new, new investors, new traders. It's intended for longtime traders that don't have tools to know where we actually are in the marketplace. Uh, and this is meant for them. Uh, this, the whole intent of this stream was that my own friends did not understand the mechanics of the markets and where we are, and they didn't have a simple way. Remember this, a simple way to know. What I noticed when I started this stream was that my friends were going on to StockTwits, 
Wall Street bets, uh, the news, CNBC, Bloomberg, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, Fintwit. And they would read so much stuff that was complicated, hard to understand, uh, was sometimes right and sometimes wrong, uh, especially the assignment of the reasoning for why the market goes up and down. They would adjust their trading style to that information and be wrong the next time. So where you might be reading Fintwit today or reading something from GS or reading something from CNN or reading something from CNBC, and they may be assigning, hey, uh, uh, the market's crashing right now because of uh, Iran and Israel. Uh, the market's crashing right now because of um, real rates. Uh, the market's crashing right now because of this or that. And then you go, oh, yeah, okay, uh, market crashing uh, because Middle East turmoil. I'll put that in my brain for the next time. And then the next time you're trading and you see World War III doom and the market goes up and you say, why the fuck didn't it work that time? That guy was so smart. Why did it not work this time? It's because it's hard to assign and it's not uh, an edge to assign uh, any of the shit that you guys are fucking consuming and regurgitating on social media. It's not an edge. You need an edge in this market. Listen closely. You need, number one, an edge in this market. Number two, you need it to be simple. 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 Price action, support, resistance, uh, who's with you, right? That's the momentum of the market. Is the momentum of the market heading down? Is the momentum of the market heading up? And you need it simplified. The more that I see out there people going, it's because of this, it's because of that. And then all of a sudden everybody votes that it's for that one reason. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's definitely for this reason over here. And then you walk away with that as an investor, as a seller, as a buyer, and you imprint that in your fucking brains, and then you try it the next time, and it fails. And so you get back on Fintwit, and you find your next best bear, your next best bull, and you go, and you go, oh yeah, that guy was right the last time. That guy, that guy, they voted that guy over there. They said, that guy over there said it was because of this reason, dude, and everybody loved it. So then you go back out there the next time and you follow that guy and you go, ooh, the guy's got a million followers. He called it. And the reason he called it was because of, um, I don't know, the fucking inverted yield. We'll find anything. Uh, because there are pink turtles in, uh, there are pink turtles in uh, Bolivia. And that was the reason, dude. So we got to follow that guy. Guy's got it. So the next time that guy comes out and he's like, well, it's not because of pink turtles in Bolivia. It's because the fucking clouds are fucking, uh, the clouds are fucking black over in, uh, in uh, Park City, Utah. Right, we they got black clouds in Park City, Utah. So, uh, you know, uh, that's that's the reason, right? And all of a sudden, he's wrong, or she's wrong, and you go, "Fuck! I just lost everything." So you need, like, you need a uh, simple. Are we in a pullback? Are we in a correction? Are we in a bear market? Are we in a crash? Are we going up with momentum? Are we going down with momentum? You also need to know when uh when those things have resolved if you have those simple tools simple simple tools uh you don't need those people you don't need the top collars bottom collars you don't need uh the black clouds over park city or the pink turtles down in bolivia you don't need uh the rates you don't need any of that kind of stuff you can read it and be like yeah cool whatever awesome uh thanks for keeping me informed but you don't care about it you put your blinders on, you trade the price action that's in front of you, you know where the velocity is, you know what the velocity tells you, you know what the triggers are, you know what they're telling you, you know the order of those things and what they're telling you. And your life will change. Your entire existence in this market will change. You will stop worrying and you will be aware of what we really are. And the moment that you do that, right, your existence with those news organizations and with uh, Fintwit and Wall Street Bets and 
stock puts and all that stuff will change. You'll say, fuck. That's funny. Pink turtles in Bolivia. That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say to you. Uh, your life changes. It gets freed up at that point. Uh, so you can trade the price action that is in front of you. Um, now, when we combine this with some other shit. We combine this with gamma. We combine this uh, with uh, our, with time. Uh, one, half, one minute, half an hour, one hour. Time of the day, right? The hour starts at 9.30, not the top of the hour. It starts on the 30. Uh, we also time it with daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and the year as well. Um, okay, so moving on from all that crap. And we use LA Wave uh, with all that too in the background. Uh, though we don't trust LA Wave on its own. LA Wave is fucking racers, dude. You cannot trust. But all that stuff layered upon itself, that we get a fair read on where the market is. Okay. Um, I think that's all I've got here. We're not going to discuss uh, uh, Wolf Street yet, and we're not going to discuss uh, CTAs yet. But we will in two other segments in this program today. Uh, do I ever trade TLT options? That's like trading gold. Might as well just buy fucking Bitcoin, right? <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I do trade TLT sometimes. Uh, I do. I hate trading it, though, because it's like the DJ. It's like the DJI. When I was a kid, right? I got a story for you, Benno. When I was a kid, right? I had an uncle, and uh, he was an actual mafioso. He was a real one. He was a real mafioso. He, um, I don't know if I should say this, but uh, it's been a long time. It's been longer than anything, than anything I've ever heard of because it's been so long, so many years, like 20, 30 years. Uh, but he took photos for Auto Trader. It's a magazine for used cars. And so his job was to take a photo. He'd go from car lot to car lot to car lot, and he would take photos on, a, on rounds. He made rounds, and he would drive all over New England. There was a magazine called Auto Trader, and he made his rounds around New England, and uh, he would take photos of used cars once a week. And he would post them in Auto Trader for these uh, car dealerships. And uh, the other job that he had uh, was helping with bookmaking. He was a bookie. Or he wasn't a bookie, but he, was, he would, he would uh, uh, bring stuff from dealership to dealership. Do you know why? In the back rooms of auto dealerships, uh, there were phone banks with old, fat old guys, and they would take bets. And there was a whole network in New England of this going on. I probably shouldn't say it. Somebody's going to come around and try to fucking kill me. <laughs> fucking. <clears throat> now, my dad hated me hanging out with my uncle. But he was a good man. Uh, my uncle's a good man. And my uncle would uh, do things for me that my dad wouldn't. My dad was a real asshole to me. Uh, he was the kind of guy that was like, um, you were great at this and great at that and great at this. Oh, you missed that one thing right there. You're not a man. Sorry, no car. Uh, sorry, you're not playing baseball this year. You fucked up that one little thing. My dad was a real hard on me as his, as a I was his first son, not his only son, but his first son. And my dad did not want me to fail in life. So he was. Uh, my wife is somewhat like that with my daughters. My wife is uh, very demanding of my daughters, and she holds a very high standard for my children. She does not let them get away with anything. Uh, she's like, I demand that you are an A-plus student. I demand that you're in baccalaureate. I demand that you're in college. And those are high demands, so high expectations, right? My dad was very similar uh, to my wife, to them. Uh, it's very like when I see it, I'm like, oh, man, my wife is. So I try to counter that with my daughters, believe it or not. I'm like, I'm like your mom's not here right now. You guys want 100 bucks? Don't tell me. Uh, we're going to go grocery shopping. Let's take a left-hand turn. <laughs> You want to go see a movie? You want to go to the? You want to go to the place of my mini golf? What do you want to do? You want to go skydiving today? Don't tell mom, because I know she has high expectations of you. <laughs> now, anyways, that uncle. 
I would get to go hang out with them. I'd be like, oh, I don't feel good today. I need to I need a sick day from school. I'd call my uncle up and be like, be like, can you come get me so I can hang out with you today? So I'd go hang out with him. And he would, like, come pick me up because he does rounds, right, taking pictures. And he'd get me in his car. He had one of those, um, as a matter of fact, the car that he drove, you know that Pontiac? Uh, that Pontiac that was like a Camaro, but it had, like, a computer screen? It was like the first car with a computer screen. I forget what car, what car it's called. It was very rare, very hard to find. Uh, no, no, not a Trans Am. This was, a, this was like a really small car, like a Miata, not without the top. Nope, not a Sunfire. It's a very rare car to get. Uh, it was like one of the first cars with a computer screen on the inside. I know that. Anyway, it's in this cool car, right? Not out of Fiero. Uh, I'll have to find out what it is. I'll have to find out what car it is. Um, I don't think it was a Fiero. It might have been, but I don't think that it was. Look up, it had a round window in the back, too. Um, no, nah, not a Firebird. It's a very rare car. But anyways, he had this car. It was super cool. He took me around, right? And I'll find it. I'll find the car. Uh, I forget what it's called. It's a very rare car. I said rare. It's rare. There's not many of them. Anyways. <laughs> it could have been a coupe. I don't remember, but doesn't matter. What matters is this. I made the mistake. He was like, I'm going in. He's like taking pictures with me, pulling off the film. It's like this big square camera. Um, and he's, I'll, 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 I'll find the car. I'll find the car for you. All right. I'll find out what the car was. I'll find out what the car was. A little bit of reversal here for the bulls. Bulls looking to turn it around and not, not trade down lower. Can the bulls do it? So not, nah, not a gremlin. This car had, look up cars that had the first computers, computer screen, first cars, first ones. Here, I'll, I'll do it. Fine. Fuck it. I'll get back to the story in a minute. <laughs> we'll find out what car it was. Dude, now they're showing the interiors, not the exteriors of these fucking cars. Uh, I gotta see the exterior of this thing. Maybe it was an LCD screen. First car with LCD screens. Um, it was a two door. What's that car? What was that one? Uh, it's not this Buick. Nope, 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 nope. Um, damn, I gotta find out what this car is now. They're saying Buick. It was a really cool car. Uh, computer screen. It was a coupe. It was some kind of a coupe with uh with round rear window. Fast car too. Fast ish. Uh, round rear window. Now you got me going down a fucking rabbit hole here. Um, I think it was one of these right here. No, it's not a Riviera, but the screen looked like the Riviera, though. All right, all right. Not right now. We're not going to do this right now. I'm going to go down a goddamn fucking rabbit hole. I'm going to end up going down a fucking rabbit hole in this shit. I can already tell. Anyways. <laughs> these old, I walked into the back of a car dealership. And mistakenly, and uh, was not Kit, <laughs> was not a Firebird. Um, <laughs> you guys are on that. You guys are like it's a fucking Firebird. He's wrong. <laughs> so I go and I go with my uncle, and one day I wound up in the back alleyway, or not back alleyway, the back room of a dealership, and there was like a room full of old men. And they had a bunch of uh, corded phones, and they were taking and placing bets. And they were all on their phones. It was like uh, eight-foot tables in a square. And there are these old, old guys with, like, cigarettes, and they're on the phone, and they're taking bets down. And my uncle grabbed me, 
by the uh, grabbed me by the back of the shirt and was like, N- "You're not supposed to be in here," and walked me back out. This is like a just like a movie, just like looking at some movie. And he's like, "Go outside and wait for me." So that happened, right? So I get in the car later with my uncle, and the, my uncle's. Like, I was like, "Why didn't? You, why shouldn't I back bed? It's a bunch of old guys." And he's like, "Those guys right there were uh, bookies, and you do not want to be back there around people like that." And I was like, "Ooh," and I felt so cool. And that brings me back to TLT and DJI. I will trade DJI and TLT when I am an old fucking man and I'm fat and I'm sitting in my lazy boy and I'm like 80 because I hate buying TLT or buying DJIA and watching it go up for three, four, five sessions, 10 sessions, and my calls still don't fucking print. I got to wait like a month. <laughs> And I always, for some reason, revert back to that image in my mind of watching those fat old guys with nothing better to fucking do than play, now that I'm an old man, than to play play mafioso. But in reality, they're just all taking bookie bets for their other old friends because they got nothing better to fucking do in their life. (laughs) Is, oh, uh, no, 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 not that one. So for me, I think about that. Uh, so why do I not trade TLT? Uh, because I'm not fucking 80 reading the newspaper in the library. I'm not taking b- bets for my buddies on who's going to win a football game. <laughs> Fat and, uh, you know, bald. and <laughs> I will be one day. I just I'm, I'm not that today. Uh, so I don't trade TLT. So Benno, I like TLT. Uh, I like when it runs. Sometimes I trade it. I just tend not to a lot. I like the price action of spoos. I like the in, out, and I like the, the print on it. So uh, for me personally, but if you like TLT, I can put it up for you whenever you want. Um, if you ever want me to chart out TLT for you, I will, I'm more than welcome to do it for you. Uh, matter of fact, you want us to put it up for you today maybe? I'll put it up right now. But be careful of a reversal here on spoos. SPX, some buyers stepping in on the 30-minute basis. Just be careful of this. You can see some kind of a bottoming here. Notice this right here. I want you to keep your eyes right here, okay? Keep your eyes on this bottoming action. And there's a little bit of, this looks kind of similar, doesn't it? Like it's just begging for a squeeze up higher, right? For a halfback trade to 5,100. So just be aware of it. We're trading a one-minute chart over here, which is inconsequential uh, to this chart down here on a half-hour basis. Let's do TLT. Benno, are you still out there or no, man? Tell me if you're still out there. Benno's like, I, turned, I tuned out. It took too long to tell the story. Fuck you, Captain. <laughs> I left, man. <laughs> Here's uh, TLT in a 30-minute basis. Blood and down. TLT in a corrective uh, posture. Your target for TLT is um, uh, definitely uh, $82, $85, somewhere in there. Benno, you are still there. Sweet. What's up, brother? (laughs) I got you, man. Uh, Benno's still looking for more more corrective action. The one thing I'll tell you is this, Benno, if you're watching right now, I want to show you this, okay? This is a 30-minute basis right here. You have uh, basically one, two, maybe a little bit more bloodletting, but that's your three. So I would expect a trip back to the daily trigger. Uh, And if we have further downside to come, it's probably still there. So you're close to a turnaround on TLT, but uh, you are still in a corrective environment on it currently. Uh, You would need to see a price above $92 for the correction to be over on TLT uh, Benno. So currently price target on TLT, $84.58. 
to 82.67. I'll chart this out for you right now. Uh, so you got one move down. Actually, you, got, you already got your three moves. It's, it's actually started up higher. So you got your first move down right here. One, two, three. Okay. Expect a move to $92, and we could possibly, uh, as a matter of fact, it would be $90. Uh, uh, hold on. Oh, let me get rid of this for a minute. Hold on. One, two, three. Uh, one. Is simple, we'll just, just pretty simple. One, two, make it really, really easy to understand. Pretty simple. One, two, three, moves already made. You're going to be looking for right in here. A squeeze higher. Come on now, give me that thing. Be looking for a squeeze higher, and if you cannot reject, you will be looking for uh, one, two, and three to the downside right there. Right there. If the corrective action is no longer open, if you want to see, if you think, yeah, the corrective action is over, you are going to be looking for. Oh, no, I shouldn't do that. A new high right there in continuation of the upside. And you're rock and roll at that point to re enter the market right about there. You want, oh, no. You would be a buyer right here. Or you'd be a buyer here. Maybe that makes sense for you, something like that. And that's a wonky ass looking thing, but it's not my it's my, not my prettiest five minute or it's not my prettiest uh <laughs> it's not my prettiest um it's not my prettiest chart down here. You get the idea though. And it's very simple. One, two, three, boom, back down. Fairly simple. Uh, this is TLT. I would make it look prettier if I had 15 minutes to do this else somewhere else. I'm doing this on the fly. <laughs> there you go. TLT. <laughs> I got to take a break. It's a regatta. That's the one. You got it. Chopper, uh, Chopper got it. It's a regatta. It's a regatta or a Riata. It's one of those two. Regatta or Riata. It's either of those two. It's one of those two cars. It's one of those two cars. You got it. You nailed it. That's the car. Yeah, it's a Riata or the, or the Regatta. It's, yeah, Riata. It's one of those two cars. Whatever that name is, that's the car I'm talking about. That was a cool-ass car. That was the car. But bada bing, baby. <laughs> Remember that this is a one minute chart. Whether we get this move lower or not, this is not a lot of room here. Uh, we are going to see uh, one way or another. Oh, shit. <laughs> Look at that thing. <laughs> Regardless of whether we get out or not, we are going up. We are turning up, whether you like it or not. So uh, we are, one way or another, heading up. And uh, we're actually going to go up even higher. The move is higher, not lower, if you, if you don't know that. The move is, like, guaranteed higher. Unless there's some uh, geopolitical shit going on, 
the move is higher. Uh, like when you scale out a little bit from one minute chart, you're like, yeah, what's what's that right there? I don't know. <laughs> one fifteen, baby. It's now eleven thirty. We just had two bond auctions. Uh, those are out of the way. No market's not going to do shit. Waiting on Jerome Powell to speak. I'm going to take a quick break. I got to I got to rest my my throat. Uh, I don't need to work out today. Went golfing yesterday. Went uh, bike riding Sunday. Went dancing on Saturday with the kids. <clears throat> I'm fucking. I don't need any exercise. My libido is pumping, which is good. I'm getting good sleep, which is good. And I'm getting a fuck ton of sleep. Like I'm like beat. Uh, so there you go. And I will be with you here in just a moment. Be back with you in just a moment. Yeah, our homeboy is speaking at one. Does he calm markets or does he not calm markets? You are still sell the rip. I'll do it again for Winky. Let's go look at this one more time. It's a good question. Yeah, I think Winky missed it earlier. Hold on a second, Winky. We'll do it right now again, Winky. Good question, Winky. Winky, this is for you specifically. And Winky, I talked about this earlier, but I know people didn't hear it. No, 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 no. We're doing it because I know that people didn't hear it. Or are you just joking? No, no, we're going to do it. We have to do it because uh, I don't think people understand it. It's very important that we do it. If you are a bear, you're selling the half hour trigger. And hour, well, yeah, we're here to be selling the hourly trigger, but when we become violent, you sell the half hour trigger. This is leg two. This is leg three. We will make a return to the daily trigger. If we pr proceed to not get a new high, we will then sell the hourly and half hourly trigger sell. Half hour trigger sell. Hourly sell. We will return to the hourly, the daily trigger. So notice the return to the daily trigger. Notice the turn to the return to the daily trigger. Right? One here, one there. If we are in a corrective environment, the corrected, corrective environment can resolve to the upside at any time. Make sense? So we are selling the half hour and hourly trigger in each leg down. But we will also return to the daily trigger along the way. Make sense? Let's go to a trigger screen. Let's go to a one hour basis. Three movements. You ready? One. Well, that's a little bit too big. One, two, and three. You're now going to expect a return to the daily trigger, and then you'll start another process of one, two, and three off of the one hour, and when we get violent, the half hour trigger. Bears don't have it as nice as we do. Let me explain this better. Let me explain this more easily. If this chart was inversed, you're buying the half hour and hourly. You're returning to the daily trigger. You're buying the half hour and hourly. Once that's lost, you return to the daily trigger. 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 It's just the inverse now. Does that make sense? It's just the inverse. So the movement is basically complete. complete. You'd be looking for a return to the daily trigger, which would be like a pullback. A pullback for bulls, but it's a pullback for bears. Does that make sense? Pullback for bears. Think of it like a pullback for bears. Does that help? Pullback for bears. And this should actually, if, if bears are in control, it'll fail right here. If, if bears are in control, it should fail right about there.
Not always, but should. All right, Winky, I'm taking a break. Brinky's like, that's it. Take a break, motherfucker. <laughs> All right, I'm taking a break. I'll be back in just a moment. I'm going to put some, uh, some diarrhea on for you right now. <laughs> I'm going to put some diarrhea on. <laughs> While I'm gone. <laughs> While I'm gone on a break, why don't you guys ask yourselves out there for just a gut check? Is the correction complete, or is there more down to go? Uh, more correction ahead, correction finished. And ask yourselves that, uh, or maybe if a uh, 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 board could ask that question in the chat, um, ask that question on the um, like a poll or something. My answer to that is we don't know yet. If you want to know, we don't know. Not enough information. So like yes, no, not enough information would be the would be the correct answer, by the way. <laughs> we already did the pullback. Pullback was to the daily trigger. We're now in a correction. I can assure you of that. We're in a correct we're in a correction. 100%. I can show you every time we are and we are. It's like I have it all mapped out back to the beginning of the stock market. We are in a correction right now. Thank you, Jill, for saying that. I appreciate that. Jill's saying she would uh, like to see the gap filled in SPX down at 498.5 ish. We are 100% still in a correction. Or at least how we define it. I should say that. At least how we define it. I can assure you also that how other people define a correction, they're wrong 90% of the time. Uh, AMC, I'll bring that one up right now. Woo. AMC. Nice. Good job calling out AMC. Whoever did that, thank you. AMC in a, on a successful back test of $2.50. Targeting $3.50. Good job, whoever called that out. Good community right there. This is AMC. Be right back.
All right. Um, here with you. Weird. There's. Um. International Research Forum on Monetary Policy it says the events will resume at 2 p.m. I don't know if that's it with Jerome Powell. Yeah, I've got. It's really weird. I've got a. Um, I've got a live broadcast here. You hear that there? Uh, so the ECB counter to what Christine said earlier. Uh, there's now counter information out there, but I bet it's bullshit. Um, we'll see what that was, what was just said there. But uh, there was counter. Um, Christine Lagarde said, uh, or um, she, earlier she said, uh, we expect cuts sooner than later. And now she's being, either she or one of her uh, people are saying, um, though, so the former form of the government of Bank of Canada, thank you for saying that, Segastic. Forum with uh, the governor of Bank of Canada. I don't see it here. I'm looking for a live broadcast of it. Or even like a holding pattern live broadcast. I got some, I got some like Bloomberg and shit up in the background here. Uh, they might switch over to it. Maybe we'll get the broadcast through them. That's the key part right there, right? There's no other details. I'm going to assume at this point that whatever the response is from Israel, uh, there's a few things we need to talk about that. So let's, let's, let's be clear about some stuff. Uh, this is 100% factual. Israel does not have the current ability to be an expeditionary force, okay? They do not. Could they? Yes. But are they? And do they have the ability to project power with logistics? No. <clears throat> Nor does Iran. Iran's got the manpower, but they don't have the ability to project power uh, to Israel. And that has more to do with the seas. I don't see I've got the I've got the IMF page up right now. Uh there's a live uh leveraging fiscal rules and frameworks to navigate today's fiscal challenge. Um upcoming I've got a bunch of upcoming stuff here for the IMF. IMF's got all kinds of live streams today. Yeah, Netflix is gangster, right? Uh, Netflix is beautiful, so here we go. Well, let's see if we can break above now and get up to that hourly trigger. Just take a peek here.
Are you listening to me, Financial Juice? It'd be kind of cool if they just popped in and said, yes, we have you on. Yes, we are what we are listening. <laughs> Do <you> any <laughs> Financial juice, if you're listening, say the color blue. <laughs> Hold on, I'm getting on, I'm getting on. I've got a bunch of stuff going on. Yeah, Netflix is gangster. Uh, Apple, I'm unsure of right here, but they got a nice little dip by down below. Uh, Netflix, though, gorgeous. I'm not going to bounce through these. Um... Does anybody? Oh, uh, GCT. Thank you for saying something. Uh, let's bring up GCT here. All right. All right. Hold on. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. GCT, baby. Oh, yeah, doggy. What's up, baby? What's happening, GCT? What up? <laughs> My name is GCT. GCT, baby. What's going on? Been pumping that shit for. Look at GCT out there. Woohoo! <laughs> burr, baby, burr, GCT. Yeah, there's like, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't be, Christine, don't be out there saying we're cutting rates yet. You need the U.S. to cut rates first. <laughs> Can't be telling America that. <laughs> America trying to front run a, a crash on cut rate cuts. You do that, you know, I'm going to tell you guys something. That news that's coming out right now is not real. It's intended uh, to calm the markets in the U.S. as a heads up. Uh, from the guards uh, statements earlier this morning right you guys understand that like what am i doing here doing that wrong doing that wrong doing that wrong doing that wrong okay we're back <laughs> gct <laughs> let's leave that right there does anybody have a link to jerome powell's uh speech I can't seem to find it. Whoa. You sent the link? Hold on, Sagastic. Hold on, brother. Hey, Sagastic, thanks for sending that link, brother. I appreciate it. Also, um, what else did I have a question about? Uh, burr, burr. Uh, 
Uh, Mike D. Uh, Mike D. Uh, if you're out there, I had a conversation with you on Twitter this morning. Can you say hello in the chat, um, wherever you are in chat, so that... It says that my stream on YouTube is poor right now. Is that real? I'm going to close a couple tickers on here. What do I got going on? I'm going to close some stuff over here. Hold on. It says my stream health is not good. I want to see if he's out there right now because I want to make him a moderator. Stream on YouTube is fine. Thanks for saying something. Um, I'm looking for, if you're listening right now out there, I'm looking for, um, I want to make him a moderator if possible. Um, I'm looking for uh, Mike uh, Desipoli. He's out there. Mike Spoli, Desipoli, if you're out there right now, I want to make you a moderator. I don't know where you are, if you're on the stream right now or not. Maybe you'll tune in, tune in later. If you're out there, What the what the hell is going on here? Can you hear my voice? That's all I want to know. Can you hear my voice? Did I piss off the Chinese and the Russians today? Or the government? Not the people, but the government. Ooh, here we go. Uh, this event, this event will be webcast. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, RSVP for the event. Um, RSVP. I can't RSVP here. I click the RSVP button, and now I just got a blank screen. It's okay if you're Chinese. I'm talking about the government, not your, not your, uh, if you're from China or if you're Russian. I got no problems with Russians and Chinese. <laughs> I want you to know that if you're Chinese, if your nationality is Chinese, or I've got no, uh, no, no dislike for you out there. Psychonic, uh, Psychotic Reaver. Psychonic Reaver, can you post the link in Discord? What's the title? Live Fed Chair Delivers. Alexa, be quiet, please. Fed Chair Powell. I got no dislike for humans out there. It's a CNN channel.
Why am I having so many fucking problems doing this? It shouldn't be that hard. There we go. Mr. Talking Monkey just did it. Hold on. Thank you very much, gents. I appreciate it. Appreciate it there, boys and girls. Second gas, uh, second deck gastic. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, moderators, admins, thank you very much. Appreciate it for the links. So I make sure I'm set up here and I'm not, um, sweet. I got it right here. Financial juice, you didn't post the link on your website. If you're listening right now, what's the matter with you? <laughs> okay, so this goes bye bye. This goes bye bye. Let's take a look down here. Let's keep this up here. We'll just leave the bear doom right here. it right there for you we'll extend this stuff over make this green that should be green not red i shouldn't have the red there sorry guys all right right in there they got the hedge in the market for uh jerome powell doom let's take a quick look at the 30 minute and just look at Velo right now and see what Velocity is telling us. Uh, velocity is saying we're going up. So Velocity looks good for the Bulls on a 30-minute basis. It's my favorite uh, intraday and weekly Velocity. Diamond Dave, what up, brother? Good to see you, man. Uh, okay, so we've got the new squawker in the background. I'm going to turn off CNBC. You will have live uh, video. Do you guys prefer that I put, there's two choices we can do here. I can either do, um, I can either do, I can do video down below with just Jerome Powell, or I could do in this screen over here, or I could do Jerome Powell with a split screen uh, that does like uh, Dixie rates and SPX or something. It's your choice. I want you to see how the market is just pausing right now as well because for, two, for one important thing, um, number one is... Uh, the ECB will not cut rates until the U.S. does. And Lagarde this morning was saying, oh, yeah, we're about ready to cut rates. I'm sure somebody from the Fed called up and said, uh, change that statement. Why? Because if that's the case, that they truly are going to cut rates, the U.S. would cut first. Jimmy Berry just said to you, get used to the U.S. not cutting rates. Well, that has been the statement from myself and Jimmy for months, right? Months and months and months going back to October. The longer that we do not cut rates, the market will stay up. The moment that they do cut rates, the market will attempt to front run that. And the market will crash. Now, making that statement, traders, hedge funds, liquidity providers, uh, banks, realize this at this point and so there's a second trade and the second trade is uh running bullshit news to say 
Expect rate cuts. Uh, now don't expect rate cuts. Expect rate cuts. Now don't expect rate cuts. So there's two stories. So I want you to be aware of that, that there's two stories going on. You've got the day trading, intra-week trading, inter-month trading, that uh, story about rate cuts and not rate cuts that has more to do with money, real money, uh, on an intra-day, intra-week, intra-month basis. And then you have the truth. Are we going to cut rates or not cut rates? And that is a completely different story. And you should know the difference between both. There's one story and the other story. You have to keep both separate. Do not believe anyone out there that tells you that we will cut rates and the market will not roll down. Uh, do not believe anyone that tells you that. The other way that the market rolls down is if we have broken something or, uh, fundamental in our economy. Another note for specifically today is to be careful of repricing of options as Jerome begins to speak. Dealers do not want to pay you. You will see the uh, vent vol come off. You'll see uh, repricing as we go up if we are going up. Make sure you're like taking your money on the zero dates, then take re, re uh, I shouldn't do that one there. Hold on. That's more accurate like that. Also on these events, we tend to not squeeze this high. So you'll see like small event like this, you might see the squeeze up here, right? Then you might see some of this and fails. You don't actually see it. It's not like a rate decision or a, um, a big event where we actually get all the way up here. So um, they might, might go up later in the day but not right now. So just be careful of this move, this part of the move right here. Or be conscious that it can fail. Uh, execute your trades, uh, you know, like one, two, then three. Stagger them, just don't be like, just don't be crazy like, we're going all the way to fucking, Cap says we're going all the way to 512 right now at this moment. Like just be, be tactful, I would say, as a bull. Another note for today would be that we are still in sell the rip. Due to being sell the rip, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, probably Jimmy. I think it was Jimmy, but uh, we have the ability on bad or good news uh, to make wild-ass swings. Dealers chase. The reason we get those amplifications is because dealers chase those swings in cash market. They don't do that uh, in a bull market. I want to see fucking blood here in Dixie. I'm all, you know, what I'm going to do, if I'm not going to do the split screen, then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do the, uh, I'm going to do TNX. I'm going to do tits and, at, oh, oopsie, <laughs> tits and, uh, they, them, or tits and, uh, tits and, uh, I don't know. I shouldn't say what I was going to say. I was going to say something to be derogatory towards. Um, Elon, but I shouldn't. It's super gross. Um, TNX. We're going to do tits and ass right now. You know what? One of my coolest things uh, I saw. Have you guys? I don't know if you guys seen this. Um, there's a bumper sticker that uh, Tesla owners have right now, <laughs> and they're like, "I love my Tesla, but I don't love Elon." Woof! What a what a shot across the bow. Like it or dislike it, it's. Can you imagine owning a Tesla? <laughs> or not owning a Tesla, but seeing a Tesla owner with uh, a Tesla owner with 
Uh, I love my Tesla, but I hate Elon. Woof. That is some gnarly ass shit. Okay, so you, someone just asked if I'm in calls here. Uh, I am in calls still uh, for yesterday, and I'm going to try to buy some more zero dates here in just a moment. Well, now zero dates. Uh, now, what am I looking for to buy? I'm looking down below here. See this little thing right down here? If I can get any kind of a dip buy down below, I'm looking for like some kind of like doom and gloom, and then woof, straight up, something like that. So uh, if I add anything right now, I will. I think I said that on, ta on ta Twitter this morning. I said I'm holding all day long. It's adding two positions, adding two positions, and uh, trying, to, trying to catch a um, uh, payday. You guys have been here long enough. You know how this goes, right? 20 cent calls, 20 cent calls, 20 cent calls. Ching, ching, $3.50. Woo! <laughs> A minute 47 until Jerome Powell comes on. Minute 47. He will be on here. I will have him on for you live in just a moment. Matter of fact, we'll switch over to it right now. Uh, oh, here we go. It's on, baby. Or it's getting on. It's almost on. I might just buy some right now. I started buying calls yesterday at the bottom. Then I started buying calls right at the close. And now I'm about to add some more fucking calls. And I got, fuck, dude, I got, I'm loaded up. <laughs> Load the fuck up. There we go. Got some 509s. 509. Can you hear him speaking right now? The reason he's paused is because I'm speeding him up to real time. Do you have audio right now? What are you watching on right now? Can you hear my voice? Can you hear me? You can hear me, you can't hear the speaker. On Twitch, no audio. Okay.
Can you hear him now? Can you hear the Canadian guy speaking now? Can you hear the Canadian guy now speaking? All right, all right. Sorry, I'm changing some settings here in the background. That I assure it is several cuts above the typical former official's post service book. I put it Can you hear him now? Rubens in an uncertain world. Anyone who has ever served in any government of any country at any level at any time. Okay, you can hear him now. We recognize the honesty and intelligence right. and savvy that he's brought to thinking about the lessons. Sorry, I've been having monitor issues. For the issues facing Canada and all of us, I highly urge all of you to read it. Diff Macklem is the governor of the Bank of Canada. And another of the reasons for Canada's substantial above weight punching in the world. I'm going to speed up the stream so it's real time. YouTube natively delays shit every five minutes. So once in a while you're gonna hear me you're gonna hear the speech going blah 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 blah. It's just me speeding it up. Of the Financial Stability Board's original consultative group for the Americas. He's a distinguished economist. Having headed the most important division of the bank's economic staff in the early 2000s, having played a critical role in Canada's response to the great financial crisis uh, in his post in the Canadian Finance Ministry in the mid-2000s, he's been a senior deputy governor of the bank. Two thousand ten until his appointment as governor. He's also been a distinguished academic, having served as dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And our final panelist is Jerome Powell, chair of the board of governors of the Federal Reserve System. Woo! Let's go, Powell. It's a weird task uh, to introduce Chair Powell. It's like introducing Henry Kissinger. Woo! No, it isn't. Looking absurd. His doctoral thesis on Metternich received very high marks. Uh, so just let me say this. There is an anteroom off the main boardroom in the Eccles building, which is the Fed's true headquarters building. They're currently slumming it in an annex. Slumming uh, it. Where the portraits of all the Fed's chairmen hang. And as you look Blame around, Canada. You, <laughs> Sorry. none of them will have been as consequential across as broad a range of matters as Jerome Hayden Powell in managing the remarkably low inflation and high employment of the pre-COVID period in the world historical response to both, a, both nationally and globally to the COVID event in the first major review and, ex and explanation of a formal monetary policy framework for the Fed, and in managing the quite effective response to the most significant inflation in almost half a century, but one in which many of the traditional guideposts could not be helpful, requiring very creative thinking. I love you, Canada. Management of the extremely well-meaning, but hydra-headed body that is the Federal Open Market Committee. So with that, let me thank you again for coming, and let's turn to our panel. Hey. You're data dependent, of course. Well, I want to start by thanking you, Randy, for uh, for both for that of course his name is Randy. He's from very, fucking Canada. Set of introductions, and also for your willingness to step forward as the co-chair of the Washington Forum on the Canadian Economy. So we uh, very much appreciate. All right, I'll stream it from there. Hold on, I'm going to look right. Hold on. One of the key reasons we're here today is is due to that. So really appreciate it. I'll just say personally, one of the things I like most is you said Canadians were sane. So uh, that's a pretty good starting point, I think, for our discussion here Focus, today. Uh, on the differences. Uh, so Ooh, yeah, hold on a second here. Systems of government. I won't really be speaking we, much. We're bilingual in Canada. We have three down football. Way better, way better broadcast. Good job, whoever called that out. We even have very colorful polymer banknotes. Uh, and and uh, certainly... Uh, whoever said that, thank you. Uh, I think our, our, uh, certainly uh, the IMF meetings are always a welcome uh, of spring for the Canadians. Uh, our, Cana our, our economies obviously have much in, in common, but again, we, we often focus on the differences. If you look at growth in Canada and the United States over the 20 years leading up to COVID, remarkably, it was the average. These guys are all named after hockey players, you can already tell. Both countries. 
The sources of growth, though, uh, have been a bit different. In Canada, we've grown more by adding workers. Our participation rate has risen more, and we've had proportionally higher rates of immigration. In the United States, adding workers has also been important, uh, but increasing output per worker or productivity uh, has made a relatively larger uh, <laughs> contribution. And, and I will admit in Canada, we look Dude, at I love our chat. <laughs> growth with some envy, uh, and we do ask ourselves, I mean, what can we learn from the U.S. experience? We, we are concerned about productivity growth in our country. Don't to listen to the chat if you're from Canada right now. I love you. Systems, but the structure of our, our banking systems is quite different. In the United States, you've got a lot more banks than we do in Canada. Uh, Gretzky, in Canada, Crosby. We, we have um, uh, five lar large uh, national banks and a number it's of... Probably Canadians banks. making the jokes themselves. The structure of our mortgage market is also somewhat different. In Canada... <laughs> Bobo is? is <laughs> right on, Bobo. Uh, in the U.S. It's probably you guys making your own jokes right now. Of 30 years. And our banks in Canada tend to hold mortgages on their balance sheets. Uh, U.S. banks securitize a lot of their mortgages. Despite these differences, our systems are very integrated, uh, and indeed, um, goddamn right, banks have large operations here in the United States. Our pandemic responses were all—it's hockey night here at the uh, Canadian Bank. And uh, differences. We expect a fight to break out at some point. The the paths of our two economies were pretty similar. Um, <laughs> We we both cut interest rates uh, very. Yeah, Minnesota close enough. Effectively hey. zero to support the economy through the pandemic. Uh, then we both raised them very forcefully. Dude, as a John Candy baby. And we've both seen inflation come a long way back. Hitman heart. Growth has been more resilient in the United States, though, through this this tightening cycle, and I think that's <laughs> partly related to the stronger productivity growth I mentioned in the United States, and it may also be re related to the fact that monetary policy may be having a bigger impact on households in Canada because of the different structure of our mortgage market. More of our mortgages have reset in Canada, so more people are feeling those higher interest rates. I should have started making that, some Putin in the office this morning, some Putin. Spending Putin. In Canada. Putin. Putin if you're from you know, Quebec, in right? Countries, I do want to underline that you know, we're, we gear our policy decisions to our domestic monetary policy mandates. And in Canada, we have our own currency. We have a flexible exchange. By the way, Montreal girls are hot as hell. Uh, our own monetary policy. So uh, simply put, you know, we, we don't have to do what the Fed does. We can uh, do what Canada needs. I do think, though, we're looking at the same things and asking ourselves the same questions. Yeah, uh, I think we, you know, we both need to feel confident that we're clearly back on a path to 2% uh, before uh, mm -hmm. it would be appropriate to reduce <laughs> interest rates. Rural last North week, America? We held our policy rate at 5%, where it's been since last summer. We did stress that we are Poutine, that's what it's Poutine. progress uh, we've seen on inflation, and we want to see it sustained. And just this morning, statistics. They said data Canadian. The March CPI. They said data Montreal, girl. they're hot as hell, man. Headline inflation. They all are. They're all good. Even the guys are hot up there. We have seen gas prices in <laughs> move up. Yeah, they're, they're all good looking uh, people up in Montreal, Quebec. Core inflation did tick down again, and that does suggest that underlying inflationary pressures are continuing to ease. So. Uh, we continue to be moving in the right direction. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to underline is that in the conduct of monetary policy, we do spend a lot of time looking and understanding what is going on in the United States. U.S. economy has a very big impact on the Canadian. So Momo, Momo's from Canada. Momo, we're going to rely upon your commentary right now. If you're a Canadian, say I'm Canadian, I'm going to do the commentary in the chat. Because the more we understand what we have in common and our differences, the better we can learn from each other's experience. <clears throat> Until they break it, Christopher. Maxim uh, says the downtick in core inflation suggests US pressure's is, easing, and, Randy, and we you, continue you to move in the right the, direction the on inflation. Uh, I, I would totally Brian. I think the, the economic relationship really is the model for mutually beneficial open trade and investment. 77% uh, of Canadian exports flow to the United States. Uh, and as you underlined, what, what less people know is that Canada is the United States' biggest export market. That's right. 17% uh, or as you said, almost 20% of U.S. goods. Our closest uh, partner. Head north. Closer than England. Canada. If you look at foreign direct investment, there is a similar two-way dynamic. Uh, in 2022, more than half of 
Canadian FDI went to the United States by. by We're very close with England, but our closest partner in the world is uh, share of our Canada. FDI. That was uh, roughly 43. And that's across dollars. the board. Uh, in the same year. That's militarily. That's uh, uh, trade. Doesn't matter. It's a pretty balanced relationship, and I think with these these numbers un yep. underlined, it's just how close that economic. Do you want to stay up to date with the and latest and be on the bleeding edge of news for non-farm payrolls? And then the final thing I'll say is, when you look forward, we face many of the same years structural worth challenges. Service, our labor the forces are aging. Uh, there's going to be a big challenge with new technology, training, uh, and making sure we have the skill, skilled workers our economies need. Uh, climate change is affecting both, of our, both our economies. We're both grappling with shifting trade and investment patterns globally. Uh, supply chains uh, across both our countries need to build more resilience. Conflicts internationally are increasing global uncertainty. And for all these reasons, uh, I am very glad we're having this discussion. We do have much in common. And Randy, as you underlined, when we work together, we can get a lot more done. Thank you. Well, thanks. That's a great place to start. Chairman Powell, really interested in hearing your perspective. Another place to start is to say, why don't you call me Jay and call <laughs> Tiff. Okay, Tiff. I know I do it behind the scenes. I'll do it in front okay. of the scenes, too. Great. Oh. Start by uh, thanking Randy and Bill and Xavi and Tiff for this. It's great to be here today. Um, I want to echo what Randy said about the mutually beneficial, respectful, great relationship we have with Canada, economically, culturally, uh, and uh, I'd also like to echo, uh, I thought Tiff did a great job talking about the similarities and differences uh, in our economy, our financial markets, the challenges we face in our policy stance. It's almost as though you somehow had a copy of that part of my remarks, Tiff. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat. Jerome's hitting the fucking strip clubs up on Club Super Sex in Montreal right now. The U.S. economy and, and where we find ourselves right now. So as, as uh, I think Randy pointed out the performance of the U.S. economy over the past year has really been quite strong. Um, we had growth of more than 3% uh, last year as rebounding supply supported both robust growth and in spending and also uh, employment alongside a considerable decline in inflation. The more recent data show solid growth and continued strength in the labor market, but also a lack of further progress so far this year on returning to our 2% inflation goal. So I'll say a little bit about uh, our two mandate goals, maximum employment and price stability. Uh, as I mentioned, the labor market remains very strong. Payroll job gains have been strong over the first quarter, averaging just a tick above 275,000 per month. The unemployment rate has been below 4% for 26 consecutive months, which hasn't happened uh, in more than a half a century, uh, the longest streak of its kind. Strong man demand for workers has been met by a substantial increase in the workforce due both to rising labor force participation and a substantial increase in immigration, as indeed Canada has experienced as well. So even, by with, even with this strength, uh, by many measures, our labor market has been moving into better balance over the past year. Uh, the ratio of job openings to unemployed workers was extremely elevated in 2021 and 22, has now moved back down to levels just above the pre-pandemic era. Surveys of workers and businesses indicate a normalizing labor market. So do the rates of both quits and hires. Uh, and uh, broader wage pressures also continue to moderate, albeit gradually. So Adding 507C as well right now? But gradual normalization. Turning to price stability. Uh, our inflation mandate. Inflation, of course, declined quite significantly over the second half of last year, over the whole year, but particularly in the second half. But 12-month core PCE inflation, which is uh, one of the most important things we, we look at, is estimated to have been little changed in March over February at 2.8 percent, and the three- and six-month measures of inflation are actually above that level. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2 percent, before it would be appropriate to ease policy. You know, we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings that we had in the second half of last year. Uh, the recent data uh, have clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve good. that confidence. Bad right now in the inter, 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 interday, but good. Risks that we face. 
If, if higher inflation does persist, we can maintain the current level of restriction for as long as needed. At the same time, we have significant space to ease should the labor market unexpectedly weaken. Right now, given the strength of the labor market and progress on inflation. So, so you hear what they're saying right now? If the labor market begins to uh, crank, they will ease. Outlook guide us. Come what may, we remain strongly committed to returning inflation over time sustainably to 2%. Well, thank you. I think that's a, a really important frame for our discussion today. Um, one of the things that I remarked on when I first got into public life was how often I saw my So just for a moment here, you're seeing some weakness in the market on the intraday, but it's actually positive for the market. You're looking for, I'm long here, by the way. I'm long as fuck. I'm like adding right now. And I think it would be quite- I'm in calls right now. I just added my last batch right now. You know, how collaboration- This is not bearish. Internationally, how- Central banks work you together. bearish is rate cuts. So you have to understand that. Ask you to that I know you don't understand. I know you think that rate cuts are bullish. They're not. From uh, from your vantage point. Sure. So um, to we are pricing in the possibility of rate cuts. So uh, Tiff and I attend uh, two G7. If we, cut, I'm going to show. We're going to. We're going to. After this speech, we're going to segue into that today, so that you can see what I'm talking about it and like the facts in the United States. But we attend. The meetings with the finance ministers, which which Bill was, and also two G20 meetings. So that's two. That's four meetings per year, right there. We also have six meetings uh, at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. One of those is now virtual, but we're in, in and that's only central bankers, no finance ministries. So it's all central banking uh, stuff, and you know, it's it's economics, it's financial regulation, all those things. We also come here to Washington, or every third year we go someplace else, twice a year for the IMF World Bank meetings, which is kind of what everybody's doing in Washington right now. So it's a lot of meetings. What do we do at these meetings? Um, <laughs> fair question. <laughs> Essentially, uh, Strippers. central bankers are, are having an ongoing conversation about what's going on in their own economies and their own financial markets, their own regulatory world with each other. And we're also talking about the big global issues of the day, as you would expect. So. Uh, some of which are really the business of the elected government, not the business of the central bankers. But we, you know, we, we had that discussion. It's more or less ongoing. We're seeing each other all the time. Uh, they're very informative, these discussions, and they, they, they really are, for me anyway, part of the way that, that I get to thinking about what the right policy is for the United States, is to hear uh, what is going on around the world, what, what, what's happening globally, and how are people thinking about that. So it's it's very, very uh, useful, particularly, though, given our close cultural, financial, and economic ties with Canada. Those discussions are especially fruitful and important. And, you know, I have regular conversations with Tiff. By the way, I do keep very close track of, of the actions of the Bank of Canada. I read Tiff's press conference transcripts carefully and uh, pay, pay close attention to that. That's a note to the ECB this morning, too. And differences. Um, I'll say one more thing, which is we, we go to Basel, as I mentioned, five times a year. You're a long way from home, and there usually is, we're there for four or five nights, and they're usually one or two nights off. So we go looking for someone to have dinner Strippers. with. Very frequently we wind up with the Bank of Canada delegation for <laughs> who drinking really beer, and Molson drink ice, and, and a lot hookers. Together. So we have a very close relationship with the bank and great respect for that institution, as I'll, I'll have a little more to say about Lately, one, one other thing I'll point out, though, uh, <laughs> about our relationship is we did do, as Randy pointed out, our first monetary policy, first review of our monetary policy framework really ever. And we looked around. The Bank of Canada also does regularly. I think it's every four years. In any case, uh, we, we really looked to the Canadian model and other models of how to do that. We talked to people at the Bank of Canada about how their regular framework review went. So we, we really benefited for that. Um, so that's what I'll stop there. <clears throat> and Tiff, similar perspective from Canada? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I'll just add a little bit on, on uh, you know, as Jay outlined, uh, certainly from my perspective, one of the best parts about this job is uh, we do, you know, the, inter the international community, the central banking community, it, it's not like a commercial bank where you're competing against your, the other bank. We're all in this together. And if we get it right, it, we all help each other. Uh, so th there, is, there is a considerable openness. And you know, as Jay outlined, I think there, there's, a few, there's a few different functions. Yes, we, obviously if you're in Canada, you know, we have our own 
group at the Bank of Canada that, that analyzes the U.S. economy, forecasts the U.S. economy. It's very important to Canada. But, uh, you know, the Fed's group is a lot bigger. They got a lot more experience. Uh, hearing what the Fed has to say is incredibly valuable for us. The other thing we do, though, is it, it's, it's more than just the data and the forecasting. It's, it's thinking through the scenarios together. You know, what risks are on your mind, Jay? Uh, what do you think could go wrong? What are the scenarios? How, you know, how would we handle it if, if this happened, if that happened? Being able to put your heads together and think through the risks, the scenarios, the strategy. Um, there are also a number of really, I would say, sort of behind the scenes, very central banky technical issues that you know nobody really thinks about except central bankers. But you know, what are the mechanics of QE? How do you exit from QT? How many settlement balances are we going to need to? This is good to hear right now. This is a good good explanation about, right now. About, they are critically important for the implementation of of monetary policy. Uh, and that sort of plumbing working of the financial system and, you know, being able to talk to people who are thinking about these things as much as you are is hugely valuable. And then the last thing I will say is, you know, there's some things um, that we're only going to succeed if we do together. The obvious one would be financial supervision and regulation. You know, our, our financial systems globally are highly integrated. We were... Uh, deeply reminded of this in the global financial crisis. Uh, what happens in other countries affects all of us. Um, and money flows, money flows across borders. So, you know, we, we have to do that together uh, or it's not gonna work. Well, maybe we could drill into that for a minute. Uh, you know, obviously we recognize that most of your work is focused on the domestic markets, but uh, in times of crisis, there's real challenge, as you mentioned in the COVID period, uh, the global financial crisis, uh, you know, that uh, you were engaged with TIFF earlier in a different stage of your career. And for me, it was remarkable the number of, of interactions with counterparts around the world during those crises. So maybe a question to both of you is, you know, what, what kind of interaction happens during periods of crisis? Uh, what doesn't happen? It, are there things that we should be thinking about differently in order to prepare ourselves for those, for those challenging moments and making sure that the financial system is resilient? So, Again, maybe over to you, uh, Jay, to uh, react to that and, and uh, hear your thoughts. Sure. So, um, you know, our economies, our financial markets, all of our institutions are, are deeply intertwined. And when, you, when there is uh, a situation where there's serious stress, you need to get a global perspective. You need to get perspective around the world. And you, need, you have to do that very quickly. And, and we, of course, can move effect, uh, quickly and effectively on the domestic front. But... What the, the thing that you, you figure out in those times is that all the time you spent at Basel and at the G7 and G20 meetings, you know your colleagues, you, you know and trust and respect their judgment, and you don't have to go through that, that phase of gaining trust in people. You, under, you understand each other, you speak the same language, so there's a lot of communication. The level of communication is pretty high anyway, but during crises, it goes, it goes very high. You're constantly talking to, I'm constantly talking to, um, other central bankers around the world, and also political leaders uh, in, in our government, and that sort of thing. So that that happens a lot. Um, uh, the sense of what you're doing again is mostly sharing information and ideas about what to do. There may be a proposal that that people are looking at, and you're talking about that. So it's 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 very useful. Um, I say uh, one thing to point out is it's less about coordination than it is about about talking and understanding it, it, for one reason, or at least it was during the pandemic. And that was because almost every country's interest rates were very close to zero when the pandemic hit. And so there wasn't space. There wasn't. I'm on calls, man. I've been buying calls like a motherfucker. So banks to do a I'm going to explain to you why here in a little bit. It's a great cut speech here to discuss this stuff because we're going to discuss it earlier today. Almost this is a good time to discuss why. It's funny too. Policy. Funnily enough, financial juice um, is calling it and bearish, it's, and it's not. A lot of communication and and those those relationships that you built up really do uh, help at that point. Um, in terms of what we've, you asked about learning. What have we learned? You know, I I think that the pandemic's going to. That's right. The USA always goes first. Absolutely, Prague. It's too early to say what they are with confidence, and and I'll point out. Look at the, the pandemic has surprised us over and over again most you got it Prague, the united states 
the remarkably strong performance of the economy at a time when as a matter of fact when Lagarde came out this morning and said they were going to start to cut rates so I think they backed all those comments up yeah. later later this morning you get a very different because the ECB I think if they're going to cut that implies the US is going to cut before them right just, it is a unique uh, set of circumstances and we're still learning I think but we, we will try to learn those lessons different point I would say about the bank stresses another crisis uh, at least here in the states I do think we we can and have learned the lessons of the stress of, of early, early last spring. And um, I would point to a couple things that we embraced pretty forthrightly. One was that supervision was not tightly focused on the right things, was not- We're gonna, I, I'm running down notes so that we can discuss this stuff as soon as the uh, speech is over. I also think- It's, it's timely to have this discussion again. We only have this discussion once a month or so. Probably new viewers that need to see this in real time or what this actually means, simply. And from a Canadian perspective, similar lessons or different ones? Yes, I think there are similar lessons. Maybe I'll just give a couple of other examples. I'll just, first though, I will just underline, you know, when, when a crisis hits, you're, you're, you're faced with a situation, you have to make decisions, and you have very limited information. The other reality is you have a pretty narrow window to act to be really effective. And for both those reasons, you know, being able to speak you know, directly to Jay, uh, to connect with our other colleagues, finding out what's happening in their jurisdiction, how are they thinking about it, what do they see as the options, it is hugely important in a crisis. Uh, and that it's a little more though than just information sharing. I mean, I think it helps us un avoid um, unintended consequences of our actions. Sometimes you do something and it works for most parties, but not one party and in a crisis, you know, it's the weakest link that can take- Thanks trade not for posting that, I appreciate it, brother. Uh, it also, I think, boosts confidence in the system. Thank you very much trade not for posting that. You know, in a way that is coherent together, it boosts confidence. It, it, you know, it, it looks more like a plan than, than a haphazard policy response. Um, just to give you a couple of examples. Winky. Um, you know, at the, I wasn't actually governor at the start of, of COVID. Jay was there. But certainly looking at it from the outside, the coordinated actions of, of major central banks to, um, to reopen fixed income. We did get our first test down here. This was good to see market making of last resort in scale. Uh, Do we get 500 would be the question. We started reopen core functioning markets. Uh, and by all doing it essentially at the same time and all working in scale, the whole global market restarted. If that had not happened, this crisis would have been a Hell yeah, get on up there. and more severe crisis. They're pounding on and these sellers the right now. The highlight is, is uh, coping with the inflation as we came out of COVID. Uh, you know, by, you know, by all uh, being resolute in our commitment to restoring price stability by all matching our words with forceful action, raising rates rapidly. We did, we, we all helped each other. I mean, it, it helped reduce global inflation in goods, which was really the first part of the, the inflation surge. Uh, and it helped k keep inflation expectations in all our countries <laughs> anchored. And I think it, it is a key ingredient in how we have all managed to get inflation down uh, a long way back with, without causing recessions in our economies. And the last point I'll just highlight is something you said. Um, occasionally this, this uh, coordination is very explicit. So for example, at the time of the global financial crisis, there was a coordinated G7 interest rate cut. I remember clearly because it happened at three o'clock in the morning in Canada, uh, which was a little bit of a technical challenge. Um, you know, but most of the time, it's not explicit coordination, but it is those conversations. It is that shared information. We have similar objectives, similar goals, similar tools, and we're sharing information, and that leads to a coordinated response. Well, maybe you could... No, you wear labels that nobody knows of. The Canada, U.S. You wear simple clothes. I'm, I'm absolutely Captain TJ, 88. Uh, the idea that when you're in Canada, you're living next to an elephant. And uh, I think a lot of Canadians would assume that, uh, that Canadian policy has to take into account U.S. policy. So maybe could you give us a perspective on how important that is for, uh, for your deliberations and uh, you know, how that factors into decision making, the U.S. approach? Uh, well, look. Tell it to get up there. I think it, it's pretty clear. <laughs> 
It's going to go up there as soon as they're done because we're going to chat about it. The ball's going to kick off the market. It's not synonymous, and we're going to rip. So integrated, you know, 35% of our GDP is exports. And, so and we're going to go over why we're going to rip. So multiple, you know, that, that's a big chunk of our GDP. Um, our financial markets are also very integrated. In fact, yesterday I was in, in New York, uh, and, and when you go to New York, you are just reminded how integrated our markets are. I, I was at the uh, New York Stock Exchange, and uh, you know, uh, just a warning to you: there's gas and uh, oil data coming out tomorrow. On, on many of the, uh, the U.S. wants to ensure affordable gasoline. White House senior advisor Podesta said about potential SPR oil releases. Large banks have uh, operations in the United States. Our pension funds are big investors uh, in the United States. Um, so we do spend a lot of time understanding what's going on, trying to understand what's going on in the United States. I want to warn you that hourly trigger is turning up right now, okay? Turning up. Some differences. We've got the 500 low right here, and we can see the hourly turn right now. Big manufacturing sectors, big service sectors, uh, large. So even if we come down here and bounce, it's ripping. We're going up. Uh, than it is turning up right now just so, heads up yes, agriculture forestry mining um, <clears throat> fishing 40% uh, of our exports 13% of our GDP and the commodity cycle can be quite different and um, even if they're even if the market's still roll in a corrective environment uh, the we are going to have a pull uh, if you're a bear you're going to get a pullback I think it's an important reason why at minimum you're getting a pullback if you're a bear Seat, just like bulls get pullbacks, you're getting one. It's right. coming your way. It's it's close. Quite similar, and certainly through COVID, we had a similar. Trust me. Been a pretty similar Please trust me. Our monetary policy has been quite similar. There have been other episodes, though, where particularly if the bears are about to get a pullback, I promise you. Policy diverge somewhat from the United States. There are limits to how far it can d diverge, but. As I emphasized, um, we we have our own currency. We have. If you were a, if we were bullish right now, I would be telling a bull. We're rolling down for a pullback. Policy to what we need to do in Canada. I know it's hard to. And Jay, from your perspective, obviously the U.S. has an outsized role in in the global economy, and I guess we'd be interested in understanding how much time do you deliberate on what your actions will have uh, as reactions. You need to turn the charts upside down. You know what's happening with global markets. To the bulls. We need like two broadcasts. So I'll just I'll start by saying. <coughs> we need like a broadcast for bulls. Bro, I'm like, yeah, dude, buy the dip right there. In the case of Fed is using. Sell the rip right there, bull. Maximum employment and price stability for the benefit of of the people we serve. So it's a domestic mandate. But so they feel at least feel better. We fully now label all your puts as calls and all your calls as puts. Can have significant effects on not just on Canada, but on, or Mexico, but on countries around the world. Uh, and that's all the more- 100% so Bork. Is the reserve, the principal reserve- No, dude, you guys, oh, uh, God. Uh, 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 global economy. I'm not so bearish here. We also know that, <clears throat> that those effects, that effects on global demand- On an intraday basis, we are rolling uh, up to the upside. Policy changes can have <laughs> an effect on the United States as well, that can, can rebound- Oh, God. So we're very, very aware- <laughs> I gotta just shut up. Of all of that. And for one thing, we try, we try <laughs> That's to be true too. transparent and predictable. Given, <laughs> Secretly, I am. <laughs> given the events, I mean, you I'm a fucking bull. Times, but <laughs> I'm a buyer, baby. A special obligation to be predictable <laughs> and transparent. And that, that benefits us in doing Leave no work. dip behind. So international <laughs> spillovers, of course, are an important consideration. We didn't track that. <laughs> I'm a fucking bull. Though, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, time, 100%. The most that's what I am in life, optimist. Do for, to support the global <laughs> economy is to deliver on our mandate of price stability and maximum employment. It served me well in life. And, and is that, you know, have there been changes? <laughs> no, no dips untouched. Uh, that have drived any differences? When you talk Songs go up, baby. The different drivers. You guys want some bear music? This go around. Okay, hold on. I'll get, I got some bear music for you. Inflation. So do you, do you think about it differently? I'll play it really lightly in the background. Yeah, I, well, specific, specifically on inflation, I do think this is different. This is not simply the more standard case of overheated demand, which has been the typical thing in the post-war era for, for the U.S. economy and other major Western economies. Um, there are similarities and differences, and I, I would characterize it that, this way, that the, the, the inflation that arose suddenly really in, in the early part of 2000. Should I play it? as economies reopened, resulted both from constrained supply and also elevated and rechanneled demand from services. I'll play some heavy metal for bears. 
so if you remember, and you, I'm sure will, there were unexpected widespread shortages and supply sh chain failures on a scale not seen in, in recent memory. In the U.S., several million people had left the, la the labor force, creating a severe labor shortage that was more fully felt once the economy reopened, leading to a, a huge spike in, in wages, and, but also in uh, the ratio of job openings. I got those, some bear music coming up here in so, just a moment. Here we go. Very unusual situation. Households had elevated levels of savings, and demand was very, very strong as well. So we thought, it, this, what's different is, we thought, have thought since since we've understood the situation, that restoring price stability would, would require. Oh, we'll wait until we'll wait until he's done. Of the pandemic-related distortions to both supply and demand, as well as the effects of tight monetary policy on demand, which would give the supply side time and space to recover. And we think today that we're seeing those two things working together to, to bring that end about. Um, He's got a pink tie on. He's got pink and blue. Which was really, uh, in a large way, a supply side story. Uh, what happened was um, the supply side really recovered in 2023. We thought that it would recover in 2021. And in 2022, I was beginning to lose hope. And then in 2023, you saw the shortages and, and the uh, issues with uh, with with the trade pipelines not fully resolved but largely resolved you saw the lab u.s labor force shortage alleviated by both higher participation among people who uh, had dropped out of the workforce but also for, from immigration so that was the year of the supply side recovery and you saw the the core inflation rates drop by two full percentage points in the face of very strong growth so that can only be explained by the enormous increase in potential output the supply side increase over that year. Um, so that, that's how I would say it's different this time. And, and Tiff, maybe you can tell us how it's different in other ways in Canada. So we, you know, we're talking about the similarities and the similar approaches to dealing with inflation and the, you know, the positive results. But we've seen a divergence in Canada with respect to growth. So clearly there's some, some differences too. Maybe can you reflect for for people, what those what those differences look like, and what the what the ramifications are for you. Yeah, I will focus on the differences. Although I, I will stress, I would, I think the, the main story is the similarities. Um, and as Jay is Mike DeSepoli out there watching right now, Mike DeSepoli, if you're watching, can you say something in the chat? Say this, it's me. A much bigger role than than we're used to, um, and from a monetary policy perspective. We don't have as good line of sight to so supply. Where there he is, hold on. And we don't have any tools to influence supply. Our tools work on demand. Um, in terms of what what has been different, uh, if, if you look at the Canadian economy, growth uh, was essentially zero in the second half of last year, and. What that meant was the economy, which was very overheated, uh, supply caught up with demand. In fact, it more than caught up with demand. The economy moved into excess supply. And we're now seeing the effects of that in terms of relieving price pressure. So, you know, why did demand slow more in Canada and the United States? I think uh, that that is a difficult question. I, I pointed to a couple of things in my opening. <laughs> if I owe money. Productivity growth in the United States. Mike, Mike the Sepley, I just moderated you. You're a moderator here now. Been able to grow more with less inflation, uh, or less inflationary pressure. Mike, uh, uh, you are now a moderator on our show, man. I appreciate you being here right now. Canada because the the structure of our mortgage markets, half of mortgages have renewed in Canada, uh, and hell yeah, man, hasn't renewed. Don't press any buttons. Renewing in the next couple of years, probably. So you're thinking ahead, thinking, oh, when it <laughs> renews, I'm. If anybody gets out of line. Uh, Start on my mortgage three-day timeouts. Saving more money now, so we're seeing the, the, that effect. We've had weaker consumption growth, um, and certainly that's been somewhat masked. By He's a student of Bob Kendall's. But if you look on a per capita, uh, longtime follower of Bob Kendall's, not follower. He knew Bob Kendall years ago. Family has actually gone down. So I'm going to trust anything this guy says. Uh, has not been negative overall. I think you know moving forward. <laughs> Uh, Beer Town Sheriff. Actually seeing growth starting to pick up. Uh, the first quarter of this year looks pretty strong. Um, we'll probably see some choppiness quarter to quarter. He's not a follower. He's an actual participant. Or he's a, first quarter I shouldn't say part of somebody else, but uh, he's a guy to know. His growth is going to be averaging about 2 You want to know who he is this year. in real life. That's partly where we expect to see. We're starting to see some uh, pickup in consumption. You can follow him on Twitter, too. Hold on here. 
partly it is the resilience of the U.S. economy that is supporting our, our exports. They've been very resilient. Um, and then coming back to inflation, I think those, broadly speaking, the path of inflation has, is pretty similar. But you are seeing, um, I think, some of those differences in the uh, dynamics of the real economy in inflation. You know, our last few inflation readings have been reasonably good, um, even though totals still close to three. Uh, core has been, you know, the last few times ticking down. And if you look at the more timely three months measures of core inflation, there, there is some downward momentum in, uh, in underlying inflation. And I think that reflects the fact the economy is in excess supply and that is relieving those price pressures. We're certainly looking for uh, evidence that, that that's going to be sustained. That's what we're looking for right now. Well, I, I know that uh, that both of you realize that one of the key things we were trying to emphasize today was the importance of the, the Canada-U.S. relationship. And uh, I also really appreciate all of the comments on the importance of trade to our to both of our economies, trade between our, our two countries, and, and foreign direct investment. And so um, while you're not trade policy experts, and I get that your organizations, that's not the focus, I really appreciate you giving us a little sense of, you know, how do you think about uh, trade in, in, in economic terms and the importance of that and um, how that factors into your, your economic outlook. And specifically, we're, we're thinking about the importance of the, uh, the agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico and wondering how you think about that in terms of its impacts on, on trade in general, on labor markets, on supply. Um, so maybe I could I could ask you. I just follow, I just posted uh, Mike's handle on Twitter and or Twitch and YouTube. Follow, make sure you follow him on uh, Twitter, please. Start by saying we don't do trade policy. We don't really comment on trade policy, other than to say that uh, it's clear that we have a mutually beneficial, large, substantial on. Yeah, market breath is ready to rock, dude. Trade related. Hundred percent oversold, bounce by time. Welcome. Maybe I'll add one more thing, which is I want to focus on a particular export of uh, of uh, Canada that I think somehow we, we just desperately need here in the United States and we can't get enough of it. I got you, brother. Um, Canadian com comedians and comic actors. <laughs> I started to count uh, the number of really great, funny people. And I, I, I limited myself to 10. So Jim Carrey, Martin Short, John Candy, Mike Myers, Norm MacDonald, Rick Moranis, Stan Aykroyd, Catherine O'Hara, and Andrea Martin. And I could go on. So something's going on up there. Americans love Canadian. If that's Canadian humor, we absolutely love it. So send, send more. We can't get enough of it. That's a small but important part of our trading relationship, I guess. <laughs> Tiff, all jokes aside, yeah. any, any comments from your perspective? Yeah, well, first of all, as, as Jay underlined, we don't set trade policy. But, but let me just say... Um, <laughs> the market launches on... <laughs> give you more of a picture. Bullish Canadian comedies. Our two countries. <laughs> the east-west border is the longest border in the world. And it's a long way across Canada. So it often makes a lot more sense to trade north-south than to trade across the country. And that that's really, you know, it comes down to geography in some sense. I mean, that's fundamental to the inner ties we have across our, uh, our countries. Many Canadians are closer to fellow Americans than they are to fellow Canadians. So if you're just joining us, we're going to, after this conversation, we're going to take a look at what really matters to the market when it comes to rates, some of the biggest unemployment, inflation. In Canada, we buy a lot of your consumer goods. In the United How they coincide with uh, the inverted very, yield curve, if you really want to look at it. Relationship on motor vehicles. Uh, you buy a lot of the motor vehicles we produce. We buy a lot of cars and trucks that you produce. Uh, similarly, energy. Um, we're both energy producers. Uh, it often makes more sense. Yeah, follow Mike Talks Money on Twitter. He is a lo he's not a long he's not a follower of Bob Kennels, but he, he knew him back in the day. You look forward. I trust anybody that uh, traded or was around Mike or Bob Kendall at any point. Uh, I expect that relationship is only going to grow. Another element that is growing quickly. Those guys are real deal, man. Uh, James Baker, any of those guys are real deal guys, real market participants. Is, is trade and services. Now, if you want a haircut, you still have to do it in your own country, unless you want to go to New York to get a really fancy one. But, uh, um, you know, by, but, but increasingly, a lot of services are highly tradable. The internet has completely changed how many things are delivered. Uh, and so you're seeing uh, Canadians are increasingly uh, importing a lot of commercial services from the United States. And then the final thing I'll say is um, 
on U.S. MCA. Um, obviously, for both countries, um, the market access is is key. The other thing I would underline, though, it's also the certainty about the market access. The certainty that American companies have that they'll have access to Canadian markets and Canadians will have access to American markets. That allows businesses... What the Foz? I'll look him up right now, Mike. Deploy their risk What the Foz? I got, is it FOZ? Future. I'll look him up right now. It, it's, that, it's that certainty of access that is really key to building, you know, building investment. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to, uh, to thank both of you for taking some time with all of us. I think if we had looked back a, a couple of years ago and, and <clears throat> reflected on what we were thinking back then might be the trajectory of our economies, uh, we probably wouldn't have had an expectation that we would have been where we are today. We would have expected more challenges than we've, we've faced. And I think we need to recognize that the stewardship that uh, the Federal Reserve in the Oh, I thought you meant what the FOS is in demand. What the FOS is a locked account. Has, um, ...been responsible for has made an... Posts are protected. ...in citizens' lives. I mean, we're in a situation that uh, is virtually our best-case scenario. So it's... Uh, I got you, I got you, Mike. ...that on stage you're recognized for, for that... Yeah, I figured that out afterwards. I went back and read the chat. The chat. You ...for all that you're doing for uh, all of us in making that the reality. And also, I want to thank you for taking some time here. I mean, we are, we are uh, reflecting on the fact that in a couple of years, the, um, the U.S.-Mexico-Canadian trade agreement will be looked at again. And we want to reinforce the importance of working together, the importance of collaboration and cooperation, and really great trading relationships. So uh, this is a, uh, an important way for us to start this off, seeing the collegiality between the two of you, knowing how uh, well people work together. We're also going to talk about supply side recovery this, to this afternoon, too. Thank you very much. And uh, I know it's a busy week for you, so we appreciate also taking the time during this busy week. So thank you. From, from the uh, Candidate Institute, I'm going to ask Xavi uh, Delgado to, uh, to close off our session today. Thank you, Bill. That concludes today's program, everybody. Thank you all, everybody in the room and online for joining us today. I also want to give a thanks to our very esteemed panelists and our co-chairs, as well as the Canada Institute Director, Christopher Sands, whose vision we are all lucky enough to execute on here. Folks, we're going to ask that you stay seated while the panelists depart the stage. But just one last time, this has been the launch of the Washington Forum on the Canadian Economy. Thank you all very much for joining us. One last round of applause for our panelists, please. All right, give me a second here, boys and girls. I'm going to get rid of this, and we're going to take a look at something together here. Now, something important for you. Uh, some three, three key things discussed in this. You guys are going to put UNG up as well? Hold on, I'll put UNG up. Someone said put UNG up on the screen. I will right now. In this bottom screen, or I'll have it up for you here in just a second. Uh, now, we're going to talk about... Uh, we're going to talk about, you guys want to do the Widowmaker, huh? You guys are savages. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, it's looking like it wants to gun. Good job on that one. UNG, baby, the Widowmaker trying to trade $15.43 right now. It's just looking for a back test on $14.32. To trade 1531 so i got ung up here for you and we've got major major economic news coming out tomorrow on oil and gas all kinds of all kinds of volatility coming out tomorrow now we're gonna have a discussion here because we were gonna already have this discussion today but we're gonna this is a great interlude <laughs> Widowmaker, <laughs> a.k.a. the Widowmaker. <laughs> okay, so we're going to chat about, uh, a gr this is a great interlude because earlier this morning, <laughs> casino time, <laughs> D-Gaz, baby. <laughs> so the reason we're going to have this conversation is because the reason we're going to have this conversation is multifold. There's 
two conversations. Two. You have the one conversation that's real. That real conversation is, are we going to cut rates or not cut rates? We know something about that. The longer they don't cut rates, the more stable the market, the, the cash market is. Unless we break something. Fundamentally, like, like a bank is panhandling on CNBC. JPM is on CNBC uh, begging for $5 trillion to save it. That's a fact. So listen to that closely again. The real story is the longer we keep rates paused or add, the market is safe unless we fundamentally, not even fundamentally, we mechanically break something in our economy big. You understand that? That's real and that's true. And I'm going to show you in a minute why that's true. If we don't break something, the banks are going to attempt to front run any cuts. Front run selling the market. They will literally put the market on edge in case of a cut. The moment that the banks know that there's no cut coming, they will take the hand off of front running a crash. That is fact. Fucking fact 100% of the time. 90% of the time, unless it's an exogenous event, maybe a war or something. We're squeezing now. Remember that Financial Juice earlier said that was negative. It is wrong. It is not negative. It's positive. The other story about cuts or not cuts is a different story. Now, that story, that second story about cuts or no cuts, is about trading the market intraday, intraweek, intramonth. And they change that story often. You get the, hey, we're getting six, seven rate cuts. Let's rip up fucking IWM in anticipation of that happening. The dot plot is this. The future Fed runs Fed's rate, but future Fed's fund rate is this. It's all bullshit. It's all gambling. That's all that is. It's a function of the market going up and down before the real rate cuts or real rate increases. Okay? Two different things. And you have to be able to see the difference in those two things because they have different impacts on short term and long-term participation in the market, whether you're long and short and those kind of things. And, I, and I'm going to say something else about this. The inverted fucking yield curve only fucking matters when we have broken something in the economy or uh, that would mean that, the, that we're rolling down because of something being broken and the Fed is then cutting rates at the bottom or, or, the Fed is cutting rates because its job is done. Okay? And they will front run that role no matter what. There is a small, and I mean small, I said 100% of the time, it's like 90% of the time. There's a very small time when they do cut rates and we do not see a crash. But that's only if you believe they're only cutting maybe 25 basis points, then they're going to pause then they're going to raise a little bit. Then they're going to pause. And you believe all that shit. And the economy is fucking pumping while that's going on. That's when you get an edge on the inverted yield curve. The rest of the fucking time, the inverted yield curve curve is bullshit used by a somebody trying to push a fucking narrative that has nothing to do with the price of the goddamn stock market. That is a fucking fact. If you were, when you're out there hearing the garbage talk in your ear that the inverted yield curve matters, it does not. It's used as a speaking point to push a narrative. That's it. It's not fucking real. It never has been. It is nothing that you can use to beat the market as a cash market participant. Now, there are things you can use. And there's one other 
caveat to this entire statement. You do, and this is leading into what Jerome just said. You do not want to see velocity in the rate of unemployment going up. And he just addressed that. And you do not want to see the velocity and the inflation rate of inflation slamming down into 2% and rocketing up. Because that would mean that inflation is going to bounce on 2%, go higher, and unemployment should be raging at that point as well. So what does the fucking Fed want? The Fed wants unemployment to go just like this. Ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. They want unemployment to come down slowly and ping pong around 2%. Maybe even get under 2%. Just sideways. You hear me say sometimes, oh, are we up this month in inflation? Next month's going to be down. A tick. Up a tick, down a tick. Up a tick, down a tick. Up a tick, down a tick. The moment that it becomes uh, violent down or violent up or unemployment's violent up, we got a fucking problem regardless if they cut rates. So you have, to just, you have to figure out what all that means. And we're going to look at it right now. So if we go to my screen down below here, uh, I've already set this thing up. I call this chart, I call this chart all the macro you need. I actually have it here. I post it for pro traders. Uh, and this is all you really fucking need. You don't need anything else. This is literally all you need. All the garbage that's spewed out there, you don't need shit. I got SPX up. I got the Fed funds rate, the effective federal funds rate. I've got the unemployment rate. Now I'm going to throw up what? The uh, inflation rate year over year. That like fav Fed's, fu the Fed, the Fed's favorite uh, fucking inflation rate, that three month or one month, it's horseshit. Hasn't meant shit in a long time. Say it again. Hasn't meant shit in a long time. Now, down below, what we'll do down here is we'll do, uh, we'll just do TNX. We'll make it even simpler. TNX, 10-year treasury note yield. I could have just done the 10-year yield, but I'm going to do TNX down below because you got a lot of you cash mark guys, so you like, boom, put that down below. This shit, TNX doesn't mean shit. But I'm going to show you what really matters here. I should just get rid of this TNX because it's garbage. You can, how about this? You do this shit on your own. This doesn't mean anything. I'm going to get rid of it. It doesn't mean shit. It really doesn't. It doesn't mean a goddamn thing. And I really want to highlight something specifically here. I really want to highlight something specifically. If there was one thing that does matter the most, it's more than likely the unemployment rate. That likely matters, of all three of these things, that matters the most. And I'll show you why it matters the most later. But I want to show you the uh, rate cut thing first of all. I want to show you the uh, rate cuts like the federal, uh, Fed funds rate and why it actually matters. And why people really, like why you get these stupid fucking answers. <laughs> you get these stupid answers uh, from people out there that are telling you that Rate cuts are good. No, they're not. When banks try to anticipate rate cuts ahead, they will roll the market down. You actually see more rate cuts here. And what happened in 2019, coincidentally? More rate cuts or more crashing, right? Same thing over here. What do you see here? Flat, right? Pause. Banks trying to anticipate future rate cuts, trying to get ahead of the curve. You see that? Try and get ahead of the curve. Very rarely, very rarely do we get actual rate cuts and we do not roll down. Unless, unless we are slightly cutting, slightly raising, slightly cutting, slightly raising, and you believe it. Do you understand now what I'm saying to you? Do you get the point that I'm trying to make to you about rate cuts? So when we get a real rate cut, it is bad for markets. Very easy to see. 
absolutely easy to see. And who wants to get in front of that? The fucking banks. They don't give a fuck about you. They only care about getting ahead of rate cuts. So when you hear Jerome say, uh, no rate cuts, right? He means it because he knows today where the market is today that if there is a rate cut, if there is a rate cut, right, you're going to get a market crash, okay? You're going to get a market crash. Now, this right here is the unemployment rate, right? What does that mean? Let's take a peek here and see when, when the unemployment rate actually matters. What do you see right here? A ramp, ramp of unemployment rate. See it? Just as unemployment begins to ramp, not after, when it begins to touch bottom and ramp, when it begins to touch bottom and ramp, is the unemployment rate touching bottom and ramping is the question, isn't it? See it? That's the question. So what does Jerome need to do? What does he need to do? Let's look at unemployment. What does he need to do? Now, we know that there's a ramp back here. We know that if we begin to ramp, right, that they're going to begin to cut, or not, begin, not only begin to cut, but you also know that if there's, a, there's a point of unemployment where we cannot return, right? Hold on here. There's a point of no return in unemployment. That's about 4.26 and 5% unemployment. What does Jerome need to happen in unemployment? He needs this. Up, down, 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 up, down. That's what he needs. He does not want to see this, does he? The market right now is poised in case this happens. Jerome Powell just said to you, we are monitoring unemployment closely. We will cut if that happens, because what will happen in the stock market? We'll fucking blast down to the depths of hell, won't we? So we need unemployment. It's at 3.8% right now. It's very dangerous where we are. So unemployment's now at 3.5%. We need that number to come down, don't we? And here's the last part we're going to look at. Times in the market where inflation there's 2%, right? What do we not want to see? What can you tell about this right here? What can you glean from this right here? If unemployment or if inflation slams down into 2%, then slams up, the market crashes. Here's another one. We bounce down. We ramp up in inflation. What happens? The market crashes. You get in the picture here, right? Ramp up, market crashes. Now, we did have a fucked up situation over here, right? We did have a fucked up situation over here, right? 2000, keep cranking. We have rate cuts at the same time, right? So the, we've got uh, modern monetary theory here in 2009. So inflation does matters, but not as much as unemployment, does it? It actually matters, but not like unemployment historically. The three of these combined together is your best measure. If there was a measure that you were going to use, it is not the inverted yield curve. It is a combination of three things. Unemployment, number one. Or number one, I guess in my view, number one would be rate cuts. No, the, 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 um, the trying to predict when we're going to cut rates. Number two would be the rate of unemployment raising. Number three would be inflation. So if you were to have, if you were out there trying to be a macro rocket scientist and you're like, Cap, I don't understand any of this shit, the only three measures that you would truly need would be the Fed funds rate, the unemployment rates year over year, and the uh, year over year inflation, rate of inflation. These three things combined 
outside of exogenous events like COVID, well, actually, even with COVID, um, <laughs> really, truly are what matters in the marketplace. These are the things that actually matter to you. You can make this chart for yourself and monitor these three measures for what really matters in the marketplace. And that's all I'm going to do in just that topic right there right now. So all the macro that you need, if you're like, hey, I'm not a, I'm a smart guy, or this is not my real job, or this is not, I was a humanities guy, or I'm an electrician, you really just need those three measures. You need, the, you need to know if they're cutting rates or if they're, or if they're cutting rates, when and why they're cutting rates. Are they cutting it because they broke some shit? Are they cutting it because uh, we're at the bottom of the fucking, uh, the market's crashed and rolled over and where they're chasing cutting rates? Are they just holding rates? Are they increasing rates? Do you believe that they're, if they, let's say they're going to cut a rate in June. At that moment, do you actually believe that it's only one rate cut? And if it's only one rate cut, you will get a correction. You'll get a small pullback, not a crash though. Uh, but if you don't believe it, you're like, oh shit, they broke some shit. They're, we're going to roll this fucker down and we'll have a crash. And they will chase cutting rates at the bottom of the market. You want to be looking at two other uh, measures, year-over-year -year inflation, not the Fed, Fed's favorite measure of inflation, year-over-year, -year, and year-over-year -year unemployment. Those are your, if you had like a group, that is your best group. You will then find that the inverted yield curve all of a sudden matters during those periods. Okay. So let's go back to the main screen. Am I getting toasted here? Holy shit. I haven't, no, I haven't closed any calls here. <laughs> I'm still on calls. So I want you to understand that about, uh, I want you to understand that about um, the, the, the macro picture out there. It's quite simple. And if you don't understand that, right, you can easily get those three, get those three, uh, those three charts and use them as a comparison to SPX. You bring up an SPX chart, right? And you open in a new window, those three measures. And then I want you to go back in time and see when they mattered and when they did not. And you're going to find about 80, 90% of the time, they matter. And they matter and they, you might have something tied to it, like uh, a war broke out, COVID broke out, whatever they're going to fucking label as the reason. Some, some like exogenous events. Uh, oh, we've got 9-11 uh, happened. Uh, something like that. So if you want like the macro picture, that's what you should be looking at out there. And so when you hear like Jerome on this interview say at this moment, hey, look, uh, we're not cutting rates. And you see like what people are claiming this is doom. This is a one minute chart. This isn't a daily chart. This isn't a weekly chart. None of this matters uh, on a weekly basis or on a daily basis. And if anything were to matter here right now for you in the marketplace on a macro basis, it's only that they're going to, on those two stories of cut rates and not cut rates, is are they actually going to cut rates or not? That's the first story, right? And the Fed is telling you, no, we ain't cutting shit. And we are monitoring unemployment rate right now because we may have to cut if that does happen. If unemployment continues, it just came down. But if it does tick back up and tick back up, yeah, they will be forced to cut rates. He just said it to you. Do you understand that? Hope that you do. The other topic, though, is uh, the other conversation on cut rates or not cut rates is before we get to that point in reality, right? Re reality of are we going to cut rates or not? There's still trading to be done on an on an intermonth, interweek, interday basis. And so when you see like this conversation in the news where they're like flapping their fucking gums, going, "We're getting seven rate cuts uh, January one. Uh, we're getting fucking uh, now four cuts. Uh, now we're not cutting at all this year." You'll see these conversations uh, rise and fall if we are not going to cut rates. And that does matter. 
uh, that does matter on an intraday basis, a weekly basis, and a monthly basis. But is it the reality for the greater picture on a daily and we daily time frame and weekly time frame? Fuck no. Fuck no. No, it doesn't. It has no. It, it's just gambling. It's all it is. Pure gambling. Dot plot. Pure gambling. Fed future Fed's funds rate. Pure gambling. Uh, CNBC, Bloomberg, uh, your favorite Fin Twitter. Pure gambling. Has nothing to do with anything. They're running up IWM. Matter of fact, when they when they tell you that on social media, they're like, hey, we're pricing IWM in a rate cut. Do you think IWM is going to keep going up once they actually do the cut those fucking rates and real? For real? Fuck no. They're going to sell that shit down to the fucking depths of hell. And do you understand what I'm saying here? So there's two different tradable conversations. You have the reality, and then you have... Yeah, we're going. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna buy out of the We're buying small caps on a on a potential rate cut. Woohoo! Let's do it. Is it real? Fuck no, it isn't. It's just the market going up and down, up and down. So you can do this for yourself at home. You can go back and look at all of history. All of history. When Jamie when Jaime Diamond put out his investor note this week. He point blank said it. He's like, remember when those banks, remember when those banks go put, like, he's like, those banks go bankrupt and stuff. We made it through because we're ironclad. You know what he really means? If these motherfuckers are going to cut rates, we're going to front run that shit. That's what he's really saying to you. That's what he's really saying. He's like, anytime that motherfucker actually cuts rates, we're going to sell this fucker down to the depths of hell. That's really what he's saying to you. <laughs> Trading gangster like me, dude. I just got I just got smoked here. <laughs> just got smoked down like two minutes ago. You don't want to you don't want me to adopt you. <laughs> I'm getting wrecked right now. I never get wrecked. I'm getting wrecked by hand. I'm getting my ass handed to me. <laughs> so I want you to understand that stuff. Uh that macro that macro thing. Okay, so you got rate cuts. There's two different stories on rate cuts. Be aware of that. Number two, Jerome Powell is monitoring unemployment, as he should. If unemployment ramps out of control, right, they're going to sell this fucker down to the depths of hell. But this is going to lead into something else for you, an important thing for you today. We also have the uh, 2023 su supply side recovery. Let's talk about that briefly. And I had this lined up for this morning, and I can't believe you even spoke about it. And we're going to go to an article. We're going to go to, uh, I got to meet this guy. I just bought his book, by the way. I just bought this guy's book. And I have, having it delivered, I haven't read it yet. I don't think it's market specific, but uh, I went to a, a guy that uh, keeps popping up my news feed on Google. Uh, the name of this guy is uh, Wolf Street, I guess. Not him, but it's what he does. It's all free, too. The stories behind business, finance, and money. I think this guy is German. His mom was killed or something in an airplane crash, realized his own mortality, and uh, traveled the world, and then uh, now he does something for regular people. You should check out this, uh, this article specifically. And this is a lot of what the stuff that um, Tom Lee recently talked about. Uh, when he talks about inflation numbers aren't what you think they are, and this guy's talking about retail sales. And he says total retail sales jumped up 0.7% seasonally adjusted in March for February after having jumped by an upwardly revised 0.9% uh, uh, from a January red line in the chart below year over year. Retail sales jumped by 4%. Um, top line stuff, right? Uh, retail, uh, not seasonally adjusted, blue line retail sales jumped by 0.10%. Uh, these increases in sales came despite price decreases in many goods that retailers sell, particularly durable goods, mar uh, motor vehicles, electronics, furniture, uh, whatever, blah, 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 on and on and on. <coughs> what he's showing you right now is the resilience of our economy moving higher into 2024. The biggest drivers of growth in retail sales on a year-over-year -year basis were e-commerce, food services. These are important right here. E-commerce food services, drinking places, miscellaneous retailers, including cannabis shops and general merchandise retailers. This is very important to understand. 
Some of the dying brick and mortar retail gr categories, a phenomenon I've called since 2016 uh, brick and mortar meltdown caused by the shift to e commerce, continue to suffer from year over year declines, including department stores, furniture, and home furnishing stores and electronics and appliance stores. Where does this money come from? A record number of people are employed, and these workers have received big pay increases. This is another uh, metric that I really love. It ties in with unemployment, jobs, and wage growth. That outran CPI inflation in 2023 and so far in 2024. Now, this is a key point here because a lot of you out there are going to say, I can't afford shit, Cap. What are you talking about? Cap, what are you? Cap, why are you talking about this? We're all working our asses off. And we are not uh, doing well, Captain. I, I hate you, Captain, for even bringing this up. And, and I'm going to give you the answer to that in just a minute. I'm going to give you the answer to that in just a minute here. You're going you're gonna to be shocked when you see it. On top of it, there's a huge wave of immigrants in 6, 6 million in 2022 and 2023, combined according to the CBO, which we need because we are not making enough babies in this country, whether you like that or not. Estimated populate, uh, growth, estimated, uh, of estimate, estimates of population growth year over year. Cranking, aren't we? Absolutely cranking. The Fed is watching this nervously. Back in December, the Fed's rate cut views, maybe three in 2024, were all prefaced by inflation going back towards its 2% target. But now we've had the third bad inflation report in a row so far this year. And rate cut expectations are getting scaled back or are vanishing. And consumers on a and consumers are on a what? A buying binge. Acting like drunken sailors, as we've come to call them lovingly and facetiously, are adding to inflationary pressures. You might think to yourself, no, they aren't. They ain't buying shit, Cap. They're just getting by. Retail sales by major segments of retailers, right? New and used vehicles, part dealers, 19% of the retail trade starting to roll over a little bit, right? Starting to roll over a little bit, flatten out. E-commerce, though, not flattening out, is it? It's moving higher. Why and who is doing this? Bars and restaurants partying like rock stars right now. So when you hear me tell you, hey, everybody's out there right now, dude. Everywhere I go, they're out there partying. They're at the bars. They're at this place and that place, right? They're all out there partying. Sales of food, services, and drinking places cranking. Why? Because you guys aren't cooking for yourselves anymore. You're ordering HelloFresh. You're ordering delivery food. You're out there partying. You're spending money. Guess what you did during COVID? You bought yourselves what? What did you buy during COVID? You bought yourselves fucking shit at Home Depot. You fucking ordered furniture from fucking online retailers. And now where are you spending your money? You're fucking partying. You're fucking partying at bars. You're partying at restaurants. You're ordering HelloFresh. <clears throat> You're doing all kinds of other stuff. You took your money and you moved it. Food and beverage sales. Kind of flattening out, right? But guess what it says? Hallmark of our drunken sailors. Americans are spending now vastly more money eating and drinking out than at grocery stores. Eagerly, eagerly paying for the experience or the convenience rather than just food. Who knows that? Do you know who knows that? Take a guess. CTAs. How do CTAs know that? Guess who knows that? CTAs. Why? Because CTAs know if you're eating rice and beans at home, or if you're fucking eating steak in restaurants. Rather than just food, they could have a lot of money by eating at home or packing a lunch. But no, our drunken sailors are going for the experience and the convenience. Another sign that they're flush with money and don't mind spending it. This is an astounding phenomenon. Oh, no, we're going to show you right now who's actually spending the money. It is not immigrants. Immigrants are eating at home. That's what they're doing. 
food food services and drinking places are fucking on full on party mode right now. General merchandise stores, right? Without department stores, without department stores, partying. You guys are buying shit on the internet. Gas station sales versus CPI gasoline on its way down, but it's starting to pick up, isn't it? You guys are ready to go on vacation, aren't you? You guys are ready to rock start up out there, aren't you? We've got UNG and we've got gas stuff coming out, right? But what does the president say right now? We've got to be careful of the price of gasoline this summer because people are going to be partying it up this year. What happened when we partied it up? Way back here, the market ripped, didn't it? Fucking ripped. It ripped. The market blasted off, and we are expecting the same. A resilient economy. GDP expectations. Q2, Q3 of 2024 should be booming. Q4 expectations slightly lower than Q2, Q3 GDP forecast, but they're likely wrong and will likely revise higher GDP in Q4 2024. Building materials gone down. Why is that? You guys already renovated all your homes during COVID. Now you're like, oh, my home's renovated. Fuck that. I'm done. Let's party out. Let's party. Let's go to the bu- let's go to the bars. Not this part. Fuck renovating the house. We're done with that. We're gonna go out and party with re- with uh, bars and shit. We're gonna get Hello Fresh. Clothing and accessories. 3.7% of retail sales still pumping. A little bit lower here, but not too bad. Still climbing overall. Miscellaneous stores. This has to do with you still buying shit on the internet. You're still doing it. You're partying. You guys already bought furniture during COVID, so all that money's gone elsewhere, hasn't it? You're partying in the you're partying it up. You already fixed your homes. You already bought new furniture. You ain't buying that shit anymore. Department store sales in the dumpster. But this looks good, doesn't it? I like this here. You see a conversation right now coming out on CNBC, right? You saw GS this morning say what to you? I read it to you this morning at 9.30. I said to you, GS is pumping Walmart. They're pumping Costco and all these other places, right? Because they're looking for a return to the upside. Right? If you were a guy out there, you're a financial advisor, you're like, oh, yeah, man, we bought them down here. We rolled up a little bit, but it looks like we're starting to consolidate. I don't know if that trade is, is good for you. I don't know. I don't, I don't like that trade. I know what you're doing right now. You're partying elsewhere. So there's some guys out there in CMB saying, yeah, expect it to go up. Expect the damage to be done to the economy. By the time we get to 20, the end of 2024, And these people are going to be forced to go shop at Walmart again. Sporting goods going down. You already bought your boats. You don't need any more boats. Now you're just drinking at the bar at the the lake, right? At the Sundowner Bar, that's what you're doing. So you're not buying any more sporting goods, no more hobbies, books, music stores. You ain't doing shit. You already did that shit. You got everything that you need. Electronics and appliances. This actually looks positive. I like this. Three-month average. You guys are just about ready to start buying a bunch of crap. You want to buy new computers. You want to buy some new some new, new shit out there, right? So you guys got money. You guys have a bunch of money out there. Now, here's where the fascinating part comes. You ready for this part? I'm going to make this part big for you. Wait to read this with me. Jim Smith is what you guys are saying in the comments right now, right? What are you guys saying in the comments? I bet the increase in spending on dining and drinking out is by the folks in the top 10 to 20%. Only the rich. I think this group is driving in the inflation, and then the owners of these establishments make more money and they spend. It's all a circular phenomenon amongst the top owners of wealth. Only the wealthy. The bottom 50% are broke, and that's why the Fed is nervous. Ooh, let's see what the response is to that. Wolf Richter comes back and says, you once again completely underestimate the wealth and income of the top 50%, not the top 10 or 20, top 50. 
the bottom 25% of the income spectrum are poor and cannot spend a lot. Not the bottom 80, 90 per, uh, 80 or 90 percent. That's just dumb and clueless bullshit. You people keep coming up with this stuff about the top 10 percent, 20 percent, or whatever, or the top 1 percent, and everyone else is poor and tapped out living paycheck to paycheck, or whatever BS. That's not the case, and we have documented this here time and again. And then you people are surprised by the strong consumer spending. You people who think that most Americans are poor will never understand the U.S. economy. You will always be surprised by it and come up with conspiracy theories to explain it. He goes on to say, all the majority of eating and drinking places are fast food chain places. Normal bars, delis, sandwich shops, cafes, things like that. These places are everywhere, even or in every small town along highways and in big cities, where people drop money. So Wolf Richter is telling you, right, that it's a bullshit scam. He's telling you that not only do, does the top 50% or the 50% the of Americans are making a lot of money, he's saying that wage growth is truly happening. And he's saying only the bottom 25% of people are actually that poor, where they cannot afford to eat out at McDonald's. They cannot afford to eat out at Wendy's. And that is true. Who are those people in that middle income bracket? Who are those people? I just read an article this past week. I just read an article this past week that was pushed as a narrative on the New York Times. And it was a guy that's retired in Colorado. And he owns a home. And he cannot afford he cannot afford to pay his taxes any longer in his home. He's an older guy. He's about to die. He's not quite in hospice, but he's really old. And his son is like, oh, I have to take over the payments for his taxes now. And it's tough. My dad can't afford it anymore. He's like, he doesn't make enough on Social Security every month. He's only eligible for about $1,000 a month. And I was like, oh, you know why? That guy made a lot of money. That's why he's only eligible for $1,000 a month. That guy made great money in his life. Great money. He's not eligible. He's being cycled out of our economy because he's old. Right? He, didn't, he spent his money in a good life. He's got a great house in Colorado, right? So they're cycling him out. But what's the next function in that? This is a part of capitalism. What's the next part of this? He did the right thing. He's older now. He can't afford it. The son then steps in and says, I'm going to assume the taxes. That's called wealth transfer. Transferring wealth from someone that's old to someone that's younger. Now the son is paying the taxes. The dad gets to live the last years of his life in the house. And one day, guess what the benefit of this is? When his dad dies, guess who gets the house? The son. Well, unless his dad really fucking hates him. And that's a part of the process of our economy. That's how it's meant to work. Now, sometimes that doesn't work. We know that that's broken a lot right now. But for this guy and his father, the economy is working. Right now, there is higher taxes. Coming, who talks about this a lot is um, Ray Dalio. When the economy works properly, we, wa we wash people out that take this free money and use it unwisely or fail. Right? They use it unwisely or they fail. We scrub them out. Right? Then we recycle it again, that money, and give it to the younger generations to try again. Looks like that older guy did the right thing. He didn't get washed out with bad things, uh, like bad business decisions, bad investments. He owns a house. He's like 79 or something like that. He owns a house in Colorado. He's been able to own it this entire time. But guess what? At 80, 90, 100 years old, you still have that risk of being washed out. And thankfully, this man has a son to help him live the last of his life out rather than being in a hospice or in a nursing home or in a retirement community. This guy wants to live in his house. The son's going to take over. And guess who gets the windfall? The son gets the windfall. That is wealth transfer. You can watch it for yourself. I'm going to show it to you right now. 
Give me one quick second. I'm going to give it to you right now. I'm going to explain wealth transfer to you simply. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, I'm going to explain it to you simply. I just posted two links for you on YouTube and Twitch. If you are new to our show, I'm going to ask you to this evening watch the, the those videos. Now, personally, Ray Dalio is always fucking wrong in timing shit. He does a wonderful job explaining how debt cycles are intended to work. Now, I know we scam that shit all the time. I know that they're that that I know that I know that the Fed is giving money to prime banks, to loan to hedge funds, to party in the stock market. I know that some companies get away with fraud for a long time, but I assure you, this is how capitalism works. I want you to watch that video tonight, then come back tomorrow and say this is not how it works, because that is how it works. How capitalism works in this country, right, is if you're a young generation, there's free money. You have a group of people that are, are graduating from college, right? They don't want to go work for Microsoft. They're going to start their own little think tank, right? And then free money comes around, and they give it to you. They're like, here's your free money. Here you go. Do whatever you want to do with it. You got guys out there that do the wrong thing. You got guys out there that do the right thing. You got girls and women and whatever that do the right thing and the wrong thing. They's and them's. They're like, hey, uh, we're going to go out there, and we're going to build a, uh, we're going to build a bar for uh, alpacas, and it's going to work. And when it doesn't work, you get washed when they stop giving you free money. Now that's that doesn't hold true for bet or that no longer holds true for corporations. Those those fucking guys take loans whether the rates are high or low. If you're like Apple, if you're uh, any company, any major company is like fuck it, we're gonna take the money until we go bankrupt. That is, has been true since 1978. But for you, Main Street Bob, Main Street Mary, Main Street they or them, you have to go through this. That guy in Colorado has to go through that in his life. I assure you of that. As you go through that in your life, you're given the opportunity to take those loans. You see people today not selling their homes. Do you know why? They have great low rates. They're not going to sell their homes until rates come down. They have no reason to sell their rates home right now. Guess who's selling their homes right now? People with money. People with money can sell their home and buy a new home with cash. If you go to a house showing right now, you, I want you to do something else you can do this weekend. We're in, we're in housing season, right? Why don't you do something cool? You want to you have a cool weekend to see some cool shit? It's not nice. It's not good to see. I want you to find homes that are about $600,000 to $1.5 million. I want you to go out there, find an open house, and I want you to show up to one or two of them. I want you to look and see who's in there buying right now. Who is actually in there buying those homes right now? It'll be fasc a fascinating look into who's actually buying those homes. It'll also be a fascinating look how much money they have to buy those homes. You, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I want you to do it and get back to me on Monday and tell me who it is. I want you to tell me in the chat. I want you to watch that video, that short and long-term debt cycle video, and then I want you to go on those home tours, and I want you to come back on Monday and report back to me and say, Captain, I did my work. Now I understand what you're saying. And I want you to know something else. There are, There is a disparity today at this moment. I do realize 1,000% that there is there's a problem. There is a problem with these short and long-term debt cycles right now with boomers. Do you know how that problem was created? So when you're on Reddit and you say, I fucking just went to college, Captain. I spent $100,000. I shouldn't have to spend that for college. I agree with you. That's broken for young people today, 100%. Broken. Our college education system is broken and needs reformed. That is 
an important part of our short and long-term debt cycles. I am with you on that. What else is a problem for young people today? What's another real true, true problem? Do you know what that is, right? Old people are holding out of their money, aren't they? They're not getting washed out of the system, are they? And that's a major problem. They are, what did they do? What happened to old people that they are able to get more wealthy today? Do you know? The housing crisis in 2007, 2008 tightened, allowing young people to take on risk. It was a function of you and I telling the Senate to tighten the regulations and rules on money, free money for poor people like you and I. That's fact. So what happened after 07 and 08? Do you know? Because they tightened the requirements for you to buy a home in this country, what happened? Do you know? I know. You know how I know? I'll tell you how I know. My dad used to own homes. My dad used to uh, accumulate houses and rent them out to people. He lost every fucking home he owned in 1987 in the crash. Every single one. Do you know why? Because he was like, buy a home, right, with a mortgage. Then he'd fucking mortgage that shit again and buy another home. Then he was floating mortgages, one after another after another. And he got washed. They washed his ass right out of the market. Fucked for life. 2007, 2008. We had an apartment and house, rental housing market crisis leading into it. We were down like 15 to 20 percent uh, unbuilt, uh, uh, or we had like 15, 20 percent. Um, uh, um, we needed like 15, 20 percent more rentals in the market. We didn't have 07, 08. We we exasperated that. Then we had then we had 25 to 30 uh, percent strangulation in housing for rentals, right? We washed all those people out. Guess what happened, though, in this cycle? Guess what fucked up shit happened in this cycle? Because I, I, I was a flipper. I started buying homes. Started buying homes about uh, 10 years ago. Maybe longer. Think about 10 years ago. Guess what happened in this cycle? Because of all that shit back in 2007, 2008, Guess what people were doing back then, 10 years ago? They weren't getting loans to do a flip. They weren't getting homes to buy and rent. They were taking hard cash. Hard cash. Because of the rules from the Senate. And so they can't be washed out of the system anymore, can they? So, so an indirect fault of, it's crazy to say this. An indirect, co- or, or an indirect effect of requiring people to not get free money cheaply without like a, with a signature loan meant that if you were going to buy properties to rent, you either had to come up with your own cash or you had to get hard money loans. And guess what got huge a decade ago? Hard money loans. Wealthy individuals would go into small groups of people that wanted to be a real estate investor. And they said, hey, you know what? You can't get a loan for this. I'll fucking give you the money. You need to have a little bit of skin. How much you got? 30 grand? I'll give you 70. But this is what you have to do. I want you to renovate that home in three months or less. And I'm going to hit you with 10 points. And then I want you to have that fucking house on market and sold within one to three months. Or the VIG goes up. And the guy's like, I don't know if I can do that. And the guy, the higher money guy goes, you do that and I'll shave some points off you the next deal we do. And all these guys that I knew in these groups, guess what they did? They bought a fucking house and they flipped it as fast as they fucking could. Then they made another deal with that hard money guy. And they flipped it again and they got better points. No, no, I'm telling you your first deal. Your deal, go, your, your points go down. This was about a decade ago. Then your points go down to seven, five, three. And before you know it, guess what you're doing? I'm in these groups and these guys are like, I fuck, I'm a flipper, bro. Three to five years later, they all changed their tune. Well, you know what I did? 
I was doing all that flipping, and I made some fucking serious cash. Okay, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to become a buy and holder. Oh, really? This, this was about, uh, this might be longer, 15 years. About like f about 10 years ago, they started saying, I no longer do that. I am a landlord. Oh, really? How'd you do that? I made all this money on these flips. What are you doing now? I'm accumulating. How many you got? Oh, I got three. Those guys today now own 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 properties. What did they do? Guess what they did? They rolled all that cash into properties. Some of them only have five. They bought them with fucking cash. And now that they own these fucking properties, guess what they're doing? They're mortgaging them out. And they got fucking money just pissing around. I got more money, more cash in my hands. So like an indirect consequence of tightening the rules for buying a house has led to a tail risk for younger generations to enter the, uh, this cycle, these cycles. So now you as a young person are getting absolutely fucking fucked. So I realized that that is there. So you have to find a way to wash out these old people. All these old guys that did the right thing that are now becoming 70, 80, and 90. How do you do that? How do you get rid of them? Do you know? I'll tell you. Or I'm not going to tell you. You tell me on Monday. I want you to watch that Ray Dalio show, That's, that episode from Ray Dalio, because he tells you how you get rid of that money. I'll, I'll tell you. You tax the fuck out of them. You tax the fuck out of them. And so when I read that article this past week from the New York Times, I was like, oh, that's, that's working. Good. Oh, that old man, he, doesn't, he can't live in Colorado anymore. He can't pay his taxes. How fuck him. Let's raise property taxes even more. That's what it is. You got to tax them. You got to tax the fuck out of boomers. It's not the right. I mean, boomers are in the stream probably going, oh, God, don't tell them, Cap. <laughs> I'm a boomer. Ray Dalio tells you how to do it. That's how you wash out these people. It's the only way. There's another way to do it, too. You know all these flippers that are buying holders? Do you know how to wash them out? I'll tell you. It's easy. It's an easy way to wash out all these, all these buying holders that did the right thing that the government told them to do. They actually did the right fucking thing, and it's a tail risk to younger generations having a hand in the pot. You know what you do to those guys? You hold them to higher standards. You force them to build quality housing. You force them when they rehab to build to a standard they can't afford to make more than 10% per year. That's how you do it. The last group of, 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 of real estate holders that were like, I, I hold a 50 apartment building. Guess how they got washed out? They got washed out by lead requirements. They got washed out by having to put energy efficiency into their homes. Yeah, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm, a, I'm like a, if, I, if, you had a, if you had to pin me to something, I'm probably like a LBJ Democrat. Uh, not quite. They have this new Democrat that I'm not a part of them. I forget their names. There's like a, uh, what do they call them? There's like a Democrat that's like, I forget what they're called. I'm not that Democrat either. <clears throat> Section 8's awesome. They reformed Section 8. They did. They reformed it. It used to be shitty to do Section 8. Section 8 is amazing as a landlord today because they pre-screen where you can't. They pre-screen. If you're a felon, you can't rent from me. It's a guaranteed paycheck every month. Like all these the reforms that we did are building an older, more resilient, older class. So you have to find a way to remove these people. And I don't know what these, those answers are either. For you, The only thing that I can think of to do that would be to crank up the rates, crank up the taxation, and then make it unaffordable in terms of returns. In terms of returns. I assure you that if I held a building with 100 apartments in it and I started to make less than 10% per year, I would be trying to put my money somewhere else. Because it's not worth my fucking time to outrun inflation and for that small profit. I can put my money into a money market or a bond and make that with no headaches. I can outrun inflation. I don't have to do shit. 
right? So how do you wash these people out? The only way that I could come up with here would be taxation, regulation, uh, regulation if they're building shit or trying to make more money, right? Uh, to get them out of their, their, their wealth. It's the only thing I can see. Now, if they pass it on to their kids, that's okay. I'm okay with passing along wealth to your kids. Uh, but you want to get wealth out of these old people's hands sooner than later. I agree with that, too. More building. I agree with that, too. And I see that, too. That is another effect. Tazo, I'm with you on that. Uh, not allowing new building. There is another problem here, too, though. This is a major problem. A lot of these fucking boomers don't tell you the truth about a lot of shit. One of the things boomers don't tell you, uh, they, they're assholes. They're like, oh, you're having your avocado toast, toast right, and your cappuccinos at Starbucks? Fuck you, I ain't giving you nothing. I'll tell you the truth on some of this stuff. What they don't tell you is they lived in shithole communities. They lived, they didn't live in nice places. Santa Monica, California was not a nice place. Boston, Massachusetts was not a nice place. San Francisco, you think, is a shithole? Nowhere near what it was once a shithole. New York City was, at one time, when I was young, New York City was a real shithole. I mean real. You move to the suburbs, and you think, oh, the suburbs are nice. I'd like to live there. There was a time when a lot of suburbs were shitholes. So what do you do as a kid today? You're like, well, am I just going to bitch and complain on Reddit? You can't bitch and complain on Reddit. The truth is this. You find a place in this country that is undervalued. I think CNBC just listed 14 or 17 states where you can afford to buy a home making $70,000 or less. That might mean that you and your wife, you and your husband might have to both work. But what they did back then, those old fucking people, guess what they did? They moved to Boston when it was a shithole. Their friends moved to Boston when it was a shithole. Then other friends moved to Boston because of shithole because of the inflation of the 1970s. They couldn't do it either. So they moved to these shitholes. Then they rebuilt these communities. They built the infrastructure. They took part in their schools. They took part in their community. They're not telling you this, though. They, they, they're just like, hey, I'm rock star. Community's rock star. I built all this up. And then you want to get buy into this? You can't buy into that. You're not going to buy into a community with perfect uh, electrical infrastructure. You're not going to build fucking buy into a community at 25 years old. You're not fucking buying into San Francisco or Fremont or fucking L.A. downtown. Not downtown. downtown it's still kind of a shithole. Like, you're not living on the fucking beach in Santa Monica today. It's not a shithole anymore. So you need to find a shithole. You need to tell your fucking friends, hey, man, I moved to, uh, I don't know, Detroit. And by the way, I got something cool for you. Detroit has a windfall from COVID. I think it's $300 billion that they have to airmark by, I think, next spring or something. Now, if you were all living here, you could say to the government, I'm going to run for government, and I'm going to tell my government, fuck you. We're taking that $300 billion, and we're going to rebuild the schools. Or we're going to rebuild the electrical grid. Or we're going, to re or we're going to attract business here once again. You, as a young person, need to do that shit. If you're young listening to this broadcast right now, they don't tell you this, these old people. They fucking lie to you. It's not pull up your fucking pants. It's not pull up your fucking boots. It's not stop eating avocado toast. You guys need to, like, move. You say, we're moving over here. Fuck you. We're going to Minnesota, or we're going to, I don't know where it is, right? Columbus is booming right now. Columbus used to be quiet. Now it's booming. You can see cities in the rotation of people, how they migrate around the United States. We used to have a lot of migration. So if you can, find yourself a place in the U.S. that's, that's hit bottom. You don't want to be buying in some place that's on their way down. You're going to be like, okay, that, that community is stabilized at least. Uh, yeah, it's dangerous living there maybe. The news tells me it's dangerous. I'm on the internet all the time, and Detroit's a shithole. That's not true. Not fucking true. You need to move somewhere that's, that is affordable and that's on the way back up. You need to take control of the government. You need to invest in your neighborhood. You need to show up at the local schools. You need to clean up the fucking trash in that street. 
and you need to showcase where you're living. Hey, look, this is where I live. It's beautiful. So that some kid that comes into town on, on like, for the NFL draft goes, wow, they're doing a good job here. How much does it cost to live in here? Holy shit, I could make some bank here, right? If you do that, guess what? When you're 50, 60, 70 years old, some kid's going to be like, uh, fuck you, old man. Why is Detroit banging right now? I want a piece of it. And you're going to say as an old man, ah, no, dude. Pick up, your, pick up your shorts. Pick up your socks. Stop eating avocado toast. And uh, Why can't you make more money? Uh, walk down and give a, just give your resume and you'll get a job. I realize that you're suffering with that shit right now. And I do think that that is all fucking real. But what do you do? What's, what, that's the dilemma. What do you do? The dilemma is what do you do, right? And you can do one of two things. You can bitch in, uh, what do they call it right now? Internet activism. You can not vote. You can whine on Reddit. You can bitch on Twitter. You can uh, shake your hand at your old man and say, you know what? Fuck you. I'm not going to like you anymore. That's fine. In 20, 30 years, you're going to be left behind. What you can do is say, you know what? Fuck you, old man. You can say, uh, fuck you too and fuck you, but guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to make sure that I'm building something for myself, whatever that is, whether it's cocaine, a house, marriage, whatever it is you like, uh, you're going to say, fuck that, I'm going to move to this hipster town in this city, and I'm going to save my money, get a job, and you can get jobs there too, believe it or not. There are jobs galore in these places. We even live in a time with remote work where you could make $20 an hour, live in L.A., and be poor as fuck, or live in another community, the cost of living is lower, and you can actually breathe a little bit. So that's your choice. It's not my choice, not something that has anything to do with me. That's what I would be doing if I was young. Now, I wish and hope, if I was a young person right now, I'd be like, I wish and hope that they're going to fix this fucking uh, college shit. I wish and hope that my wages go up. I wish and hope that I don't have to fight inflation. Right? I would say that stuff to myself, but at the same time, I would be actively saying, yeah, I got that thing. Guess what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to move to this shithole community. I'm going to become part of this community, tell my friends, show pictures on the internet, tell my buddies that are living back in that too expensive place. And then I'm going to fucking run for office. I'm going to start a business and be a taxpayer. I'm going to fucking do shit. I'm going to make a change. Instead of bitching on the internet, I'm going to make an actual change. And you guys need to do that as young people. You guys are young people out there. Uh, you are our next generation. I have high hopes for you. And the only way that you can make that change is by doing that. Then all of a sudden, you get a seat in the Senate, right? You get a seat in the House of Reps. Now you can run for president, right? And you can actually make those changes that you want to make for your generation or younger generations. Yeah, I know, freeloaders. I know. Kids aren't freeloaders. They're getting fucked over right now. But they have no say. So uh, what do you do? You can do one or the other. I will warn you one thing, though. If you're young, I'm going to warn you one thing. Please, don't get left behind um, and fall in the hole. I understand it. It's very depressing if you're a young person right now. I get it. I'm with you. It is depressing. My own daughter, my, my oldest daughter, is graduating high school to go to college. And she's fucked. She does not have a good outlook. Uh, she's... Dude, she so 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 she's going attending the University of Michigan while in high school, right? She has to go to the University of Michigan while in high school. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because even the colleges are fucking people. The kids over. They if she did not take classes at that school, and she applied there with her grades, they would say no to her. You know why? Because they want money from out-of-state tuition. If she were to apply to Stanford, she'd get in. She'd get in a minute because of the money. So I realize that kids today are fucked. I realize that and I, not only that, what is she going to get for t tuition bills, right? She's being, ro ro she's being railroaded into debt even if, even if she's got great grades. So the one thing I would say to you is if you're young is I realize where you are. I know where I know it's depressing. I know you're sad. I know you feel like your back's against the wall. If you are 
if you don't, if you're not out of college, you're not making three hundred grand a year, six hundred grand a year, we're right out of college, and you're like, hey man, I went to college, I'm only making fifty k, forty k, thirty k. I'm gonna tell you something. Don't get left behind. Find a partner. Find a friend. Move somewhere where you can do that work and get that similar pay, lower cost of living, might be a shithole, and invest in your community. It's the only way out for you right now. And it's horrible to say, but that's what it is. 3.11 in the afternoon, we got got uh, 49 minutes left to go. If you do that now, and this market does crash, this, this, this debt cycle ends, and housing prices come down, and uh, cost of a vehicle comes down, cost of living comes down, you will be better off than other kids in that situation. You'll be like, hey, look, economy's crashing. I got a house. I got a job. I was able to save money. I had to live in a town I didn't want to live in. And when that economy does roll down and you see housing prices fucking, fucking crash, guess what you have? You have a home. You can sell it. You can rent it out. You can take that cash when the economy goes to shit, and you can go looking in a place like Santa Monica. You can go looking in a place like Boston and uh, Vegas, wherever, and likely you'll find a deal. Okay, that's my rant on, um, uh, on that shit. That's it. Okay. Um, anyways, yeah, gentrification happens. I don't know what you, I didn't read any of the conversation. I didn't see your conversation, but gentrification is a part of capitalism. It's what it is. I didn't read the context of that conversation that's going on right now, but gentrification is, well, no, gentrification is good and bad. There's good and bad. There's, there's a bunch of different, different things. I don't like, um, I don't like, uh, uh, real estate owners that don't live in their community. I'm not a fan of that. I fucking hate uh, uh, people that buy rental properties, they don't live there. You have to live in the community you own in, 100%. Uh, number two, uh, when I moved to Detroit specifically, I didn't come to Detroit and say, oh, I got a dream about how to fix Detroit. I actually came to Detroit and I met people and said, what's your dream? What do you want to do? That's true. What do you want to do? Let me help you do what you want to do. What do you want to do? I'll help you out. That's not gentrification. Yeah, they want to stay in Boston, don't they? I know what they want to do. I know what, I know what people want to do. They want it easy. And that's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. It sucks to say it. It's what it is. I involved, I invested in my community. I live, I live in a bad part of Detroit. I didn't, like, buy a house on, in, the, in Boston Edison. I bought in shithole parts of me. I went outside and met my neighbors and said, Hi, my name's Captain Jim James. Can my kids play with your kids? You know what they said? Fuck yeah, let's do it. I was like, you want to come over for, for a barbecue? They were like, no, you come to our house for barbecue. I'm like, hell yeah, I'm coming. When you invest in a community, it's not gentrification. People in bad communities want you to move there and become a part of their community community oh dude i've seen like, so detroit it's weird like detroit's a weird place people are like hey are you having riots in detroit i'm like no uh are you having like mass protests in detroit no it already happened it already happened in detroit then like well is there white flight i'm like uh there was white and black flight in detroit the only people left in Detroit, when they said, they said someone, when the last person leaves Detroit, turn off the lights, they fucking meant it. The only people that were left in Detroit uh, were criminals that were made criminals by fucking the police. The absolute most poor, destitute, uneducated people because the education system broke. No one was left in Detroit. So when, you move, if, when I moved to Detroit, I moved here for one major reason. I grew up in Boston when it was a shithole. I watched Boston rise up from the ashes. Move, living here in Detroit, moving here in Detroit, it's been, I've made friends for life. Everything I do, I invite these people to with me. They are part of my life. They will always be a part of my life for the rest of my life. 
lifelong friends. My daughters have lifelong friends, Detroit natives, forever. I think so, man. I think we squeeze into the bell. If we don't squeeze in the bell, we're definitely squeezing in tomorrow. They got to, right? There ain't shit holding this shit back. They're trying right now. Yeah, I got a problem with that too. I don't like that either, Uncle JBJ. Any of those so in the in the in the like buy and hold and flipping community, all that money started coming into the US. It wasn't just Chinese and Euro. Yeah, it was Euro too. South American and Euro. Uh, Chinese, European uh, money came into the U.S. That is real. There should be there should be a ban on that shit. I agree with that statement too. Yeah, I, so I grew up in the East Coast, and then I moved to the West. I lived in very nice communities out west: Vail, Park City, Santa Fe, Santa Monica, places like that. And I made a conscience decision uh, not to do that anymore. I was tired of the rat race. I was like, fuck this, I ain't doing it. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to go in that cycle. I don't want to be a part of, uh, like, work, 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 right? Uh, Rob, Peter, pay Paul, fight fires, waiting for the one thing to take me out. So I moved to Detroit. And I was told by everybody, don't move to Detroit. My family wanted to fucking disown me. Your wife will be killed and shot. Your children will be raped. Uh, I got told everything. Why are you doing this? And guess what? Best decision ever made. Hands down, best decision ever made in my life. Yeah, I'm a mass I was born in JP. I'm from Jamaica Plain. I'm from JP. That's where I was born. I spent my uh, childhood growing up in Boston, but then I, my dad was like, fuck this. My kid's going to become a criminal, a criminal or a cop. I don't know what, he's, what I shouldn't be saying with that accent. It's not a Boston accent. My, my son's going to be a, a cop or a robber. That's what he'd say. He's gonna be, our kids are going to be cops or robbers. So we moved out when I was a teenage boy. Uh, experience in Florida. I spent, um, Florida, I spent a summer uh, in Florida. I spent a summer on Anna Maria Island. Right on, right on, right on. You're from Western Mass. We are from Framingham. What's, what's Western Mass to you? Is it Pittsfield or Framingham? You never know where someone says they're from the middle of what, uh, Massachusetts where that is. Anne Marie is fucking awesome. Then I spent most of my, so I spent my, uh, so I joined the Army, went to college at a, at a private school, uh, joined the Army to pay for it. Uh, once I was done with the Army, I went out West, spent most of my adult life living in the West. Not a lot of time in the West Coast. I spent one year in the West Coast. Then spent most of my life uh, living in the West. Ski bum. It was a ski bum. Uh, Lemonsta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Were you packing a Roscoe? No, I was pe what do they call it? What's the, um, what's the little black thing that they had? Everybody used to carry in Boston the uh, blackjack or something. All the cops used to carry a blackjack, a little tiny leather thing with lead weight in it. <laughs> when I was a kid, that's what they carried. Yeah, Levenster is Western Mass. <laughs> Fucking Worcester. Wista. <laughs> Wista's, Wista's like, oh, man, we're going, going for a drive today, boys. Where are we going? Wista. <laughs> Jamaica, Spain, baby. That's right. Jamaica, Spain. <laughs> Pittsburgh, that's Western Massachusetts. Uh, you lived in uh, Sheridan Street, right on. I know Sheridan well. I went, guess where I went to school? I went to one of the most, I went to one of the worst um, Catholic schools in the country. You know that movie called, uh, what's that movie about the Diddlers? The, uh, the Diddlers. There's a movie that was uh, made, a uh, famous movie that was made about uh, sexual abuse by Catholic priests, right? What was the name of that movie called? Um, not Profile, it was called, like, I forget what it was called. There's a uh, famous movie made about uh, sex abuse in Boston, Spotlight. Okay, so that movie right there was based on my school. I went to St. Andrews. If you know what that school is, St. Andrews. That's where I, 
I was there, and just after um, one of my friends was abused at that school, I wasn't. And my parents were married. My buddy was. He did. His mom died. His dad raised him, and uh, he was an abuse victim at that school. I went to St. Andrews. You can look that school up. It's it's now reopened again, but it should be shut down and be a monument forever. So I grew up over in Walk Hill. <laughs> on Walk Hill, and earlier in my life, I grew up on um, I grew up on Alveston Street, uh, which is right down by the monuments by Little Peach. My dad went, at one time was a a part of Doyle's Cafe. If any of you are from Boston, uh, with with Eddie Burke, you know who he is, famous Boston restaurant and bar. <laughs> That's a true story too. <laughs> Yeah. I love, yeah, be a ski bum. Oh, yeah, but ski towns are changing. Ski towns aren't nothing. They've, all the fucking, uh, all the um, real estate developer whores came to all those ski towns. There aren't too many of them left. That's what I tell people. I, I, I use that joke. I say I wasn't handsome enough to get uh, padiddled. So what they were doing at that school and in Boston, the Boston Archdiocese, right? So what they were doing was this. Uh, so I went to Catholic school. And uh, all the kids who went to Catholic school thought they were better than the public school kids. And uh, what they would do is this. Uh, they had Cub Scouts. And so you would get your Parvoli Day, it's called. Parvoli Day is a, a medal that you get uh, uh, for Cub Scouts. And what they were doing was this. They had, a, they, had a, they had a building right across the street from the rectory in the school. And the Cub Scouts would go over there and they'd do their thing, right? And then to get your Parvoli Day, they'd take you to the sem seminary. To find out if you wanted to be a, a priest or not. And you'd be a, an altar boy and a priest or an altar boy, a Cub Scout. And then any of the kids that didn't have any fucking dads or moms in their lives, they were like latchkey kids. That's who they were fucking preying on uh, in mass uh, at these schools in Boston. That's the truth. 100% fucking truth. Now, in my view, the Catholic Church, they should open it up so that women um, can be uh, priests as well. Um, so, it's, and I think that if you're gay, you should be able to be a priest as well. Uh, what happened was, um, you had like, um, you had a place that, um, a place that, uh, people that are gay can have a job, right? But it also attracted monsters. If you opened up, uh, if you opened up all of this shit and like just allow gay people to be priests, allow women to be priests, a lot of that shit would end. Um, JP is fucking beautiful. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous part of Boston. One of the best parts of Boston, in my opinion. Uh, cause like, uh, maybe like Beacon Hill is nicer. Back Bay, of course. Uh, South End, shit like that. Uh, Chestnut Hill, of course. But I always have an affinity for JP. Always will. I'm going to ramp this shit overnight, huh? Telling you guys too much out there. <laughs> telling you guys about my childhood. <laughs> I love it. Let's talk about tomorrow. I'm going to give you guys a quick brief, okay? Give you guys a quick brief. If you are a bear. Oh, dude, Walk Hill Market, baby. Walk Hill Market, short seller. Dude, I used to go. I used to go to Walk Hill Market as a kid. The Koreans owned it. Dude, I love Walk Hill Market, brother. Doughboy Donuts, Doughboy Donuts, baby. Back in the day, my dad was a part of a uh, uh, fucking uh, 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 Arborway Foods. Arborway Foods back in the day. Arborway Foods, bro. Back in the day, my dad was all wrapped up in that shit too. My dad owned. A, I'm not gonna say the company my dad owned, but. Dude, Walk Hill Market, man. I used to walk up that up that hill every single day. <laughs> you used to take the bus down uh down fucking uh, Hyde Park Avenue. Matter of fact, you go, do you ever remember Cuddy's Donuts? Top liquor, Atlas Liquors, the bowling alley up there. <laughs> but old school. Dude, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, dude. Dude, Miss, dude, I love Mr. Lee. Got pissed off at us, but he was a good guy. I know Mr. Lee. 
Dude, short saw, I got to talk to you, man. Holy shit, man. Mr. Lee, dude. I can't believe you remember that guy. That's amazing, brother. <laughs> dude, I can't believe you know who Mr. Lee was. <laughs> Yeah, top liquor, dude. Remember the Bowen Alley, Clary Square? Bowen Alley up at Clary Square. They used to have a, a 007, the 007, oh, no, Spy. They had a spy game with the car. <laughs> no shit, man. Oh, man. Yeah, no Great Barrington, too. All right, so we're going to talk uh, what the market brief will be this evening. And we're going to take a peek at that really quick. High probability. We are still in a sell of the rip environment. Not guaranteed, but we have the 5,000 down below, right? 500 at least down here, down below. If you are a bear... This would be like a bull telling a bull right now, hey, expect a pullback to the daily trigger. Okay? So, saying that, we are still in a sell of rip environment. But we are very close to a reversal. Not by the dip, just a reversal. When you are selling the rip or buying the dip, doesn't matter. You're selling the hour trigger and the half hour trigger and then we get some velocity up we sell the half and get right down there right now we also have pullbacks right if you're a bull we have pullbacks right here's a pullback here's a pullback right pullbacks normal if we're in sell the rip you also have pullbacks so we're going to be looking for here is a retracement trade some kind of a pullback before a possible continuation to the downside. You understand? You all, you likely have had your three legs, right? Your three down moves are likely one, two, and three. So I would expect really soon, tomorrow, to close, overnight, some kind of of a retracement back to the daily trigger. That doesn't mean the correction's over yet. It just means a pullback, V-shaped recovery, to get back down here to begin selling. Make sense? Just like for the bulls. Now, if conditions improve, and we can get the daily, uh, the hourly trigger up, we get price to go above and beat this high. Come back over here and make a new high. We'll discuss. If the correction is over, we're back in a buy the dip environment, but we're not there right now, are we? So for right now, expectations into tomorrow, highest probability is going to be a trade or tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, something like this. We can also say that if the bears are truly still in charge, we will likely see a failure around 5, 12 and change for continuation to the downside. Now, if the bulls squeeze it up, if this is just a liquidity grab, we're going to find out really fast if they fail to make a new high and we'll start making our way down and we'll sell the fuck out of that too because we are in sell the rip. The alternate for this, this tonight, the alternate for this tonight, if there was an alternate trade that I, you know, you guys, I give you guys a yellow path, the alternate trade would be that we sell down to 500, and we are retracing back to the upside. Either way, we are in an upside path right now, okay? Whether this happens in the overnight, you get selling futures, and then we wake up tomorrow morning, we blast up. Either way, we are in a traje trajectory currently on an hourly basis to the upside. If you are a bull, you have only two things going for you right now. The first one would be there's lots of call buying. I don't know if that's a function of people just repetitively doing that. I don't know if that's a function 
of real money selling to continue to the downside. We already know CTAs are wanting to get short. We already know that the Fed is telling you, no, we're not going to cut rates, so this might be a turn to the upside for the market. We're not there yet. This may not be bottom. But you, that's the only thing that you have going for you right now is that there's tons of call buying going on out there. <coughs> Rates, are, you're being told right now that we're not getting any more rate cuts. <coughs> uh, but for currently for the next hour or so, uh, no, the, on, on an hourly basis, expect some kind of an upside move. Okay? I'm not expecting your lowest probability trade here would be you wake up tomorrow morning. And we're down here. This is your least probable trade. Make sense? Least probable trade, most probable trade to the upside. You'll get a full market brief from me this evening. Uh, I don't know what else to say to you on that other than, and I'm going to tell you one other thing. If you're a bear, Another warning to you if you're a bear at least. I always tell you guys about the violence going up or down. One minute trigger, vertical down. Vertical up, same thing, right? We're bullish or bearish, doesn't matter. Five minute trigger, vertical down. Half hour trigger, vertical down. Hourly trigger, vertical down. What's happening right now? What's happening right now? One minute and five minute trigger is going flat. Half hour trigger is just about to go flat. Hourly trigger, just about to go flat. What does that mean for you? It means to expect a turn up in price as well. If you were looking for a place to short as a bear, you can look at this stuff up here, these rejection points and this daily trigger as a place to get short. Again, if you continue to think that we're going to sell the rip and still in a corrective stance. As of right now, we are. As we are, as we are right now, we are in a correction. Confirmed. We confirmed it twice yesterday. We confirmed it when we broke below the daily trigger. And we rejected both the hourly trigger, the daily trigger, and once again, this is how we entered a correction right there. And we are in a correction until conditions get better. Let me see what you guys are saying. Well, the skew is, well, the skew's all funky, and then the VIX is all funky. And there's, like, call buying going on underneath the surface. CTAs, though, look really bad right now. Uh, CTAs are, like, CTAs are telling you that we're getting a rate cut. The ECB today said you were getting a rate cut, then retracted all that shit. Um, and then uh, Jerome is basically, today, his speech was, to, in, was an attempt to stabilize the market. I know you don't believe that. But uh, Jerome Powell was trying to stabilize the market today. If he had said rate cuts are coming, oof, destabilization of markets. Now, I'm still in some calls right now. I'm probably going to buy some at 415 for tomorrow as well. I keep buying these 20 cent calls, 20 cent calls, my third grouping of them right now. I was going to buy like $2 calls and $5 calls. And I wasn't willing to buy them. So I'm like hitting 20 cents, 5 cents, 15 cents and building racks of them up. Uh, so I'm assuming that today or yes, yesterday and today, today or tomorrow, I'm going to hit it big. I'm going to hit like three, four dollars or something stupid like that or a dollar fifty on 15 cents, something like that. Yeah, call me Jay. <laughs> So we are looking for an upside move in the market. If you're a bear, I would say sit on your hands and wait for a retracement to the daily trigger um, for more downside. You might catch some tonight, uh, but it's too risky. It's too risky. In my view, it is at least. I think the move's already been made. 
Um, so any retracement to the daily trigger, I'd be fucking selling the fuck out of that. Uh, if you want to sell it right now, you can. I mean, if you look over here, I, mean, I get what you want to do, right? This looks great. We're on the half hour on the daily. Uh, I think futures might work for you. If you're going to sell futures, that might work. I don't know that you wake up in cash. My, pro my problem here is like, here's my problem. I'm going to show you what my problem is here. This is what happens to a bull on the opposite side. Here's my problem. Okay. Here's the close, right? Bro, this is what I. This is what people tell people tell me shit all the time on on social media. Like, bro, I called it right. You were wrong. I go, okay. Did you get paid? This is what happens. They blood it down. Futures, right there, five thousand. You wake up tomorrow morning with your puts. Oh shit. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? <laughs> you get fucked here. So. I think as a cash market trader, you have nothing. I think if you're like a futures Globex trader, yeah, you have a potential to be able to get this down here tonight. You wake up tomorrow morning, and we're racing higher. This shit over here. I guess you. I guess that if you had a, you probably have like a 15% chance maybe that, I guess if you're a bear, you could say, well, they want to get it under here, Captain, so that uh, we don't ever come back here. This becomes resistance now, bro. Daily trigger comes down. Uh, any pullbacks are just sold. That's possible. I can give you that. I think that's possible. Uh, that's po that's possible, I guess. There's that little bit. Maybe. Maybe you're right. I'd give this like a 35% chance. I'll give that a 35% chance that happens. All right, I said 15 or 5. Uh, you get like 35% chance you wake up tomorrow morning and it's some kind of nonsense like this. And we, we what? We park it, I guess. And you wait until next week. One, two, three, four, five, six, six sessions. And then we sell. I guess that's possible. I guess there's some validity to that. I'll give you that. It's possible. It's It's possible. Yeah, I'm not on that trade. I think it's a low, I think it's a low, um, who said that? Career, career low saying SPX call volume seems to be pricing obscenely higher. They are. Uh, they're, they're buying calls hand over fist right now. Uh, even though, even if you can't see it, I know that they are. They've been doing it since Friday. And buying like motherfuckers. It's the one thing bulls have going for them. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a high risk, low reward trade. Even if you get this, uh, you'd be better served if this happened by shorting this. Once the daily trigger comes down, you'd be better served like just starting up here and fucking slam it down. It's a, it's a low, it's a it's a high risk, low cost trade for bears. It's kind of like saying this. It's kind of like being long right here. And you make that much money only for that shit to happen. So uh, the move's already been made. Uh, I, I tell bulls this all the time. Have fun with that. If you made money, woohoo. <laughs> you're not going to win that trade. Uh, if you do that trade 10 times, you're going to win like three times. If you want to leave some runners on with puts, uh, maybe that would work too. Uh, I can understand doing runners, I guess, but. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not worth the trade for me. The trade, the, the, the low, the low, ri low risk, low cost, high reward trade is right here. Yeah, I'm reading what you guys are saying right now. How are you guys doing, by the way? How are things going where you guys are living? Is everybody okay out there? 
Anybody have anything not non market related? It's uh three forty one. Give me something that's not market related. I'll put us back on the uh, main screen here so you can see the close here. Like trying to short five thousand just seems like a recipe for disaster or five hundred. Let me explain this better to you. Uh, we're at five thousand, right? Five hundred. You'd rather have the algorithms put us below five thousand, and then and then follow them down below it. Maybe that's the better way to word it. Um, whenever we're at like these ceilings, like six thousand, one thousand, fifteen hundred, like ones and zero or not zeros and fives, you just like lay off there. You just lay off it for a little bit. You let the you let the algorithms push us below. Uh, below 500, you let it consolidate, even on the sell side. You let it consolidate, and you take the new low. Let me explain that simply for you. It's fairly simple, right? Not that hard. It's, it's not rocket science. We're at 5,000 right there, 500. As a bear, you know what you want to see? You want to see the algorithms push us down, get the low, right? Consolidate. Catch the new low, and then you're Johnny on the spot, like right fucking there. That's really the next trade for bears. Not here, not this, right here. That's the fucking trade. That's the money trade right there for bears. That's like fucking money. I tell bulls this shit, dude. They don't listen to me. I tell bulls this shit all the time. They don't fucking want to hear it from me, so... I don't know what to say to you guys. I could, I could talk to you until I'm blue in the face. <laughs> Bulls are the same way. They're just like, more up, more up, more up, more up. Then they pull back. They're on the wrong side of the trade. And then I'm like, yeah, you should have just waited until we came back to the daily trigger. It would be easier. <laughs> it's so easy. It's too fucking easy. <laughs> Let the trade come to you. Uh, the drought. I heard about the drought in Missouri. I heard that. I've heard that whispers that uh, admit the great state of misery. Fuck you, misery, by the way. The show me state is called the show me state for a reason. I was there. I went to uh, winter training and chemical training there in the army. It sucked. I was at Force Lo Fort Lost in the Woods for a brief moment. Oh, you, you fired the landscaper. Good job. What do you guys think? Um, you get, on our website, go on tradethetrigger.com. 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 Go there. Check it out. Uh, what do you give me some? How about this? Let me ask you guys your opinion. Do you think we uh, blood down in the overnight, or do you think we have a retracement ahead of us? How about answer that question? Say uh, retracement or blood. Retracement or blood. One more red day. They're trying, right? Look at them. They're up on the. Uh, they're up here in this red bar, trying to tell you there's one more day. Blood. Dan Brislin saying more blood. Uh, hero retracement. Uh, I think it depends on what Israel. It, that's a good one. It, well, it depends on what Israel does. So they can load lower. Retrace by point six percent up. Retrace blood. Yeah, more blood. You guys want more blood today? I, I believe that. You want to get underneath the 5,000 level, right? I don't think you're getting underneath there right away. But I, retracement ahead possible Thursday, Friday, blood, or next week. Mm, I think we stay red this week. I think the week ends red. I think there's a pull up, and then I think we're uh, deep red next week. FX retracer saying red. Yeah, we got a mixed bag here. We got a lot of people saying more blood tonight. We got a lot of people saying more blood right now. That's normally not good for bears, by the way. When bulls tell me that they're all uh, long, I know that it's time to sell. This is a heads up.
You think retrace it? How about we look at one other thing? Let's look and see. Let's see if we can gain any insight here. Uh, I'm going with up from here. Hourly trigger, half hour trigger. I think I'm going with a little bit down in the overnight, and then up. We're getting a series of higher lows right now on the hourly trigger, so I'm still bearish. <laughs> I'm still bearish. More down to come. On a one or two day basis, I'm not. Or at least until the open tomorrow. Now, at least with, uh, at least with, like, uh, at least, oh, uh, yeah, they're buying the half hour candle like a motherfucker right now. Um, on a, for a brief moment, there'll be a, there'll be a, there'll be a relief at some point, I think. Yeah, I can see that too. I can see them sell this shit one more time at least, minimum. I, you guys already know about the golden fucking bullshit, the golden O and all the stupid shit. <laughs> Six figured man, baby, bye. Yeah, I'm with you too there, MVP uh, P trading. I'm with you as well. Well, you guys have a great night, by the way. It's uh, 3.47. We've got 13 minutes left. Uh, thanks for sticking around me in the stream every day. I hope that this is helping you uh, navigate the markets, whether we're going up or down, uh, that you're, you're able to navigate these markets uh, with me by your side. If you don't like anything that I say to you, at least just having a trading partner, uh, someone else out there. I already told you where Tesla's going. 140. What's it doing right now? Trying to sell it. It's gonna... Oh, look at it. See, this is what I'm talking about, man. They get your hopes up, right? Come up here partying and shit tomorrow, then boom, 140. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm looking for 140 on Tesla. Sorry. I'm looking to sell the fuck out of it to 140. I love Tesla, but uh, I think 140 is your. I think 140 is what you're looking for. I love all of you out there. I love all of you guys out there. You know, I was talking to Joe Donut today. And uh, you know what I was saying to him today? We were discussing this morning a bunch of stuff. You know what I said to him? I was like, you know what's special about what we do here? He's like, what? He's like, what is it? But seriously, he was like, what is it? I go, the truth is, I was like, we're probably the only people out there that are doing something like this. I was like, I was like, you can put out tools and you can put out fucking gamma shit. And you can put out... Um, fucking whatever you want, a Discord or a market brief or a newsletter. You can put out charts and Elliott Wave shit or whatever. I was like, you know what the difference is? All those people that do that stuff come back a day later and say, oh, I was wrong, sorry. I go, you know what the difference is that we do a live stream every fucking morning from like 9.30 to 4, to 4 o'clock? So we're there in real time. So if something goes wrong, you're not like chasing down a service going, dude, it's going against what you said. We're like right fucking here every day. And then at nighttime, like I hit the, I hit the clock. I'm like, boom, boom. right. I'm fucking, I just put in 12 hours, 14 hours. Boom, boom. Guess who shows up at nighttime? David AMS. And he gets to the clock and he goes, boom, boom. And he's like, I'm in the Discord right now, live trading all night long. John L. comes out and he goes, I'm here to help out when shit goes side or goes, goes batshit crazy. Then you get like Trader Podcast and he's like, here's a market brief for you too. And I'm like, these badass motherfuckers. These bad motherfuckers. I'm serious. Like, there's no other, there's nobody else in my view out there doing that shit 24 hours a day. Maybe like stock charts or something. But, but, like, you guys have access to, like, people trade 24 hours a day in real time. You might get someone coming out for an hour or two, like, recording a video for you every night so you can consume it. We, like, put shit out, and then we're like, here, we're live support all day long. That shit's badass. Bad as fuck, dude. Our community is dope as fuck. I love our community. Our community is, like, the best fucking community in the market, to my, in my opinion. It's everything I ever wanted as a trader. It's everything I ever wanted. 
I used to like sign up for this shit. I get like a guy out there for an hour or two, an alpha guy. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna dribble the ball for a few minutes. I'll see you guys on Friday. Then you'd get like I'd buy a service and they'd be like, We think this, this, and this, and then you'd be like banging on the door going, Where are you, dude? It's going the wrong way. I just need to know where we're going. And they wouldn't be there. They'd be like two hours later, they'd be like, Whoa, whoa, my bad. Shit. I know I put that out, but uh we are going the other way. Um did you did you catch the other the other uh did you, we, did, you, did you did you get it right or did you get burned and they'd be like oh fuck I got burned already are you late three hours later dude I don't want an apology I want you here to help me if it goes the other way <laughs> and you can't get that from people uh they're like late they can't respond that's what I like about what we do it's badass our community is dope as fuck love it more to come by the way. Dude, seriously, right, Goliath? I think it's fucking baller. I think it's fucking baller. I, I, I think it's fucking baller. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I used to have that problem. I'm not going to name names, but I used to be. I used to get so enraged. They'd be like, ooh, these guys have everything. They're awesome. And then, like, it would go. And I, it's going to go sideways against you. You know you're not going to be right. I didn't care that they were wrong sometimes. I just cared that when they were wrong, I, I was lost. I was like, what do I do now? It's going the wrong way. What do I do? And like four hours later, be like, oh, shit. Sorry, guys. And I'd be like, oh, motherfucker. <laughs> if you had just been there to tell me it went against your shit, I would be fine. <laughs> Let me take the other trade with you. Where are you? <laughs> Instead, you get, like, an apology after the market note. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> I'm going to wait until the uh, interest falls off after the bell to, to enter some more for tomorrow. Hell, yeah. Dude, the community, dude, trading next to somebody is badass. I don't want to be Who wants to be alone in their house all day long trading? I don't. I used to hate it, dude. Yeah, I'm buying more calls in this bell. I'm going to buy some cheap-ass shit for tomorrow. I got calls dying right now. I got caught earlier. It went to zero. I got caught earlier in some fucking calls. We ripped, and I was blabbing about fucking macro bullshit. <laughs> I'm, I'm look, they're, all, they're both zero right now. <laughs> Just burned fucking $800. Gone. So what do we got for tomorrow? 510 C's, uh, 38 cents, a little pricey. What's the uh, trade for tomorrow? Ooh, 514? <laughs> 513 are 12 cents. That that sounds like a that sounds like a job for uh 12 cent calls. Dude, on Monday, they were asking for, like, $5 for Friday calls. I was like, get fucked on that shit. Hmm, 12 cents. Oh, uh, they're not moving right now. Uh, 512 seems better. I like five, uh, five. Oh, uh, dealer's now kicking on five twelve now. So now, now they're now they're now they're scaling up right now. All right, I got an order in for a hundred. <laughs> Let's see what happens in this bell. Wonder if I should do it tomorrow in the open instead. If I, like pin it till the open. Still no fill though. I'm still uh still have no fill. I got an order and no fill yet. No, they're cheap, dude. Five twelves are dirt cheap. Oh. 
Still no film. You guys are on a one minute chart saying bears aren't stopping. You out of your fucking minds? Uh, nope. Yeah, come on. They were 12 cents for a second. I just want like 10 cents. Uh, we're getting premium kick even though we're going down right now. Heads up. We're getting premium already on this. Even though we're going down right now, premium is building on calls for tomorrow. Not good for bears. Yeah, I'll take that too. Uh, I've been really like, I've been really like, so I made bank on Monday and I've been losing trades, but they're cheap. I'm just, I just want to jump on the train. I don't care if it costs me 70 cents, 60 cents, 80 cents. I'm unwilling to pay the two or two to five dollars for the trade. So if I can get in under a dollar in total, I'm, I'll be happy. Come on down there. Not quite yet there. I just need 10 cent calls. I don't care where we are. <laughs> I just need 10 cent calls in the bell. Maybe I should buy 200 then they're so cheap. Let's see. 358 right now. 512's trading 13 and 12 cents. I'm trying to get 10 cents if I can. Not quite. They're not giving it to me right now. Still no fill. I'm going to get left behind. I can already tell. This shit happens to me all the fucking time, dude. Like, they'll take my fucking stop on a penny. They won't fill me in a penny. Hopefully I can catch it here in the next few, few minutes, like next minute or two. Interest to leave the market. Price should drop a little bit. Come on. Still no fill. They want me to pay a premium. They're like, give, they're like we'll give you those for an extra two cents. I got to keep it in my pocket for you. I got to keep it in my pocket. <laughs> I'm like, just give me the fucking fill. I know. I know. I know. Unload all your doom and gloom on me. Yeah, I like it. Give me more red. More red, the better. Catching a fill right now. I got one more penny. I want one more penny. 
Give me one more penny. Come on. One more penny. Just fill them. Don't you fucking leave me behind, dude. Motherfuckers. I'm not, I don't have affiliate either. All right. Uh, I'm long 512C for tomorrow. I paid the penny. Um, I paid the penny, so let's do it. Bring it home for daddy, please. Please bring it home for daddy tomorrow. Um, I'm not in for 200, though, only 100. I didn't take the 200 because I'm not getting the fill that I want, so fuck them. Um, let's see what happens tomorrow. Let's see if they do the one little the one little fucking rip down. You know, if they did that V-shaped down move, correction's probably done. Uh, I will see all of you tomorrow at 9.30. Uh, I'll also have a market brief up this evening for supporters and pro traders. Uh, the Discord link, with a Discord link, if I don't fucking forget. Uh, but if I do forget, it'll be on the um, website for you. Uh, there's one guy out there that only buys the briefs. I forgot to put you on last night, or didn't forget, I didn't know I had to put you on. Uh, I will make sure that I'm uh, making sure that you're getting access to those every night um, on, the, uh, on the website. I apologize for that. I didn't know. Yeah, I'll see all of you guys tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning. I appreciate you all showing up every day. I'm very grateful that I don't speak into the ether and nobody's there. So uh, you guys are my family and friends, and I, you guys do make my life. You are, I spend more time with you than I do with my wife and children. Uh, so I'll see all of you guys tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, or a woman, if, you're a, if you don't identify as anything. Uh, I love all of you, too. I don't care what color you are. I don't care your religion. I don't care your station in life. Uh, I don't care who you are. Uh, I got, I'm not a, I don't hate anybody. Uh, so I hope to see you tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, I can't wait, dude. Let's do it. You guys ready to rock and roll here or what? Let's do some. Uh, let's do some. Let's do some blood red. Uh, let's do some bear memes. That way we can. Uh, let's let's bloody up the uh, the chat as we close this stuff out. Sound good to you guys?